Are we good now? Can you guys hear me? We got sound? We good? I have no idea what happened. I, I, I could see sound on my end, but um, OBS was... It, it looked fine on my end, but if you guys weren't getting sound and it wasn't just one of you, then I don't know. Maybe my uh, my OBS had a bit of a shit fit. I did update Windows this morning, so that may have caused some problems as well. And no, my mic doesn't have a mute button on it. The only thing I can think of is if the cable's loose, but then OBS wouldn't be showing the equalizer moving, so I don't know. Anyway, I'm assuming we're good now. If we're not, I'll have to work it out on the fly, literally. But yeah, um, as I was attempting to say, um, an issue that you don't really get in DCS as much, but you do get in Mizfiz and some other sims, is that um, because you've got a much narrower field of view on a monitor, or even in VR with most headsets, than you have in real life, if you have high dynamic range lighting, um, it'll bloom out the player's vision. Like, if you're looking outside and then you look down at your instrument panel, it'll blind you. You won't be able to read your instruments. Whereas in real life, because your field of view is much larger and there's a lot more ambient light sort of entering the cockpit, it makes it a lot easier to read. I think the weapons... Uh, okay, weapons are already on. Um, and so you have this effect where glancing outside and then glancing down at your instruments is constantly fucking with the dynamic range of the lighting, whereas in DCS it's just a flat value as far as I can tell. Um, and to some people that's uncanny. It's like, oh, it's, it's, um, you know, it's not realistic. Actually, it, it is. It might not look graphically pretty, but it's realistic, because in real life, I can tell you, you don't get flashbanged by looking outside and then at your instrument panel. So in daylight, you don't fly with instrument lighting on in real life, because you don't fucking need it. You're not going to see the lighting anyway, because it's bright enough in the cockpit usually. Whereas in DCS, a lot of the time I will fly with instrument lighting on full blast even in daylight, because some cockpits in DCS need it. In Misfiz, it's even worse. You practically do need it in Misfiz in every aircraft. Um, whereas in DCS, it's, it's some aircraft you kind of want it just because the cockpits are naturally dark. Uh, the old Mirage cockpit comes to mind, the uh, MiG-19 previously, with the old cockpit for that comes to mind, the new one's pretty pretty brightly lit. Um, like aircraft, the F1, the F1's a really bad offender for this. Aircraft with dark cockpits in DCS, you do want the instrument lighting on a lot of the time to just be able to read the instruments properly, but in Misfits you need it on for like just about everything. But for me in the Hind or the MiG-21 or whatever, it's an aesthetic choice. How's things? Uh, they're going okay, I guess. We've had a bit of a all-over-the-place stream today, but hasn't been too bad. I've had to restart the stream like two or three times at this point, but you know, other than that, it's been alright. We're slowly reacclimatizing to operating in the hind. I've been getting shot down a lot for doing very stupid things. <laughs> yeah, surely, one day. It's kind of funny, like, the more advanced things become graphically, the more you start to realise all the little sort of uncanny valley things. Um, so for example, one of the things I've kind of picked up with certain games, and also with Harry's art style, this is something that Harry's always done, no matter what resolution he's working with. Um, Harry's got a very painterly art style, and it used to show through really well in older games. So, back when I first met him, because um, we used to post on the same 3D modelling forum, um, he was working on this Ghost Recon mod, it was like the original Ghost Recon. Um, and it was a partisan mod, like World War II Eastern Front partisans, and it was super low poly textures, super low try models, but he made them look just as good as games with ten times the, um, ten times the graphics budget. And it was because he has this painterly style that it it exaggerates things in a way that brings out details but doesn't look cartoony, if that makes any sense. So it, it kind of... And I, I went to Wise Waiting for um, me and, and Min, who's a mutual friend of mine and Harry's. Um, we met up for lunch-wise down in Melbourne the day before I flew back. 
and while I was waiting for Min to get into town, I went to the gallery and I was walking through um, this exhibit they had and they had, um, as you came in, a couple of really beautiful oil paintings of tall ships in the harbour. And I kind of, it had been a while since I'd last been to a, an actual art gallery and seen paintings up close and I'd forgotten how a really good artist can make a painting on a canvas or comp board or whatever look 3D. Because as I walk past them, the tall ships seem to move ever so slightly against the background. They have this depth to them. There's no actual depth there, but there's the illusion of depth, you know, um, like a, I guess like a trompe l'oeil. Trompe l'oeil, uh, fuck, my French pronunciation's gone to shit. I, haven't had a chance to speak for so long but you know like the the big um murals that they they put on walls to make you think that a, a space is much bigger than it actually is it's like that you notice that a really good artist can give you that painterly sort of style and give you an illusion of depth where there is none so i think photorealistic graphics are not actually the way you want to go with a lot of games especially older engines but even modern ones you want to just exaggerate things slightly and underdo some other things slightly, otherwise you end up in Uncanny Valley. You want to avoid that. And you also want to make sure your game ages well graphically, and it's kind of hard to do that. Like, a lot of games do not age well graphically. Is the fan gone? No. Fan's there. Um, it's just that I think ED made it semi-transparent or something. I wonder if it's a special option, even. Because I haven't done any, like, I'm not using any mods for the Heim, so it must be an option that they've changed, or they did something in the patch. I can't access it through here, I'd have to go back to the main menu. I'll have to check. Fans busted in multi-threading? Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense then. Definitely a lot to be said for heavily stylized visuals. Yeah, so heavily stylized is a, a, a thing. Like, it's a, a good choice for a lot of games is to go heavily stylized rather than photorealistic because if you fall short of photorealistic, it's going to look crap. If you fall short with heavily stylized, it just becomes part of the style, right? Um, it just has to be consistent. Consistency is the main thing. Like, even if you're using store-bought assets or even if you have programmer graphics, just be consistent. Like, Jalopy's art style is pastel colours, flat shaded models, there's no, like, I don't think there's even smoothing on most of the models, they just went with the jaggy look, and it works, because it's consistent across the whole game. It's, it's a really important part of game art, is consistency. And usually where I've got into spats with art teams, uh, usually for mods, not with whole studios, but... Um, it's because they don't have that consistency. Like, the Darkest Hour mod for Red Orchestra, I got into a major fucking personal feud with one of their main texture artists because I kept pointing out to him, like, the textures are inconsistent. This is this, you know, this is this other guy's style. This is this other guy's style. And they both match. But then your style, it's really, like, it, it doesn't fit in. This is, like, this edge is too chalky. This edge wear makes no sense. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. Like... And he, uh, you know, he did the typical mod team artist thing of taking everything as a personal insult, rather than, hey, your work needs a bit of a tweak in this direction, it'll be, it'll be perfect, it's, 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 it's close, it just needs a little bit of this. Um, so yeah, that was fun, but... It is what it is. But yeah, like, sometimes more realism is actually not more good, as far as immersion or, or even, like, graphical fidelity goes. There's also the funny thing of, you know, everyone thinks that if you just slap any old fucking asset or any old game in Unreal Engine 5, it'll become the best thing ever. Um, there was a trailer put out recently of some dude remaking, rema uh, like remastering Half-Life 2 in Unreal Engine 5. And aside from a few obviously, you know, transplanted directly from source assets that didn't really look any better in Unreal Engine 5, it has to be said... It didn't look like Half-Life 2, because he was using default Unreal Engine assets. And you really start to see with a project like that, just how much the actual engine itself and the pre-baked assets are carrying a, a, a project. Um, it didn't look like Half-Life. It, it didn't really look that... It didn't look bad, but, like, because the consistency wasn't there. It didn't look great either, and it really didn't look like Half-Life 2. The visual design language wasn't there. So... I guess that's my, uh, my sort of rant on game art and... The, oh, that's an anti-aircraft gun. S60 or something. Um, but yeah, like, that's, that's my thing on game art and consistency. It's more important to be consistent than to look good. Consistency is looking good in itself. And also, you can't call something a remaster just because you took a few identifiable assets from a game and plopped them in another engine. 
Like, if you really wanted to do a proper remaster of Half-Life 2, you ended up with Half-Life Alex. <laughs> Simple as that. Half-Life Alex still shares the Half-Life design language, and even then, I don't like some of what they did with the Combine uniforms. The rest of the game looks great, but some of the Combine uniforms I'm a bit on. Like, I think they... I think they, um... Kind of reverted to some of the raising the bar silhouettes for the, like, the, the lopsided shoulder pads and the the weird proportions and stuff, which isn't a bad thing, it just, you know... I'm one of these people that, once they define the art style as something, that's how it should stay. I'm like that with Halo, too. Like, I don't think Halo Reach really fits with Halo's defined art style, and don't even start me on 4 and 5. Porter team is already porting Half-Life 2 to Alex. They probably are, and honestly... Porting Half-Life 2 to Alex is probably a bigger deal than porting Half-Life 2 to Unreal 5. Because then you've got a gameplay change instead of just a graphical change. That's a that's a reason to actually play it. Like, if I want to play Half-Life 2, you know what I do? I just boot up Half-Life Updated. You know, the community update that fixed a few shaders and, and changed a few things here and there. But it still uses a source, and it still looks basically like Half-Life 2, just with better lighting. That's what I play when I want to play Half-Life 2. Now, if I wanted to play Half-Life 2 with a new reinvigorating twist, I'd play it, you know, port it to the Alex engine and reworked for VR play. Because that's the other thing, you can't just port it to Alex's engine. Source 2, I guess it is, but you can't just port it, you have to actually rebuild the game around the VR. It's kind of like how people wanted to be able to play Half-Life Alex on a flat screen. It defeats the entire point. That whole game is designed around VR. Like, if you're not playing it with VR, you may as well not play it at all, you know what I mean? Just... Man, normies have no sense of game design. Honestly. I don't want to say that like I'm some big, amazing elitist, because I don't work in game dev, I never have. I did some 3D modelling and a little bit of 2D texture work as a hobbyist. I never learned to animate my own models, or rig them, or fucking UVW unwrap them even, but... You spend enough time hanging around actual game artists, and doing a little bit of dabbling yourself, and you start to, you know, get an idea of how things should work. Yeah, I'm on comms. Okay, turn back, heading uh, 180. 180. I was taking uh, tank fire, so I assume there's one nearby. Yeah, yeah, uh, for that tank, yeah. Do you know roughly where he is? Like, is there a landmark nearby? Yeah, yeah, I see him. Uh, he roughly on the limit of uh, the trees. You should see that if the, the smoke, uh, the dust, the dust at your tools. Uh, I'm looking now. I see some wreckage in front of me in the tree line. Okay, go a little bit high because you are low. I see it. Oh, hang on. Petrovich is having a moment. Oh, they didn't rearm me again. God damn it. Okay, uh, disengage, disengage. You are in danger. Go, yeah, go, uh, to the west and, uh, go high and low a little bit. I have to go rearm. I forgot to get missiles again. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. If, if you... Yeah, if you just keep an eye on him and, and keep a mark on him or something, I'll come back as soon as I've got missiles. Don't worry, don't worry, I'm here. Yeah, that's uh, Dr. Mayor. He's changed his name. I'm glad he's still around. I, I know I got frustrated with him back when he used to GCI me sometimes in the 21, but... I'm glad he's stuck around because as he gets more confident speaking English to us Luddites that can't speak French fluently, um, it should improve his GCI skills as well. And he did a lot of helicopter stuff in the car 50, which he was good at, so... Oh, he sniped me! God damn, Mike Delta! Okay, I will not forget to rearm my helicopter. I will not forget to rearm my helicopter. I will not- Wait, no! I did rearm it, because you guys would have heard it when I was on the BRB screen. You would have heard me telling them to rearm my fucking helicopter. So are we out of ATGMs? Ah, we're out of Sturms, but we have attackers. 
Interesting we have attackers. Although, we always did on our open server, actually, now I think about it. But yeah, we've, uh... We've run out of Sturms, which is kind of funny. It wasn't my fault this time. It was not my fault this time. Thank God. Okay. And then I think this should be a compatible loadout. We'll cut the fuel down because we don't want to be that heavy. Boy, we're getting some good hind startup practice. I guess this is a good thing after a long time away from not just flying the hind, but DCS in general, that I'm getting a shit ton of practice at starting up all the aircraft I used to fly. Kind of get my uh, get my head back in the game. Yes, hello again, Rita. I'll try not to get us killed this time, my dear. We um, I found out why I didn't have missiles. We've run out of Sturms, so I'm coming back with attackers. He uh, he he sniped me with his tank. <laughs> No problem. Just you, when you get airborne and nearby, uh, give me uh, yeah, a report. Just I will give you the bar. Yep, yeah, okay. Okay, he heading to the RPG team. I, I don't know what. Uh... I've been away from DCS for a while, and so I forgot how dangerous it is to go near Mike Delta's tanks. He's a very good shot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You should to be high and uh, move all the way. Yeah, I usually... Usually I try and stay a bit lower, because it makes it easier to hide behind trees if there's triple A, but... It... I can't spot tanks if I'm low, so I guess I'll have to go high on this mission. Yeah, yeah exactly. On the desert it's easier. <laughs> yeah, this is a little bit challenging here, inside the trees, uh, because the building is uh, scattered too much. Yeah. The tree is no problem because you just uh, take the distance about 8-6 clicks and you can't see any ground unit uh, hiding there. At least now... Uh, uh, tiny dots. Yeah, at least now Petrovich tells you like when his line of sight's blocked but he still sees the target so he tells you to correct left or right so he can shoot it. And I know why that is. Uh, yeah, it was just recently. Also, I think infantry suppression should be in by now, although I didn't notice it earlier. It's supposed to be, from what I heard. Sliding Ramzan's power level has finally been reduced. I don't know if it's public knowledge why Petro works the way he does, so I will avoid uh, I will avoid leaking forbidden lore, but put it this way, it's a step in the right direction, but you would be surprised how uh, complicated DCS AI aiming logic, well, not complicated, but how uh, difficult to change it is. Uh, I need to actually run the fucking gens up before I do that. I'm getting all out of order here. Got one engine up, so we'll just... Again, you're probably not meant to throttle up while on one engine. You're probably meant to wait for both of them, but fuck it. I don't think it matters in DCS. I'm sure the colonel will have them add that in a future update, so I'll get fucked over on it. And I'll learn my lesson to actually follow the correct procedure. Such a good song. Just added to the playlist last night because I finally figured out what song it actually is. I've heard it in like a lot of the time when I'm just doing stuff uh, off stream. Um, I'll have a Twitch window open just listening to like all different DJs and stuff. Um, just to expand my musical horizons a bit and get some chill vibes, and this one comes up quite often on one of the channels I listen to, but I could never figure out what song it was. And I finally pinned it down last night and put it on the playlist. Seal got frustrated playing with Petro and got to fix it. <laughs> yeah, that's probably why it happened, honestly.
Seal needs to fly with me more often. We have not done any Hind stuff together for a long time. We need to do some more, because Seal is very good at the Hind. In either seat, he's very good to have in your Hind with you. Gotta fly with some of the other Vodka guys as well. I don't know if Matroshka even has time to fly DCS anymore, I haven't seen him in game for ages. I think everything's on that needs to be on. We are hermetically sealed, that doesn't really matter, but I like doing it just because Malarp. Uh, haven't got the um, DVS disc switch on, which is what fucks up your moving map. If you've ever wondered why your moving map is showing you moving the opposite direction to where you're actually going, or 90 degrees offset or whatever, the culprit is this switch here. DVS, uh, DVS na dis. I don't know what DVS stands for, I think it's something to do with the pedo boom system that would be uh pvd pvd um is a pedo boom but devs might be like uh some sort of just about to be some sort of air data computer probably that's actually that's probably what it is air data computer or something yeah, I'm it at the just kidding i mean you can if you really want You'll have to deal with a very out of practice pilot, though, with no instinct for self preservation. <laughs> Works for me, I can complain how bad my pilot is. The other thing we could do, actually, is uh, if, you, if you fancy flying a hind yourself, we could go up as a pair. I can fly one. Right now, I'm trying to provide protection against that F 16, though. Okay, yeah. Wait, shit, there's an F 16? Holy fuck, I didn't even notice. I shot him down just a little bit, a minute ago, but then I got shot down. I was like 4,000 meters in the sky, I don't know what it was. Yeah. Maybe enemy AI got me. O okay, so, yeah, stay in the MiG-29 then, that's probably the better idea. <laughs> Titan, cheers for the raid, man, yeah. good to see you. It's been a while, man, hope you've been keeping well. Welcome, everybody, uh, you are witnessing the... Now, keep in mind, the F-16, he only has heaters, so, but he's still an f He's still dangerous, yeah. You are witnessing a very scuffed pilot's very scuffed return to DCS. We've had technical issues out the arse today, half of which are my fault. I've forgotten how to fly this thing. It's great. But yeah, I hope you had a good stream, man. Welcome in, everyone. Uh, if you are new here, I uh, haven't done DCS for quite a while. I've been on a bit of a hiatus, but I am, like, primarily a Cold War Red 4 guy in this game, so... If you uh, like to watch things with blue cockpits, this beautiful soothing colour here, this is where you'll find them. Also do a lot of Misfiz recently, that's become sort of my chill out game. It's a lot less stressful than fucking DCS is, that's for sure. And some other things, Gunner Heat PC, Armor, which we did this morning. And uh, I just got back from a trip down to Melbourne to see the Avalon Air Show, which is pretty sweet. So I'll probably be chucking some photos and videos from that in my Discord at some point this week. I gotta pull them off my phone. And uh, met up with a few other DCS guys. As well as uh, one of the devs of Gunner Heat PC, my old mate Harry, who's the art lead. I got to see some sneak peeks. The infantry are looking pretty swanky. Oh my god, another one! <laughs> Mike Delta, cheers man. Hope you had a good stream. I'd forgotten how dangerous those tanks of yours are, man. I've got to, I've got to relearn all the little tricks I used to have to use to avoid getting shot in the face. You've pilot sniped me like three or four times so far today. Very nice gunnery. But I'm glad I was able to finally uh, come in and, and get on the server and give you something to shoot at. I've been meaning to for a while, as a way for all of last week. And it's some. Um, it's nice being able to kind of get back into the hind in a relatively cozy environment. Until I get a Sabo through the face. <laughs> For those of you who don't follow him already, I strongly recommend... First of all, go follow Titanfire as well. Um, 
He puts out a lot of great stuff and also hosts a lot of uh, tournaments and things like that. So there's always some great entertainment there. And go give Mike Delta a follow. If you have any interest in combined arms or just if you have any interest in tanks in general, um, the man used to used to command one, right? So that's the place to go. I have a bit of book knowledge about tanks. He has the been there, done that knowledge about tanks. And let me tell you, it shows through his gunnery. Look, I like to think that my lack of recent practice in the hind and my wobbliness is working in my favour here. Because I did notice a few times you were having trouble getting the lead in as I was turning. Because my turns were constantly wobbling and changing, right? It's, it's a point I've made to chat a few times. Um, it's actually a, a historical thing I came across reading about um, World War II air combat, particularly during the Battle of Britain, is that the first pilots to get shot down, assuming, you know, all else being equal in terms of experience, um, but the pilots who were really highly trained, experienced aerobatic pilots and flew really smoothly, well-practiced routines they got shot down real quickly because they were too predictable. The pilots who were like natural pilots but really sloppy and lazy, like, you know, how I fly basically. I know what the aircraft's doing but I don't really care to fly it straight. Those guys usually ended up surviving the war. Um, and they ended up being some of the best fighter pilots because they were so unpredictable. They had a natural enough feel for the aircraft that they wouldn't crash themselves but they were just lazy and sloppy enough in their flying that they would always be like in a slight side slip or they'd be kind of bunting around without warning. They were very hard to predict. So that's, that's my excuse. I've been running that excuse for years now and I will continue to run it for as long as I live. Um, I'm not a bad pilot. Actually, I'm just so good that I'm hard to hit. Unless it's Mike Delta shooting at me. <laughs> it's mean the Luftwaffe is uh, right all along. I think the Luftwaffe is a bit past the threshold of what we're discussing there. Know where you could practice your piloting? Uh, the remainder of it? No. No. Memory hold? Forgotten about? No. Additionally, fuck you for bringing it up and reminding me. Yeah, well, I guess I'm bad at keeping promises. Maybe one day we'll do it. I'm not doing it anytime soon, though. You know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see them actually add proper auto lead for the tanks that should have it. And I may have pointed this out as far as things that, that would be huge improvements to combined arms for, like, relatively little change-ish. I don't know what the code looks like. But um, having actual lead computing on things that should lead compute, rather than having to, you know, lead the little War Thunder indicator. Because, I mean, for you it's probably not too bad, because you should have a relatively low ping. But for me, if I'm trying to lead that, like say I'm in a Shilka or something, and I'm trying to lead that, I have to give it extra lead, because it's not accounting for my ping. It's like when I actually do play War Thunder, like the lead indicator doesn't account for ping. It makes it very annoying. Though the Shilka you shouldn't need to manually lead, the Shilka's fully autonomously radar guided. You literally just tell it lock this and then tell it to fire in this range and it'll automatically engage. Um, we were speaking earlier about Soviet automation and how while the Soviets struggled with like full-on digital computing like what the West had, especially like miniaturized personal computer kind of stuff, uh, the Soviets were very, very good at automation. They put a lot of effort into it and that's one of the things is the Shilka from 1968 uh, would... All you had to do was find the target, lock the target, and then it would engage once it was within the parameters you set. You could also manually override it to manually aim and fire the weapon. You could do any combination thereof. You had a backup optical sight, but the Shilka was a very automated weapon. Um, which is why when people ask for the Shilka and Gunner Heat PC as a controllable vehicle, it's like... You, you could, by making it use the backup sight and the manual overrides, but if you look inside a Shilka, it looks like the inside of a submarine or a spaceship or something. Um, it doesn't look like people think it does. And if you compare it to like an M113, the 113, it was radar guided in the sense that the radar cued you to shoot. So the 
if you want to look at the way that the, the War Thunder-ish lead indicator works, that's accurate for the M113. Because the 113 had essentially a gyro sight, a radar corrected for range gyro sight. I think it might have been for rate as well. Um, so you put the thing on the thing and you um, press the trigger, which I think was a foot pedal in the 113. Uh, not the 113, the Vulcan 163, the pivads. Bit scatterbrained today, sorry. Um, yeah, like the Vulcan was manually aimed but radar corrected. The Shilka was radar guided. Very important distinction in functionality there. Yep, on comms, and I am weapons ready. Okay, I'll steer 115, uh, let me know once I get close. Copy. And, um, can you warn me if I get too close to the demilitarized zone as well, please? Because I can't see that on my map very well. No problem. Thank you. Have it, but it doesn't show. Does it? Okay. I'll have to check it, because the, um... I don't drive the Western tanks in combined arms that often. I think the last time I did was ages ago. It was the M60, but the um, the T80 last time I drove it, I couldn't figure out how to do it. I'll have to check. There's a lot of, like, a lot of the fire control systems in DCS are really inconsistent. The T72's um, gun sight kind of half works the way it should. Um, the M60 okay, the and, can't... Uh, divert to your uh, two o'clock because it stopped inside the trees just to waste in our time. Go uh, to south, 180. 180. Right. Um, 180. The, uh, the M60 can't super elevate its gun to correct for ranges beyond 1800 meters. That thing should be good out to like 3000 from memory. The issue is I don't have the documents to prove it, so it's probably not going to get changed, and the Gunner Heat PC guys are probably going to want to sit on whatever documents they have, right? Not give them to what is kind of sort of basically a competitor in a sense but 1,800 meters maximum for that's kind of weird. Is this the same M60 I was trying to engage before? Just remember, I can't see my own position on the F-10 map. Uh, you can see me, but I can't okay. see myself. Okay, uh, push. You can't see me. Oh. Okay, push back, push back a little bit. Okay, hang on. Yeah, push back. 180, yeah. And, uh, slow down. Okay, I've got gunfire incoming. I'm going to circle back around. Yeah, as you might have been able to tell, uh, Mark, I've been in kind of getting uh, very rusty in my absence, so I'm going to have to relearn all those little tricks I used to use. I've been getting kind of um, complacent too, like engaging two or three targets in a single run, which is a bad habit. I should be engaging one per run. It's having me set down, this is interesting. This could be very dangerous, but it could also work very well. Let's see how we go. I'd like some more tree cover if I'm going to land, but we'll have to make do with what we have. Might be a bit of a rolling landing because I'm not very good at this. Okay, 
Okay, you have cap uh, big 29er friendly, so uh, ignore last instruction, go high and proceed to the big smoke. Going to the smoke. Oh, he probably had me land because the F-16's yeah. passing around. One, seven, five, go ahead to the big smoke. Yep, I see at, it. Uh, yeah, at the left of the big smoke, two, uh, one track, one Humvee, and one uh, mounted Z-23. Uh, she does not like being this slow. Uh, yeah. They, yeah, they beyond, they, they beyond the city, so go high. I see, uh, it says IFV, it's in the middle of the river. Is that friendly? Yeah, that, in the middle of the river, it's me. Okay. I just thought I'd double check, I even though NATO has very little amphibious uh, stuff. Uh, when I, uh, spot, uh, the target. Okay, I think I see AAA. It's, it's, uh, like, opposite side of the city you're driving to, yes? Okay, yep, I see it. Oh, don't tell me. Oh, I don't have missiles again. I think we're out of missiles at the... I think we're out of missiles at the FARP. Because every time I tell them to load it, they don't load any. I can maybe engage it with the gun. Do I have rockets? Did I forget to realm? I don't remember, man. <sighs> My brain's not working very well today. I don't remember if I forgot to ask to rearm or if they just don't have any missiles. Because we're out of Sturms, but it showed that we had some attackers left. No, I've got none. I've just got gun. No, I tried to rearm, I think, but they haven't given me anything. Yeah, I tried to load attackers, but that's all it said we had. Yeah, I've got guns. I think uh, either the FARP is empty, or it just doesn't want to reload me. Because I, I'm pretty sure I asked for reload, I just didn't get anything. They did defuel me. So yeah, I think we're out, or the reload is, like, the reloading's fucking function's not working properly. Okay, zero nine zero, and what smoke am I looking for? Just, just at the right of the big smoke. Just at the right of the big smoke. There's zero seven eight. Zero seven eight. Slightly to the right. Okay, it is engaged now. It's engaged now. Do not cross the the river. Go north. Go left. Yeah. Zero, zero. I see. Um. Like destroyed vehicle smoke as well behind the big smoke. Yeah, yeah. Check if uh, tracer at your uh, three o'clock. Mm, yes, tracer coming from the trees. Yeah, this is your crew. Yeah, I hear the fire. Not it hasn't been my lucky day with this thing today, but oh well, we're having fun. Okay, they become static. I will take. Uh, hey, Fenrir. Mark. Good to see you, man. So the artillery base I couldn't reload at or refuel at at all, they just didn't even respond to me, even with the canopy open, and the FARP... <sighs> See, this is a problem, my memory's not real great today, because I didn't get much sleep, but I'm sure I asked them to rearm and refuel me, and they did defuel me a bit, so I'm pretty sure I asked, and they just didn't give me anything, but I should have checked before I took off. Like, that's the thing, I just assume that it's going to work, and then when it doesn't, I get to the battle, and it's like, oh, well, I've got no weapons, but I should have checked. Okay, I crossed the river, stand by for a bit. Okay, I'm gonna circle round again because I'm getting kind of close. Yeah, turn. Uh, yeah, do not cross the river. Turn right. Uh, two seven zero. Yeah, he's firing at me again, but 
he's missing. Uh, I tried using the IC, uh, ICS, I tried with the canopy open. Like, if the canopy's open, you shouldn't need to use the ICS. And like I said, they did defuel me, so they heard me, they just didn't rearm me. It's showing no suspended load on the rockets. We'll just double check, but yeah, no rockets. I don't know, man. Catch you later, Mike Delta. Good to fight against you again, man. Definitely gonna have to do this more often. And for everyone that missed this before, this server is Dogs of War. Uh, if you used to enjoy playing on Alpen's server, or you're sad that you missed the chance, this is where you go. This is like a spiritual continuation of Alpen's server, with all the same faces that you know and love. I'm just gonna try and charge him and jink his shots. Because I can't hit him from this far across the river. Hit. There's a Humvee next to it, also destroyed. If it wasn't such a long flight back to the FARP, I'd be tempted to go back and check again. And then if it doesn't work, go to an airfield, but I don't know. Back to the north side of the river. We have a lav nearby. Lav is kind of dangerous at Bushmaster Hertz. Hey Josh, good to see you man. We, um, we still gotta do Wolfpack. Don't, like, don't feel pressured or anything, but when we both get the time to do it, um, we've definitely got to do that again. Get a stream going, maybe get some other guys in. Get a whole crew. So everyone can laugh at my incompetence. See, the nearest air base is, uh, Tsukumi Babashara, which is a fair distance away. I think we own it. Sukumi Air Base is friendly, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, I'll try landing and rearming there because I think I'm having trouble land like rearming at the FARP. I think we're out of weapons uh, there. Give, give me a minute to check for the lab because the lab Yep, is okay. Nearby. Yeah, I can kill that with the gun. As long as it doesn't pilot snipe me. I've been away from DCS for quite a long time, so I don't know if it's, like, if the game's not rearming me or if I'm just stupid and I keep forgetting to ask. <laughs> no problem. Uh, fix everything. Hold on. Did you flip it to the intercom inside the, uh, Yeah, I tried... I tried the intercom. I did it with the canopy open as well. Do, uh, I forget, does it need the canopy open... Or, like, sorry, does it need the intercom with the canopy open even? Or is it just one or the other? Because I thought it was one or the other. It, it, Oh my god, okay. Yep, yep, okay, that makes sense. Or at least last patch did. Maybe, I don't know if they changed it. <laughs> they probably did. Probably wasn't in patch notes. That's how DCS that's works, good, right? Uh, yes. Okay, that's good. That's love, and uh, you, you can land here. But uh, I think a couple of uh, infantry yeah, inside there. I can kill infantry with the gun, but rockets are probably better. Like, if they're if, if they're in the open, I can gun them, but if they're in amongst buildings, we need rockets, because they're really hard to hit. This gun's too accurate. Can I find two inside this, uh, I don't know, this tree is at your 12 o'clock right now. Okay, I'll have a look. Okay. Okay, a friendly at your 12. A friendly, uh, footmobile at your 12, uh -huh. okay. I see and some uh, dead infantry uh, by this tank wreck to my left. At your nine right now, at your nine right now, uh, blue infantry. Okay. I saw one dead blue infantry, I don't see any alive. Too many trees. Hey 
it's funny every time I go on like Enigmas or something and talk shit about all the players that don't know what they're doing today I'm the player that doesn't know what he's doing it just goes to show like how quickly the skill degrades and the knowledge it's it's not even all skill it's like esoteric knowledge of how DCS works so I generally try to be as understanding with with people as I can be in this it's just you know I'm more likely to get frustrated if somebody who's been playing the game longer than me team kills me or something than if a new player does it because I know a new player doesn't know better and I know that the DCS community has a habit of uh, miseducating new players with wrong information. Unfortunately, I don't have the time anymore to sit on Enigma's Discord and teach people, so... I'm kind of relying on other people to do it for me now. Now, the Lav is amphibious, so if he wants to push across the river with it, he can, but he's... Probably weren't with a hind circling. Move the thermals for the ones that didn't have them too. Oh, for the commander view? Yeah. I've got a radar lock off my 10 o'clock. That's me. Okay. Job interview tomorrow? Hey, nice. Good luck. Good luck. Just trying to figure out, so we got some friendlies in the sky. Just trying to figure out what's what. This is a whole album, by the way. I forget which song, like what the title of this song is, but it's off that album. There's a truck there, but it looks like a uh, Ural. Labs are not that small, so I'm surprised that it's this difficult to spot unless he's driven it off somewhere. Also, uh, is he on red smoke? Oh, I see gunfire. I've got hits. I think it's dead. Yeah, Lav is dead. Okay, uh, turn, turn uh, right, uh, south, because you're approaching a uh, Vulcan. No, no, turn right. Turning right? Turn right, yeah. Yeah, keep, keep turning right, because the Vulcan at your uh, 4 o'clock now, at your 6 o'clock now. Yeah, okay. Okay, if you, if you want to land here, land, but uh, I'm not sure about the, the infantry, the blue infantry there. Okay, I'm going to fly uh, to Sukumi and see if I can rearm missiles there. Copy. So it'll be a little while, but I'll come back. Okay, fly safe. I could go to the FARP, but I already know the FARP's out of Sturms, so I don't trust it. you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Just remember, when you do interviews, don't, like, go out of your way to okay, so to qualify kind of things, off, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, I have no way of killing an MBT until I get missiles, so I'll get him when I come back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Technically, I can kill an M60 with the gun, but it would kill me first. Takes, like, a couple dozen rounds into the rear armor to kill it. But yeah, um, remember, everyone else is going to be uh, telling little little porkies about their uh, their past experience and their skills, so... Don't feel like you have to be overly honest during the interview. Everyone lies during them. It's a problem I have, too, is I, like, find it really hard to make shit up or, like, exaggerate or sell myself, as it were. But then you have to realise everyone else is doing it. Everyone else has specifically been told to do it, so... It is what it is. That's half the reason our world is such a fucking mess, is because people get jobs they're not qualified for because they're better at lying than people who are qualified for them. You know what I mean? Yeah, you gotta be a bit of a bastard, exactly. You won't get yourself anything by being, you know, upstanding and honest, because that's not how our system works, unfortunately.
Uh, speaking of which, actually, um, the the getting a job part, not the being, you know, a bit of a bastard part. I'm, we all know I'm one of those. Um, I'm going to have to delay going back to study because I... First of all, there were no places in the course I wanted to transfer to, so I got put on the waiting list. Uh, they contacted me while I was in Melbourne, so I wasn't able to check my emails daily because I was too busy touching grass and getting absolutely plastered with my mates. But um, I got an email saying, oh, there's 20 new spots, but you have to apply next day and commence immediately. Like, I can't. I can't, because first of all, I didn't see the email until three days later when I got home. And second of all, I couldn't commence immediately because I was in fucking Melbourne. So uh, I'm just going to wait until next semester. It's easier that way. So probably like this week or something. I'll, uh, I'll enroll for next semester and I'll just find some work to tide me over for the next few months. Probably only like three-ish months. Find something temporary. And that should hopefully help uh, top up the bank balance a bit after the trip. Psycho Kita, cheers for follow. And um, cheers for anyone else that did anything. I've been really sloppy with following my uh, stream alerts lately, so I apologize if I missed anyone doing anything. I appreciate you all being here regardless. So even if I don't call it out, just know you're appreciated. And I will see it like the next time I check my, uh, my dashboard and I'll go, oh fuck, I wish I noticed that. I've been doing this for four years and I have yet to figure out how to get my alerts onto this screen where I can see them versus my phone where I have to squint to see them and I miss half of them. Unfortunate? Yeah, I mean a bit. It is what it is. Um, the biggest sort of issue really is that if I end up picking up work, which hopefully I will, at least for a little while, um, it's going to be very much a temporary thing because I, I can't handle full-time study and a fucking job at the same time. Like, I struggle with full-time study as it is. So whatever it is, it'll, it'll just be temporary. So hopefully... Um, I can either get something that works well with that, or I can get something where they like me so much that they're like, hey, when you want to come back... I've had one job like that so far, but it was not a job that I really, really was that desperate to go back to, so... We'll see how we go. And then, um, yeah, the, like, the biggest concern, though, is... Just working around that, and also, um... I don't want to get... Like, I don't want to fall back in the habits that I... I kind of had to break to study again. Like, I'm a bad student as it is, um, and so I kind of wanted to keep my study consistent so I wasn't going to fall back on those habits, but it is what it is, man. Um, and if I transition from working, like, part-time or whatever to full-time study, it's not that big of a difference. As long as I'm doing one or the other. I've set myself a bunch of goals for this year, including actually finally doing my fucking driving test so I can drive legally. Uh, by myself, anyway. Like, I, I've got to renew it because it's expired, but I've had a learner's permit since I was in high school. Like, I can drive a car, um, and as long as I'm in, you know, not on a crowded city road, I'm very confident in driving a car. It's when I'm around other people that I don't trust that I have issues. Um, I just never took the exam because a lot of the time I either lived somewhere where a car would have been like a bad idea because it would have just cost money and I wouldn't have had to use it anyway. Or it's because like I was worried, oh, you know, a, a lot of the time here they'll fail you on the first exam just to try and like pop your ego and then they'll make you run it a second time and also raise state revenue. Um, but they'll make you run it a second time and I'm not the kind of person that does things twice. Like if I fail something the first time, I'm just like, well, guess I'm bad at that then and I never do it again. Um, which is a recurring problem I'm trying to work on. Doesn't apply to DCS, apparently, because here I am, all these years later, still playing it, and I fucking suck at it. But, um... 
Why well, really hate uh, when driving is narrow roads, super scared of side swiping someone. Yeah, like narrow roads, uh, not really a thing I encounter that often. More so they happen in like the suburbs here. Well, I say the suburbs, but like not new development stuff. They mostly happen in older suburbs, like where we used to live on the central coast. Um, nicely done. But um, my I biggest concern is just other people collecting me because I know how to use a roundabout. I know how to fucking turn a corner, I know how to read a stop sign, I know how to use traffic lights, but a lot of people here don't. Melbourne's even worse. That's that's actually like one of the bad things in Melbourne is the drivers there are fucking chimps. Oh my god, they're the worst drivers I've ever seen in my life. They're so bad. Like I thought Sydney drivers were shit. At least Sydney drivers have the excuse that Sydney's such an old city that the street layout's munted. Melbourne has a grid layout. Melbourne's designed like a sensible city with a fucking grid layout. And it's not one mile grids like you have in North America. It's like... It, it's walkable grid. It's it's the good kind of grid. But still, um, Melbourne drivers fucking suck. Like, god, they're bad. And they're real- like, they're, they're not like Canberra drivers. Canberra drivers are hesitantly bad. They'll sit waiting at an inter intersection for half an hour for a written fucking invitation. Melbourne drivers are aggressively bad, which is really what you don't want. But yeah, um, so I've got to I've got to actually get myself driving. I don't know if I'll end up picking up a car myself. Um, that's kind of a big expense, and I don't know how often I'd use it. But at least being able to drive would be really helpful because then that opens up my options for different jobs too. Um, I'm not really not really uh, hanging out here to become a delivery driver or whatever, but if I wanted to walk down, uh, sorry, work down the road at like an industrial place or something, you know, um, dropping off supplies for tradies or whatever, I could do that. Melbourne has those weird hook turns that I've never seen anywhere else in Australia. It's because they have um, a really extensive tram network. Like it's, that's, that's the reason I was told it's basically trams. And their tram network's fucking impressive, man. I couldn't believe it. Like, the map of the Melbourne tram network looks like the London Underground. It must have, like, ten different lines on it, and God knows how many hundred stops. It, I was, like, I was joking the whole time I was down there, oh, like, right before I fly out, I think I'll apply for, for asylum down here. I'm fucking, like, half joking about that, half not. It was really cool to see an actual functional city and an actual functional state compared to fucking New South Wales. Like, I'm sure they have their issues down there, but shit, at least they ain't New South Wales. That's the job stuff, really look forward to finally making a livable amount of money, really do not look forward to the stress of working full-time. So I'll see if I can get an 80% thing. Yeah, I'm not a full-time person either. Like, I just can't hack full-time work, especially if the hours shift around. Um, I did work full-time with consistent hours, with, you know, plus minus half an hour, depending how heavy the workload was. But I did work full-time for about half a year, and I probably would have been able to do it for longer if my co-worker and I didn't have such a bad personality conflict. Um, you know, now with kind of distance... He was a funny guy, and I didn't mind him so much, but when the two of us were trapped together with only each other for company, on a shitty fucking miserable day, cleaning windows for eight hours straight, like, we would be at each other's throats by the end of the day, so... I think that was the issue there. But... Something I've kind of realised is I don't cope that well with full time, and I really don't cope with shifting schedules, which is pretty fucked, because most of the jobs I'm likely to get are, like, casual, or, well, casual and or the hours really flex. Like, that was what fucked me at the motel, was I would go into work not knowing if I was going to get out three hours early or three hours late. I might get out at, you know, I'd go into work at um, 7 or 8 a.m. I might be out by 11 o'clock in the morning and have a wonderful day ahead of me because there was fuck all to do. Or I might get out at 5, 6, 7 o'clock at night because some fuckwit had trashed, like, three separate rooms or we were short-staffed or both of those things happened at once. Um, and then, like, having to kind of semi-play social worker for some of my co-workers was a bit draining as well. I felt really bad ditching out of that job because, it's like, the poor girls are going to get absolutely fucking raked over the coals while they wait for a new person to hire, but... It's like, I'm not going to be doing anyone any favours if I burn myself out as well, because, like, they've already got problems, they don't need the problem of me in a bad mood. Because when I'm in a bad mood, I'm in a bad fucking mood, as my regular viewers will know. Uh, my temper goes from 0 to 60 real quick. 
Like, I, I literally walked off that job because I was like, I don't think it is safe for anyone to be around me right now, so I'm just gonna go home. I really... The best job I had in terms of how well it suited me hours-wise was when I first started at Coles. Um, and I was working five days a week for four hours a day in the morning. So it was a morning shift. Um, I'd start at seven, I'd finish at eleven. And it was... it was the easiest thing in the world. Yeah, some days would be rough, some days would be easy, but because it was four hours in the morning, consistent, didn't have to worry about getting held back except for one or two days every couple of months, like... It was really consistent. I had a really good co-worker that I was, I was always on shift with. I could have done that forever. Even though the job wasn't very, you know, prestigious and it was tiring and all that stuff, it, it didn't matter. I could have done that forever. But as soon as they started fucking with my hours and dumping everyone else's workload on me because um, our team leader drove all our other good staff away, um, that was it. I had to ditch out of that one. Like, that's the thing. Like, you find a job and it doesn't have to be your dream job. It could be some shitty, fucking underappreciated job, but as long as they treat you okay, you could totally stick with that for a long time, and I would have. It's only when they decide to make the number go up faster by fucking you over that you get jack of it and leave. Like, you know, I I would not have burnt out on that job if they did not fuck with my hours and dump other people's workload on me just because it made it easier for the fucking team lead. Simple as that. So I don't know, uh, like, when I'm done studying, I think I probably do want to pick up some sort of counselling work. Oh, hello. That was the MiG-29 shadow, I think. Um, I probably do want to pick up some sort of counselling work. Uh, don't know where, maybe, I don't know, Headspace or something. They'd probably take me on without any uni qualifications and, and give me some actual real-world experience, but... Something like that, but part-time. Couple days a week. Especially because it is the kind of job where, you know, you risk burning out if you get too, uh, get in too deep. I just... I want something that's livable. That's all I want. And until my most recent rent hike, I could live off about 16 to 20 hours worth of work a week at minimum wage casual rates. So I didn't even need to work full time. Now I'd be getting towards probably minimum 20, maybe 24-ish. So I don't need to work full-time to break even, or even save a little bit of money, really. Which then adds another layer of it giving me the shits when someone's like, Oh, this is a full-time position. It's like, well, I don't need full-time hours. Please stop giving them to me. You know, just because everyone else is keen to work as many hours as you give them doesn't mean I am. I don't have a family to raise. I, I have some expensive hobbies, but I can mostly temper my expenditures on them. Plus, I don't... I need a new gun safe, so I can't spend anything on those for a while. Got nowhere to put them. Yeah, like, that's the thing. It can make all the difference in the world what the other staff are like and what your hours are like. Consistency, good staff being treated like a human. Like, you're still being exploited by capital, but it doesn't... It, it doesn't wear on you as much. Like, you know... Everyone's got to play the game, unfortunately. As much as some of us wish that we fucking didn't have to, you have to. If you want to survive, you fucking have to. And it doesn't mean that you have to fucking throw your own beliefs under the bus. It just means that you're doing what you have to do to survive. Because it's it's like, you know, when you have to fucking perform first aid after an accident. Or, you know, on, a, on an airliner when the oxygen mask popped down. Put your own on first. Worry about yourself first because you can't help anyone else if you're fucking dead. Now, that's not to say you should get, you know, self-interested to the point of greed and becoming that which you hate, but you've got to look after yourself. Because if you run yourself under the bus, it's not going to help anyone. Not you, not any of your friends, nobody. So I totally get that. And, like, that's the thing. If you find a job that, that does that, that lets you kind of just find that good equilibrium, stick with it. Unfortunately, every time I found one of those so far, something has changed in the workplace which fucked it over, so... The hunt continues. It's having anxiety in my career, so I quit for a bit. Yeah, and that can be a- that can be a good thing to do, like... Um... You know... 
it's it's fairly good advice not to quit a job until you've got a replacement job lined up. I get that, and for most people that is good advice. But for some people, this is especially applicable to me, I can't do that. I can't wait. When I reach that point where the fuse goes, I have to quit. Because if I don't, something bad's going to happen. Like, you know, don't take that the wrong way, but, you know, I, I start... My mind goes places I don't want it to. Nothing will probably happen, but I don't want to be in that headspace. So, when the fuse goes, I quit. And yeah, it might mean I'm unemployed for a couple months. It might mean I have to live off my savings. It might mean that by the time I find a new job, I've exhausted my savings, so I end up trapped in this cycle. But you know what? I'm surviving. Yeah, I keep running myself into corners and having all these, you know, 99 problems, but I'm surviving. I'm doing better than a lot of people. And yeah, Indy, I agree with that. It's better to quit without a replacement lined up than to, like, go postal mode. Maybe not literally speaking, but, you know, to freak out at work or start doing something that, that is perceived as unprofessional or sabotaging or whatever. Don't, you know, you don't want to get to that point. I mean, some workplaces definitely do need a bit of fucking sabotage, but other than that... <laughs> Uh-oh. They've neutraled out something, or did we neutral out something? I'm not sure which side of the river Siberia is on. But we'll see what we get. Hopefully we can find something nice and uh, nice and tolerable for a few months. Maybe, if I'm really lucky, I'll find something that, that is willing to cater around my study. So they might be like, oh yeah, you can work, you know, as many or as few hours as you want. That'd be the dream, is just, you dictate your own hours. Unfortunately, those are pretty rare. And where they do exist, it's usually because the job is mega stressful. But we'll see. I actually got to uh, eat Georgian cuisine. Topical for DCS, wise in Melbourne. Um, it's this little, little restaurant um, out in... Uh, I forget which suburb it's in. It's a bit out of... I think it's past Caulfield somewhere. Um, but it's called The Umbrella, and it's run by this this little old Georgian dude, um, Timo. He's, he's wonderful. As soon as you walk in, you get accosted by Timo. He's just all smiles, he's all chat. He's, as far as I know, he's the only one that actually works there, except sometimes apparently his wife comes and helps out. The food is incredible. The wine is to die for, and I'm not a wine drinker, but even I was drinking the stuff. It's good stuff. Um, and it was funny because there was some, there was a Russian couple that came in a bit after us because um, Harry and Leah took me out there because they were like, you have to go to the, the umbrella. Um, there was a ICS before I forget. Oh, Su-17, it's nice. Um, there was a Russian couple that came in behind us and without even having to say anything, Timo immediately clocked them as Russians. Like, before they even said anything, Timo immediately began talking to them in Russian. I was like, mm, yep, he knows. <laughs> Which is pretty funny. But he was telling us, well, I mean, I, Harry and Leah might have already heard the story. They've been there a few times. But, like, he was telling us the story of um, how he ended up in Melbourne. Um, so he's, he's from the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic, but he's also Jewish. So he went from the USSR in the early 70s to Israel by way of South Africa, which is an interesting way to do things, because um, something that kind of is overlooked is that even Stalin was, like, massively anti-Semitic, right? He, he mostly kind of gets, a you know, overlooked because there was a, a, another dude who was a bit more anti-Semitic than Stalin was at the, at the time, who gets most of the attention, understandably so, but Stalin was, like, a raging anti-Semite. Um, and the Soviet Union never quite got rid of that legacy. Like many things from Stalin's era, it never quite flushed it. Um... And also the Soviet Union had this thing where they didn't want to lose Soviet citizens to other countries, including Israel. Because Soviet citizens, like, you know, the, the Soviet Union invested in giving them a house, giving them food, training them, like, free education, all this stuff. And he was telling us, like, if you left back in those days, you had to actually pay back what your education cost. Um, and it was really hard to get an exit visa, you had to go through... Uh, I think he said the Dutch embassy, the Netherlands embassy, he had to go through to get an exit visa. It was like a whole ass process, and they could still deny you for any reason. There were a few also fairly high-profile, um, very 
very obviously like targeted anti-Semitic fucking prosecution campaigns going on at the time as well. Um, so he got out, went to South Africa for a while, then went to Israel, then came out to Sydney, hated Sydney because people in Sydney are just fuckwits. Um, he said, oh, I hate it because, you know, no one, they only think about themselves. You know, one of my friends told us, oh, I know these people in town that you can go to go in and visit them for dinner and they'll show you around. They're like, oh, well, actually, we're a bit busy. It's like, if, if somebody told me, oh, I've got friends that have just moved to the country, they need to be shown around. He said, I would drop everything for them. But no, not in Sydney. So he said, fuck that. Went back to Israel and then came out to uh, Melbourne. He says, I, I still don't like it, but it's better than Sydney because people here smile. <laughs> he does actually... No joke, he does actually bear a striking resemblance to Joji from fucking Cobra Stan. Not even joking. But he's a lovely guy. Absolutely lovely guy. Because it's just him there, it takes a while for your food to come out, but man, when it does, the food is excellent. And, um, and because it was a fairly quiet night while we were there, he just... He was just standing there chatting with us while we ate dinner. It was awesome. I don't know if the ground crew are gonna... It says that we've got weapons available. And I did use the ICS, so I don't know. Uh, not OFPs. OFPs are, um... There's a compatibility thing with the Heinz, so the Heinz weapon system can't handle certain weapon combinations. Kind of like the Vigans, right? It's probably for a similar reason. There's just not enough data space on it. Um, oh, and I've got to refill the gun, too. If they even rearm me. Which they're not going to. I still can't rearm here, so I think uh, I'm going to go back to the FARP. You gotta be doing something wrong I must be, man. I must be. Because it says that they have weapons here. Yeah, so you got the thing set to ICS, right? Yeah, yeah. I just hit an ICS. First stage trigger. Interphone. Yeah, because as long as it's on ICS and um, you select the weapons you want, then they say rearming and they say copy, you're good. Yeah. Well, I remember there was a long time ago, um, there was a bug where sometimes you couldn't rearm the MiG-29. I think it was on, um, fuck, what mission was it? It, it was on Alpen server. It was one of the ones in this same area, and Red had uh, 29s they could fly down from Nulchik and forward base them out of Sukumi. Um, and sometimes they would not speak to you in the 29, so you'd have to just fucking fly all the way back to Nulchik. It might be a recurrence of that bug, maybe, or I'm just, like, retarded, which is probably what's actually going on. Yeah, I kind of have, have what I just jump in there and rearm it for you, because that uh, um, front seat guy can do that for you. Yeah, I'll try the FARP, and if that doesn't work, then I'll just respawn the helicopter or something. Try to turn, turn, off, turn off the engine. It shouldn't matter in the Heinz. That. Yeah, that's only for Flaming Cliffs. Um, hey, by the way, for the Flaming Cliffs, I literally asked for fuel and weapons, and they told me copy on the fuel, not no go on the weapons. So it started fueling while my engines were running. Yeah, you can hot fuel, but you can't hot arm. That's the only restriction on FC3 is you can't hot arm. Oh, uh, when did they add the hot fuel? You used to couldn't do that. Years ago. It's been like that as long as I remember. Oh, man. I, I it's... Played these enough. Yeah, it's one of those weird bits of esoteric knowledge that, like, you know, if you've played DCS for a really long time, you never think to check it, and nobody ever tells you. Yeah, exactly. We want to head basically east from here. Don't hit the ICS button. Oh, okay. No, my bad. My chat's telling me I am, in fact, a monkey. Uh, I was hitting the ICS trigger. I need to hit the ICS button, apparently, or the switch, apparently. So I'll just come back and land at the airfield. Yeah, that explains so many things. If it's the fucking... I don't know. It's, it's dumb. Like, the Tomcat does that shit. There's a couple modules that... Do the Mosquito... Come on. Yeah, the Mosquito does it too. You know what it is? It's because fucking Hoggett or whatever tells them, Oh, it's, it's unrealistic. The ground crew wouldn't be able to hear you over the running engine. And yeah, they wouldn't. You know what? That's why God gave you hands. Not just the hands thing, but I'm like, dude, where's the ground crew? I don't see them. When yeah. I ask for weapons, they say, they say copy. They're nowhere to be found filling the damn aircraft. Like, we don't need this level of realism. Yeah, and like, 
if it was truly realistic, you would just, you know, gesture angrily at them and they would put weapons on the aircraft. They would understand that. Or, like, for the mozzie, they would understand hand signals to crank an engine over. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why they don't, like, it's uh, whatever, yeah. It's, uh, jank for the sake of appearing realistic to those who don't know better. Correct. A familiar concept for Tarkov players. Uh, ICS, 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 I gotta remember where it is. S P U. Is that it? It's either that one or the one next to it, we'll find out shortly. Kinda of tempted to take the bombs, but. I don't know if we're gonna have valid targets for them. Bombing in this thing's fucking hilarious, I've done it before. Yeah, that was it. This is what I get for not playing much since September. Hell oh, yeah. Well, the funny thing is, this didn't even change, it's just I forgot that you had to do the switch. Like, because that changed before I stopped playing. I just completely forgot. Yep. The data space isn't a problem in the Mirage 2000. It is with a lot of these aircraft, because they, they genuinely don't have much memory. Um, the Viggins CK-37, for instance, the memory is ferrite core. It's a big block of ferrite core memory. It probably is for this, too. Um, well, it almost certainly is for this. But, uh... Oh, MiG-23, my beloved. Yeah, it'll be a while before we get one of this is playable. Yeah, I'm sitting on my hands, waiting for a chance to actually test fly the thing. So far, all I can test is my patience. Yep. Um, yeah, like, the Vigan has ferrite core memory. And the data cartridge is what actually gives it the most of its memory. So all the extra loadouts you can get on the AJ, uh, AJS, the turn nav system on the AJS, the reconnaissance system, that all stores on the data cartridge. Because the data cartridge is like 8 megabytes, and the internal memory is like 28 kilobits. It's fuck all. On the plus side, um, at least DCS isn't likely to vanish anytime soon. You're like... There's so many games that they come out, and they show promise, but they just don't make number go up high enough for the investors or something, they shit can them. Last played Sims in general, man. Yeah, yeah, really. But, um, there was like a, a fucking, um, video I was watching about all these abandoned games, and there was one that was like a Battle Royale, and it just released like a year or two ago, and it was a really well-made game. A bit weird, but really well-made, but it just didn't have the player count it needed, so they were closing it down. <laughs> Just a waste. All right, I think I finally have weapons. Yeah, now you wish you were still in the park, right? <laughs> it's not that much further, to be honest. I think I can afford to burn a few dozen uh, hours on the engine, poofing it back over there, because, let's be real, this thing probably ain't coming back to base again. I've lost quite a few, um, big 29s to Sam's. Every time I get low across that river, I get popped by something. Yeah, I've, um, when I fly the 29, I'm super paranoid. I usually don't go below about seven, seven or so kilometers and just sit in and look down. Avengers <laughs> Avengers go up to about five kilometers, I think it is, so you want to sit above five or six. I'm not sure if they have Avengers, I think it's just chap rolls on this map. Oh god, chaps are... Mm. Chaps have even more reach. Do they? Mm -hmm. The chaps in this are kind of interesting because they're like... The missiles are relatively easy to defeat if you see them, but if you don't, you're screwed. Because it's a big missile, it'll outrange an Avenger. And, um, 
as was discovered on Ligma's Discord, the chaps we have in DCS are a 90s, like, late 80s, 90s upgrade. Um, and they've got the post upgrade for the Seeker, which is basically the same thing the Stinger has. So it's a dual channel. It has infrared, like you would expect, but it also looks for UV, and it looks for a shadow in the UV. So you can't get against the sun because it sees the shadow, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got you. Now, how well that's modelled, I don't know. I just know that... Uh, if you piss off the chap, you're gonna die, and so is everyone near you. Because the uh, the chap don't care who he hits, he's just angry. That man's on his own team. Yeah, by the the chap that got me dead. I thought I was, I thought I was above it, but I guess it wasn't. It's kind of funny, yeah, I've... I'm good at chap. I've noticed because I'm so, like, risk-averse in the MiG-29, and I specifically look for high altitude BVR, because that's what the 29's so good at. I find that in the 21, I actually kill a lot more stuff. Like, the 29, maybe I'll get a kill every sortie or every second sortie. The 21, I get, like, two or three per sortie on a good day. Yeah, because you don't care that you're going to die. Yeah, you do all the dumb shit you're not supposed to do, and you somehow get away with it. Well, the thing was, I started out at a high altitude EVR. Um, it was, like, two F5s when we engaged up high, but... Man, the AI, they've gotten real good at dodging these missiles, including IR. Oh, yeah. So, uh, he, dodged, he dodged them all and took me to the ground. I ended up gunning him, and then on the way back up was when the chap got me. Yeah, the, um, the AI improvements are nice. It'd be a little nicer if they weren't quite so omniscient with uh, IR missile launches, but at least it's something. Like, it's nice to get into a fight with them and not just go into the infinite vertical loop that they used to do before. Oh, yeah. Well, they do a great job at jinking and avoiding gunfire. Oh, yeah. I'm really impressed with that. When they first added that behavior in, um, the... It applied to the H6 for some reason, the H6J. Like, I don't know if just Decker didn't didn't have time to switch it out for the other behavior, or if, like, ED didn't realize Decca was using some variable or whatever. Anyway, the first intercept I did on Ligma's against H6Js, I had one of them jinking me like he was in a fucking F5. It was the funniest shit. Yeah, their, their flight model probably in here. Catch you later, man. Sleep well and good luck tomorrow. Good luck. Facebook just Thanos snapped their most popular competitive VR game for no fucking reason. It's arbitrary. Community even hired assessment to fly over Facebook HQ. Well, Probably just shutting it down for no reason with a exactly banner. One time, honestly, and uh, not since. Yeah, sometimes it's like that. Um, I think like this, the last or second last time I actually had a chance to play on Alpins um, in the 19, I was flying with the 475th guys, they were flying MiGs, and the whole of like that Iriaf clan were on blue, and we didn't see them for like an hour and change. We were just circling at high altitude, burning up fuel, and finally we get a call out and it was right next to our fucking base. It was um, it was the desert has eyes. We got a call out for them at Keshem. We figured out what they'd done is they'd flown all the way around the, the fucking back end of like Oman and the UAE, come in from behind Hassab, and tried to bomb the fucking uh, Dvina site that was covering Keshem. I don't know why. Like maybe they were doing a squadron training and just using a live server, but it was really odd. Yeah, we we blue, we like to do weird things. <laughs> I don't know about that, but that is, uh, kind of crazy. I believe they have, uh, if those aren't our big 23s that are being made, those are F4s. Yeah, we'll probably juke it out with the 23s in a minute. I can't wait for the Phantom, man. I feel like being a Red 4 player, you get extra hype, because I want to fly it myself, that'll be awesome. I want to learn to Rio it, because that'll be awesome. But I, I just can't wait for the harvest of, like, people that think that just because it has this mythos about it, it automatically makes them a good pilot. Just like with the F1. Free meals for days. Oh, I'm gonna love the F4, it's gonna be so much fun. Dude, that thing's gonna be such a good bomb truck. Like, I don't think Red's ready for how good of a bomb truck that's gonna be. Like, man, you thought the Vigan oh, was a pain oh, in the ass? <laughs> oh, now, the Vigan, dude, like, it's, uh, it's a former glory of itself. It's not the speed demon. Well, yeah, because I fixed it. it. Flies how it should now. But, hey, it still feels good. I actually prefer flying it now. I don't have to worry about, like, am I, you know, breaking the laws of physics here? 
Well, yeah, I mean, it's much better in that regard, because I, I watched when it was eye-watering, watching it oh, yeah. away from me when I was trying to intercept it, and it shot down like six bombers on the thing, but I'm like, damn, I couldn't even do anything. Yeah, when one's in like a 40 degree climb accelerating through Mark 1.5 from subsonic, it's like, what the fuck? But it's cool because... Yeah, I mean, it's nice that it's fixed, but the faster plane now is the F1. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, like... I don't know if that's correct, though. The F1 I don't either. I yeah, I, I think it might be. There was some back and forth on the forums about it, but... Like, the thing is, um, relying on speed is all well and good, but because the Vigan doesn't do that anymore, especially with weapons on board, you've got to actually learn how to set up a proper attack. You can't just send it. Which was half the fun of that jet anyway. Like, that's why I bought the Vigan, was to play with this esoteric Swedish beat boot machine in it, right? Yeah, I, I, that's my favorite part about the Vigan, is setting up everything. It's like Mavs too, like I very rarely use Mavs on the Vigan, because if I wanted to sling Mavs, man, i just take an F a, a A10 or an F16 or something, like, the Vigan's fun, because I can come in blind in instrument fucking weather, and carpet bomb an airfield, or just slap something with rockets with as much precision as someone can hit it with a Maverick. You all aren't ready for my snake eyes? Absolutely. But yeah, I'm, uh... I'm, I'm kind of scared what an F4 or an A7 when that comes with a full load of fucking bombs is going to do. It'll be a lot of fun. Oh, for sure. I wanted to see the A6 before the F4, but, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I, I would have liked to see the A6 too, because you just, it's not something you see that much in other sims. I mean, Strike Fighters has it, but, like, that's about it. And it's, obviously, Strike Fighters is way lower fidelity. Used to flash strike fighters there? Yeah, for full fucking price, like it came out last week. I don't know why they do that. That's because they got that market cornered. <laughs> yeah. I'm quite sure that they would do better if they just dropped the price and less people would feel inclined to go searching the high seas. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, if it was, you know, even if it was fucking, I don't know, like, 80 bucks Australian or whatever, I don't know, that's, like, probably 60 US, 50 US, um, I would absolutely buy it for that. That's, like, a, that's a new AAA title, basically, right? I'd buy it for that, but no, it's, like, a hundred and something with the add-ons. Fuck that. <laughs> it's like buying Steel Beasts, yeah, but not a fucking simulator. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Hey Milo, thanks. Well, I was hoping he would get that A6 over here so I could just not think about strike fighters, but now I have to think about it. Great DCS where right? I have to take a week to relearn an aircraft again? Yeah, I've been doing that one today. Also, catch you later, Chocolate. Thanks for swinging by, man. I, um, I know people have picked up some new stuff. I'm curious just how many they've picked up. Because they've got so many projects on the go, man. I, I think they've got a habit of over-promising on stuff. I can identify my own traits in other people, and boy do they do the same shit I do. <laughs> yeah, they have over-promised a bit. Um, they're finally, I mean, you know, like, he, he, the um, cockpit forge that, you know, sort of they disappeared for a bit, and then they're like, no, nah, okay, yeah, we're gonna do it. Are they and actually they're doing, doing that? Doing it. Holy shit. Yeah, the Tomcat's cockpit will rotate out with three different uh, panels currently. Nice. I'd be more interested if they could figure out how to get it so the port numbers will change. They could dynamically change those. They already did that with the Vigan, so I'm sure they could... Like, this is the thing. I'm sure it's not a difficult fix. I think it's just allocation of time. Because that would probably be really low priority, right? What confuses me what is why it wasn't like that in the first place. Like, I wonder if it was a conscious decision to make it, oh, we have this historically accurate livery for this aircraft, so we don't want the player to change it, or, like, they didn't know how to hide it if the player just didn't enter a number or something? I don't know, fucking know. Weird decision. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of wondering, like, what's going on, because right now, like, like they can reduce their li livery count. This is like, a talk show now, by the way. And then the number dynamically change on it to appropriately, like, yeah. represent it. Of course, I mean, your pilot name just going to hit you, but... You know what I'd actually really like is, you know how the helicopters have that 
slider in the mission editor about engine condition. I wish everything had that. So you could make a, like, a war-weary P-47 or something. Say you want to have a LARP training mission or something, you could have, oh, this plane's war-weary, so we're putting recruits in it or something. Or you could have, like, if you have the Hornet and you want to derate the engines to make it, like, a, a pre lot 20 uh, Charlie, you can do that. Now that would be nice, because I would really love to get, because honestly, the Alpha um, Hornet's cockpit is not significantly different than the Charlie. Yeah, it's mostly just, like... like monochrome screens versus color, but like a light alpha is pretty fucking close, especially a alpha plus, like what we had. Right, and so if you could detune the engines, oh, that would be just so wonderful. And the radar that we've got is modeled off a of fucking, um, alpha radar anyway. That radar's a little too bad, or was anyway, I haven't played it forever. I, I think it's change. gone the other way now. It's like a fucking pendulum, man. <laughs> Apparently it's got a really massive look-down penalty at the moment, so all the Hornet guys have been bitching about it, which is understandable. Anything to make this stuff worse. Hell yeah. Like, like I've, never, I've never seen a pilot in real life tell me that, like, oh, the radar is just so amazing like it is in this game. This game is it's like an arcade, dude. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, like, the jankier and shittier it is, the more fun it is, in my opinion. Like... I want stuff to go wrong. I want missiles to go dud, or like things like that. Just because it, yeah, it'd be frustrating if you die because your missile failed to guide, or because something random happened. But you know what? Give it ten minutes. It's funny. Like my impossible DCS dream is it wouldn't work so well in multiplayer unless you had a persistent campaign like what Ligma's got. But like to have players kind of have the same airframe between, you know, shoot-downs or between sessions or whatever, so you have to actually look after it, and maybe you get a slight randomization. Like, you know, no two planes are the same. One's always going to roll a bit to the left, no matter what you do. One's going to be a little bit faster. One's just going to have failures all the time, because it was built on a Friday afternoon. They didn't give a fuck. I'd love to have something like that, so if, especially if you get, like, a good plane, like one that's just a little faster than all its stable mates, you have some incentive to look after it. It just makes mergers that much, uh, that much more interesting, because you don't know, like, maybe the other guy's plane is a little better than what you would expect, or maybe it's a little worse, you have no idea. It's cool to see people joining the server this late in the day, relatively speaking, it's not even 1pm here yet, but like, this is usually the time when Alpen's server would be empty, because all the uh, Europeans would have gone to bed and the Americans would kind of be, you know, some of them would get on, but then they'd tend to pop off as well. Oh yeah, man. Like, um, I, I kind of, for the longest time, I had this mentality that I've got to come prepared for whatever happens, so I'd come heavily loaded, full fuel, whatever. Man, when I started downloading the 21 to 2 missiles and a, just the small belly tank only on uh, Enigma server for like the early weapon set, or uh, on here when we didn't have the R60s, or not here, Alpens, I mean, basically the same place. Um, or like when I had an F5 that was on fumes, on a cold day, you you just never see that usually, but it's like a whole new aircraft. Yeah, it changes things dramatically. Like you can, like uh, if I if I'm a little dick, but I start rating with an, uh, an F5, for example, I'm in the F1, and he looks like he's even coming around just a little bit. I just peel out. I'm like, I'm done. He's got more more uh, less fuel, and I'm I'm at a disadvantage. That's something I'm kind of curious to try, because I haven't flown the F1 as much as I'd like. I want to see how that thing handles when it gets pretty low on fuel. Because its main problem is it's, it's like, half again as heavy as like a 21 or an F5, right? It's a heavier plane. You get some of that fuel burnt off, it probably improves a bit. It does well. I could, well, I don't really know what, I, what it's like against like Super Ace pilots or something, but like I was gunning people to the right. I had like, I was in like the 30 kills and only died like 7 times and some of those were, yeah. were not even pilots, it was me flying into the ground or something. I'd say, like, for the most part, um, like, I, I kind of don't trust my own data, so to speak, in the F1, because I just don't have the hours on it, like, I'm not that good, but when I fight F1s in my 21 or my F5, um, I never really saw them as scary until I came up across, um, either Crazy G-Man in it, or, um, Scout, 
I had a really good fight with Scout one time in a lightly loaded 21, him in a lightly loaded F1, and it was basically, we both ran home with our tails between our legs and very little fuel left. Oh yeah. Hey, Satan's Ace. Cheers for the raid. Hope you had a good stream. Welcome, everybody. It's it's kind of an interesting aircraft because it burns energy so quickly and it struggles to regain it. But it can it can kind of I don't know. I wouldn't say it throws its nose around quickly, but it can throw its nose around in terms of like you know it gets some pretty crazy angles, and it can actually hold them. As long as it has energy to do it. So yeah. I also found that um, the combat flaps on it are kind of a trap because a lot of people, especially IL-2 players because of how IL-2's flight model works, but like a lot of people in DCS just assume more flap equals more better and it's like it, it really doesn't on a lot of aircraft and especially on the F1. If you drop those combat flaps you're not getting back any speed you lose, so like you just won't. The only reason you want to drop them is if you're, you know, kind of on the edge of stall at a hundred and something knots and you really need the extra lift and you pull them in as soon as you're done. I'm just near the front line now. I uh, took fire from something across the river so I'm going to start searching for it. Yeah, there's uh, three howitzers in front of me as well, artillery. Oh, for fuck's sake. My hat switch that I use to tell Petro what to do is kind of sensitive, and half the time it turns it off. There's infantry uh, on the left side of that town as well, by the way, in the trees. Yeah, that's infantry uh, all there. It's a style. No frequency. Oh, there's a lot of stuff here. Yeah, 040, uh, 2.1 nautical miles. He tried to hide inside uh, the city. He died. Okay, I see him. I'm gonna get some altitude. Petro is struggling to see him through the trees. Yeah, take some altitude, please. Take some altitude. You have the sky. Yeah, keep, keep, keep. Okay, I'm. I'm gonna have to come from the other side. Petro can't see him. Performance is amazing. It's 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 actually yeah. Um, it's a problem. I'm gonna get some distance and circle back. Um, it's actually a problem for me because DCS was rendering so many frames that it was killing OBS. So we've gone back to CPU encoding for OBS. Hopefully it's playing nice now. So that's a plus. I can encode on the CPU now. Before I couldn't. Well. I couldn't on some servers. We'll see if I can now. It might still be a little much for uh, on Enigma server, but on here it's pretty good. Okay, hide behind the square building. Okay, uh, have a good shot on him. Turn left. One. 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 At the edge of the corner of the city, or oh, the town, in behind uh, that square building. Gain some altitude, please. Gain some altitude. Go a little bit high. I'm probably too close. I'll have to go around again. Copy. You see the square building? 
Yeah, 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 I see where he's from. I see where he's shooting from. Yeah. Okay. He's, uh, he's driving it around obstacles, so Petrovich can see him, but he can't aim at him, because he wants to aim at the centre. Shooting at me with his main gun, cheeky bugger. This is risky, I might catch a main gun round in the face here. Or he'll hide behind the building again. Come on, Petro, come on. Speed it up, Chief. I'm too close. I'll have to get way further away, or he'll just shoot me as I pass over. But I know where he is now. Copy. Yep. This is where I would like to be low, so we'll get behind this tree line, so that it's harder for him to get line of sight on me to shoot me as I fly away. This is the kind of stuff I should have been doing against my Delta. Altitude. I want to slow down a bit because my closure rate on that target's super high. It makes it kind of difficult. Generally, in the hind, you don't want to be below about 200 kilometers an hour during an attack run. I usually sit around 250, but sometimes you do need to dump some speed so you can climb up and pop a shot over a building or a tree line or something like this. Because some of these bastards are really hard to hit. Oh, he's driving towards me, I think. Okay, you can ignore that uh, M60 and go for. The inside of the, the blue circle there. I might see just as I fly towards that if the M60 appears. Maybe I can get him as well, but I'll go for the artillery. Oh, for fuck's sake, come on. I fat thumbed it. I don't know if I'll get a shot through those trees and through the power lines, and I'm worried that tank's gonna snipe at me as I pass. Yep. And the trees are in the way again, I'll try and get above them. Oh, I just got hit. I think the tank shot me. I thought that might happen. Okay, fly, fly uh, he's he's hit my rotor blades. I think I'm going down. Yeah, I'm dead. I'm dead. Ah, it's dangerous being close to enemy tanks like that, man. I'm going to have to relearn all of my esoteric kind knowledge. You never want to get that close if you can help it. Sometimes, like, especially on some of the desert missions, um, or where we had, like, a pair or a trio of hinds working together, you'd circle over a target to bait fire so you could see where they were. But is this Cold War server? This is a Cold War server. This is uh, Dogs of War. So this is, like, a continuation of Alpenwolf's Cold War server that the community started. Um, 
because Alpen has a, another kid, um, so he doesn't have enough spare time or money to run the server anymore at the moment. It'll probably come back one day because Alpen is uh, a true DCS player like all of us. He can't keep away from it no matter how much it annoys him. But for now, um, Mike Delta and some of the other guys from Alpen's server are running this one. We probably will jump on Enigma's Cold War later on just to see how it runs with multi-threading. Um, and also because I want to do some jet stuff as well as just hind stuff. But I think um, before I hop on there, I'll probably get myself something to else uh, something else to eat because I'm getting hungry again. So we'll play on here for a bit longer than we might hop over. Yeah, so that was uh, that was why I wasn't getting rearm before, is because I kept forgetting to actually hit that ICS switch, which is what you need to do. It's very annoying. I wish they'd just revert it to being able to either use the ICS, like the actual intercom trigger, or just use the radio. Because in my opinion, it doesn't really add much to the game except frustration. It doesn't really make it feel any more realistic. Kind of makes it feel less so. Because, you know, if I, if I was in a real hind and I wanted to be rearmed, I could just gesture angrily towards my pylons from the cockpit and the ground crew would see it. They would understand what that means. A bit better, uh, but still gets a bit choppy when there's loads of destroyed stuff and high population. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, they are running the, like, the version 2 of the server with their um, hexagonal cells instead of the uh, old front line, so... I'd expect it to have... Be, like become more performance heavy even if they change nothing else so the fact that it's it's like not too much worse apparently that's a good sign a little more optimization should get it where it needs to be more units but very spread now yeah that's that's not a bad thing i think it forces you to, like, actually search for units more than before. And it makes the fights a bit more lively. It also makes it more challenging to just drag people into frontline AAA like, uh, like you used to be able to. I, uh, got murdered by a very angry M60, so I'm gonna have to come back out. They're all hidden in trees. That's the only reason I'm not flying it at the moment. I felt like doing some hind stuff, but the 25 would be more effective. I just, I've already got music playing, so. Hey, I, I turned off my helmet. I'll do. Yeah, I've got my helmet down to like 10%. That's how you reduce the music currently right now, Ross. Yeah. So, like, we're, we're moving in there. Yeah, yeah. I just, I don't like turning the helmet volume down because then you lose the uh, call outs from AWACS and stuff as well, and all the, like, audio warnings. Damn, I wish I could read. Yeah, well, you read chat, come on. <laughs> Alright, uh, 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 I think we are, whoop, if I can avoid pulling my stick off the desk, I think we're mostly good. Sync up the gun sight, it already was. It's dimmed a bit so I can see. Make sure everything's on. Kill the APU. Uh, we'll just reset these to clear those cautions. Turn all that off and we should be good to go. And we'll make sure we have missiles. Hang on, i reset my track IR because it keeps drifting. We don't have weapons. Probably because the aircraft isn't powered up. 
so we'll have to rearm and refuel now. Oh no, right, because we're out of fucking Sturms. Um, we want attackers, that's why. My tiny brain forgot already. Turn the autopilot on. I said now we turn the autopilot on, there we go. Real crews on strike, yeah they are. Oh I see, so that's constantly transmitting on the ICS, that's what's happening. It's weird it doesn't function through the trigger then. My bad. We'll just get the aircraft pointed into wind and we'll tell them again. I shouldn't have moved. Look at me, so impatient. How goes the Mi-24? Uh, I'm, I'm very bad at it because I haven't played it for so long. It's been... I'm not even going to say failing upwards, because there's been not a lot of upwards happening, yeah, mostly downwards. I got that practice with that gun and that F1. Uh, Enigma server's running those nine Bravos, and... Ah, uh, yeah. Mirage. Mirage with the nine Bravo, it's only got like a one degree point on its nose, so you can't really use them. Yeah. It, that missile's in an interesting spot, because it uncages on everything else, and it shouldn't. And the R3S also uncages on everything else, and it apparently shouldn't. Missile uncaging is one of those weird esoteric things that is super hard to actually get clear documents on. Yeah, it seems so. But it's very difficult to use the 9 Bravo with Mirage, so um, half the time I'm on someone's 6 and I can't even fire it because I can't get the growl because it's up. Yeah. Because they don't have a mark on the HUD's up at all. You know what it is? The aiming mark, for, like the bore sight for missiles or guns, is the, um, the index mark for the compass. I've tried putting it there, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. So I end up gunning a lot of guys. Yeah. That. My uh, my main yeah, success, my main success in that aircraft with the nine B was a team kill. So. <laughs> yeah, been there. A team kill guy told me I'm sorry, and he's like, I accept your apology, but uh, you're gonna have to deal with the, uh, the points. Yeah. I was like, thanks. Going well, Francois. Uh, I'm a bit of a dumpster fire today, but I'm going well. Oh, well, here we go. I think I'm going to have a short break and something to eat, and then I'll uh, possibly see you guys on Oligmas. If there's a spot now. Likewise. Probably, probably calling it for me, it's just late over here. Oh yeah, it would be. <laughs> Middle of the day here. Yep, you get to have so much more if I... Have even more if I lived in a real time zone. <laughs> Maybe. Well, we got some high in practice in. I remembered how to start it, mostly. Uh, we figured out what we were doing wrong with our weapons, now it's mostly just going to be practicing not flying into tank shells. And remembering to not turn on that. So I just messed my map up. Uh, I saw that it was full and I didn't even bother, I just popped in here instead. Alright. Uh, I will be back in probably a few minutes guys, I need to have something to eat. Um, get myself another drink. Oh, I still got some in this actually, so I'll be back in a bit. I'm gonna have some food and uh, we'll hop in Ligmas, so see you shortly.
pro streamer, by the way. Forgot to set that up. Also, um, don't don't spam join because uh, it lags the server out. DCS has this wonderful thing where every time a player joins or leaves a server, it causes the server to like hang up for a moment. So if people are spam joining, it fucks the server up. Ligma's uh, pretty pissed about it. Thanks for following, by the way. But yeah, I will be back in a bit. Um, enjoy the slideshow and the tunes. Uh, to answer that question, I've flown on Tempests like once or twice, uh, and it was pretty pretty cool. It's very similar to Enigmas, just with a different aircraft set, so um, like if you really enjoy flying the MiG-29 or the Mirage or the Su-27 or something like that, it's a, a good choice. Um, let's see, what did Super say? Enigma's still full in red stack, Tempest has got some space at least. Yeah, I might hop on Tempest when I get back then, do some Mirage stuff or something.
If you're still here, by the way, cheers for the resub dust drive. I just noticed that now. Sorry guys, I've been all over the place with these alerts lately. Appreciate you all. Excuse me talking with my mouth full, but um, just thinking out loud here. So I think what we'll do is, once I'm done eating, we'll fly probably the Mirage 2000 for a bit on Tempest. Probably get my ass kicked, because it's been forever since I've done any BVR. Um, I think that'll do for DCS today. And then we'll probably hop over to Gunner Heat PC for a bit, play through a couple missions in that, maybe part of a campaign. And... Um, call it there, because I don't want this stream to run too late, and I know I say that every fucking time, and it ends up being like a 10 hour stream. We're already probably up to like 6 or 7 hours cumulative today. Actually, yes we are, because it'd be 7 hours, I started at 6am. Anyway, um, but I've got an appointment I need to be at tomorrow, um, I've got other stuff I have to get done, so I don't want to make this a super long stream, but I do have other shit I want to get done. So, what I will try and do... And this is contingent on a few other things, but what I will try and do is I'll try and squeeze in another stream. Um, probably like... Thursday? Maybe? Or um, possibly Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, something like that. So I'll try and get in two streams this week, which is... I've been on one stream a week for quite a while, because I've just been so snowed under with stuff to do. Um, but we'll try and get into, because I want to do a Misfits stream, and I want to fly some of the things that you guys haven't seen on this stream yet, but some of you probably already seen elsewhere. So the N225 came out, so we'll fly the Maria for a bit. Uh, I actually landed uh, landed it in Kai Tak the other night. I didn't think I'd get it in there, but I did. I didn't even break anything much. 
Um, so we'll do a flight in that probably. We might do one in the BF-108. Um, fuck, what else is there that's been added recently? I don't know. We'll find some shit to do. We'll fly missiles for a bit. Um, and then we might do some snow runner or something as well. So I'll try to get two streams in this week and we'll get some variety going. And then we'll be back to the usual schedule probably of streams on Monday morning my time, uh, Sunday evening in the civilized world, which will be armor in the morning and then, um, you know, usually DCS or something after. I'll probably try and make it so that I do DCS and then something like either GHPC or um, Snow Runner, something I can start up right away because I don't want to have to keep doing this thing where I run, you know, a stream with an hour or two of waiting time for Misfist to load after I do an armor mission. It gives me time to talk, but, you know, it really stretches out the stream and there's not a lot going on at the time. Plus, I need to actually install add on Linker and sort that out because. I no longer have a choice. Um, my SSD I use for Misfiz is actually like very close to full. So probably one more sim update will fill it completely. So I need to start finding ways, probably through add-on linker, of just moving stuff in and out of the community folder as needed, or at least find a way to sim link the community folder to another drive where it's not going to lose too much performance. I'll probably have to just load stuff in as I go, and I think that's how you're supposed to do it anyway, because everyone else restarts their sim after every flight, so we might try and do that. It's just going to be a laborious process to figure out where all my shit belongs, because uh, it's hilariously disorganized, so then I can have presets for this or that area that I'm flying in. Anyway, I'll shut up now and finish eating. I will see you guys in game shortly. Isn't it great, and by great I mean fucking depressing, how all of Phil Oak's songs from like the mid-60s are suddenly extremely relevant again? I mean, most of them never stopped being relevant, but there were some that you really hoped didn't become relevant again, and now they have.
Um, also, I'm aware that I am, like, probably two months behind on s shifting VODs and stuff over to my YouTube channel. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. I know, I just haven't got around to it. Been busy. Shit happens. Uh, you know, touching grass, etc. So, it'll happen. Don't worry. My, um, my editing and management team is literally just me. So... Nothing ever gets done. Did you see the latest meltdown of using the 21 as a 25 RB at home? I didn't see the meltdown, but I saw the procedure, and I had considered whether you could use RSBN to bomb with. I guess you'd have to modify it, right? Because the actual RSBN beacon, I don't think, is on the runway. It's offset from it. At least I assume so. Maybe it is on the runway. Maybe it's genuinely that fucking, like, low tech. Um, but yeah, I considered using the RSBN to bomb, but, like, it would involve figuring out the maths, like, release speed, drop height, wind, blah, blah, blah. So I was like... That'd be cool if I could do maths, but I can't, so I'll just dive bomb. So it's uh, it's really funny to see someone actually doing that and it being super effective. I'll have to um, have a look for the highlights of the salt later. But this is what kills me, right? Like, the Vigans, um, bombs, they're only 170-something kilo bombs. They're not very big, right? 170, uh, it's, it's a weird number. They're not big bombs. So, it's funny watching people flip out about stuff that the Vigan could do if only they'd learn to use it properly instead of just using it to go like lightning speed and ripple off four mabs at something. This is the thing, like this is this is part of where my long time frustration with the Vigan has come from. People have only been so effective in it because of its issues and now the issues are fixed they don't know what the fuck to do with it. If you actually took the time to learn the plane you would be really dangerous in that thing. Like if you actually learn to do um, you know, radar bombing properly or things like that, you could do some really nasty stuff against airfields, but people just never learn to do it. So then somebody comes up with a low-tech solution in the MiG-21 to do the same thing with less bomb load and people are up in arms about it. Like, I, I don't get it, man. If people spent half as much time, um, you know, doing trial and error experimentation and, and maybe reading up on the aircraft they fly, as they do complaining about shit when other people do it, wouldn't be an issue. Like, look at all the weird and wonderful shit that Red 4 came up with, um, like Elvis and his rocket drop tables, where we were just, you know, seeing people use them as artillery from 20 kilometers away and actually making hits on stuff. You know, it, not super consistently, but they were making hits. It's, you know, you've got to take risks, you've got to do some dumb shot, uh, dumb shit. Dumb shot, dumb shit, to find out what works and what doesn't. You're never going to find out if you don't try. Doesn't help people keep using the big for cap rather than a ground attack, which basically can't be caught. Yeah, I mean, it can be caught now, but yeah, like, that's the issue, is that most Vigan slots I see on Enigma server are being used for fucking air-to-air, -air, which it is not that good at, especially now. Like, it's not the worst at it, but I wouldn't say it's very good at it. I'd rather be in an F5 for air-to-air -air stuff on that server. It's like the Phantom. I bet you anything, when the Phantom comes out, people are going to... Use it for air-to-air, -air, 
instead of out of ground. Remember, we're getting an Air Force Phantom, an F4E, a bomb truck, right? They're going to use it for air-to-air. -air. They're going to try and get in dogfights rather than doing any proper BVR, and they're going to complain when they get smoked by an aircraft that weighs a quarter as much as theirs does. You know? It's just dumb. And yeah, like, the thing is, the people using the Vigan for air-to-air -air on Enigmas aren't even very good at it, because they burn all their energy in the first turn, and they die. Like... Every Vigan versus MiG-15 encounter, I have either been the MiG-15 in, or I've witnessed somebody else recording, or streaming, for the past how many months, has ended in the Vigan pulling a really steep turn, burning all his energy, and dying to a MiG-15. There is no situation on Earth where, especially in DCS, the way things work there, that a Vigan should die to a MiG-15. None. Zero. And yet it keeps happening. Consistently. Didn't see the new F1 changes? No, you're correct, I didn't. I did fly the EE um, when I was at Min's place trying out VR. I did briefly fly the EE, just kind of to get a feel of the dimensions of the cockpit and what the visibility is like in VR. I didn't do any combat or anything in it, but... Yeah, I haven't seen any of the... Uh, like, I haven't read the change notes or anything for DCS for weeks now, dude. I haven't kept up. That boy right there that you just saw, the F-111, that's the plane. If Blue got that, it would be over. That's that's the Blue 4 dream right there. Except they'd have to get the Aussies to show them how to use it, because I think they're the only ones that actually care about having it in the sim at this point. It's kind of, like, weird how... how... kind of, not even lukewarm, the, like, the US Air Force really didn't show much affection for the F-111. Really deserved a lot more. It's an excellent aircraft. I would say it was easily the best in its class, even. For a long time. Keep bending him. Um, towards the end of their service, yeah. Because you've got to remember, we kept the F-111 in service for another almost 20 years after the U.S. retired it. 15, 20 years after the U.S. retired it. Oh, the U.S. Air Force? Yeah, they probably did. Um, there's also... This is something I didn't realize for the longest time, actually. There's a difference between the F-111, you know, tactical strike slash interdictor aircraft and the F-111 nuclear deterrent. The F-111 and the FB-111. The FB-111 has longer wings, like in a, like if you look there, that's a, I think a 111C, an Aussie F-111C. Uh, F the Aussie ones had the longer wings that the FB-111 had, um, and I don't know if ours had a lower G-limit, but I know the one, uh, FB-111 had a lower G-limit, because it was serving in SAC, Strategic Air Command, as a nuclear deterrent, right? It was a, a long-range supersonic nuclear bomber. Whereas the F-111 in normal U.S. Air Force service was a do-everything, you know, tactical uh, strike slash interdiction slash whatever you needed to do aircraft. Had shorter wings, had a higher G limit, you know, it was a bit more sprightly. Um, there was a lot of commonality between them, obviously, but they were not the same aircraft as much as you might think. And ours were kind of a weird hybrid of the two. But also there was some, I think there was some level of resentment from the US Air Force because they didn't want the F-111, they wanted the uh, Boeing Model 818. And McNamara told them, no, you get what you get, and decreed that the F-111 would go into service because he was still trying to force the Navy to adopt it as well. Well, the Navy told him to go jump, and then the Air Force was lumbered with the 
you know, the the second best option in their eyes of what could have been, so. Yeah, like, the F-111B thing was more of a issue for the Navy. I, I doubt it would have really affected the Air Force too much, other than, you know, naval needs being kind of grafted back onto the, uh, the 111 design itself, but... I would say probably a lot of it just came from the Air Force being salty. They didn't get the jet they wanted, even though the excuse me, even though the jet they got was fucking fantastic, especially after the bugs were ironed out. They called it the A one eleven. There might have been a different reaction, maybe. Well, the U.S. Air Force likes calling things F that they want to get pilots into to play on the cool guy factor, like the F one seventeen. There is nothing fighter about a Nighthawk, believe me. Um, and the F-111, likewise, they they wanted to get people into the whole mindset that this is a, a cool guy jet, this is a fighter, this will do everything. It's it's your, you know, your multi-tool of jets, but... I don't know, man, if I was an F-111 pilot, I would be pretty happy with that. You know, yeah, you might not be out pulling fucking 9G doing BFM sets over the desert and jerking off about how cool your plane is, but... You don't need to when you're flying at fucking 200 feet off the ground, in weather, at night. And you feel, you know, pretty safe doing it. Supersonic at that, like... There, there really wasn't anything else that could do what the F-111 did. Certainly not in the American inventory. Voice clip from Blue Comms? Oh no. And they removed the limiter- Oh, Oh, that sounds fun. That sounds fun. So now, as well as ripping the wings on the F5, and you can rip the wings on the uh, F1 if you try hard enough, you can also get yourself in a deep stool. Sick! You gonna buy the new Misfits MiG-15? From what I've seen, it's pretty rough. Um, now, the dev, I think, is in China, uh, in the PRC, and is apparently going through some shit right now. Um, like, an active prosecution by the Chinese government, because apparently they uh, decided he had some documents he shouldn't have. Whether he did or didn't, I don't know. Um, but he's, he, he made a post about it, and he's like, I've got 99 problems, and then went to list, like, half of them, and is like, I'll try and maintain it, thank you for understanding. So it's like, yeah, okay, that's fine, whatever. But I'm not about to jump on it for the price it's at until it is, like, the level of the DCS-15 or even, like, better. That's the thing. I don't want to... My beloved. Hey, Kim, just a resub, man. I don't want to... And, and this isn't aimed at that particular guy, mind you. This is just in general. I don't want to reward the practice that third parties for Misfiz have, of charging DCS level prices for something that is very much not DCS level fidelity. This whole practice of calling something study sim level when you can't pull circuit breakers, or when this system or that system is not modeled 100% correctly or whatever, like, or when the flight model is not 100% correct. I want to really encourage that. I know plenty of people will because I don't know any better, but I don't want to. I got to see a Mirage 3 up close the other day at uh, Moorabbin. Couldn't sit in it, unfortunately, but I got to see it up close and personal. It's pretty cool. The other thing with Mrs. purchases is... Hey Envy, good to see you, man. Um, 
the other thing with Misfits purchases is, excuse me, if I can remember how to speak English, is um, I don't want to get carried away with it because there's a couple of aircraft coming out that I absolutely must buy. The N2 that's coming out is by the same guy that did the Piaggio, which is fucking wonderful. So an N2 to the same level of quality as the Piaggio is a must buy. Absolute must buy. Um, I already bought the N225. It's good for the price, and I'm very happy to, you know, support anything that might possibly see either the second airframe completed, which is probably unlikely, let's be real, or at least, you know, find a way to assemble the second airframe and the existing, you know, what was salvaged off the existing airframe into, like, a monument or a permanent museum exhibit or something. Um, so I got the N225. There are a few other things I've bought, but there's, like... A, a list of probably 15, 20 aircraft for Misfits that have come out over the past six months, some of them over the past couple weeks. I really want them, but I can't afford to outlay that much cash at the moment, so I'm just going to have to pick them up when they go on sale now and then. Some of them are higher priority than others, like if someone dropped a good MiG anything on us right now, I'd buy it instantly. But that requires it to be a good one, and I don't think we're going to get one of those for a very long time. It'll be something to keep an eye on that MiG-15, but I kind of half feel like... I didn't compare them up close, so I don't know, but... I half feel like it's still using the same store-bought art assets as the M scenery one, which is using the same assets as the freeware one, and it's like... If the fidelity is not there and the flight model's not there, then you're essentially just paying for a freeware model, you know what I mean? And again, like, not to shit on the dev, it sounds like he's going through a really rough patch, and I totally get that, but... For me personally, I, I'm i not about to run out and buy something in my current financial situation that I can't justify. I've already done that with a bunch of different aircraft, um, and I don't want to fall too far down the I can fix her rabbit hole, because I've already got like four or five aircraft on the I can fix her list. Um, and I can't rely on CCM to mod those, because he was smart enough not to pull the trigger on them, whereas I wasn't. <laughs> I can rely on him to fix stuff that he's into, but things that I'm like, oh, wow, that, that, that's a cool plane. I wonder how it is. And then I buy it. I'm like, oh, man. Oh, it's going to take so much work. Um, yeah, I can't rely on him for that. Which is fair. I did try the Freeware MiG-15, and I wasn't a fan. Um, it, it really didn't feel like a MiG-15 to me. It's the plane you most regret buying. Hmm. I reckon it would probably be... I was trying to think of all the ones I did actually buy and kind of felt iffy about. I'd say probably the um that MiG-21 for Ms. Fizz. I knew I was going to be... Like, I, I was not expecting it to be, like, amazing. I wasn't expecting it to be that good, really, to be honest. Um... Because I'd seen videos of the P3D version and stuff, and I was like, okay, well, that's model wrong, that's model wrong, that's model wrong. That might be correct. This looks, you know, this looks okay-ish. Um, but yeah, that would probably be a strong contender. Um, another strong contender, I would say, um, might be the, um, the Hughes H1. Purely because of the amount of work it's going to take to fix that thing up to be like... Uh, you know, authentic. Because I think the dev for that kind of had a different philosophy than what I expected. Um, they wanted to make a plane that was fun for people to fly rather than a plane that was, you know, accurate to the real thing. And it's cool to have things that are fun to fly, like, don't get me wrong, but I'm the kind of person that if I'm buying a plane in a, in, in a flight sim, it's because I want to experience as close as I can get to the real thing. Like, if I want a, a plane that's just fun, I got plenty of those, you know what I mean? Um, if it's just a generic fun sort of stunt plane in a historical aircraft skin, so to speak, then it doesn't really do anything for me. And the H1, um, I mean, the H1 could probably be fixed up with modding if you got deep enough into it, but you'd have to do things like even retexturing the cockpit, so a lot of the cockpit's not right. Um, a bunch of the gauges need to be reconfigured because they're measuring the wrong thing. Um, there's a lot to do on that. The MiG-21, on the other hand, I don't think that there's much I can... Like, I don't know. That's probably beyond my 
ability to fix. It might even be like, I don't know if CCM would be able to fix that one, to be honest. Um, he's been messing with the 104 and he's got that a bit, bit closer to where it probably should be, but I don't know if he could handle that 21 because there's quite a lot that needs fixing on it. Having said that, they did do some things um, better than DCS. So the autopilot logic, for example, now it's probably just because it's using the base Misfiz autopilot, I wouldn't be surprised. But at least the stabilize mode on it holds the aircraft more or less where you point it, which is what it should be doing. So I don't know. I Like like I said, um, I think in a, a comment thread on my video about that MiG-21, I hope that the devs can get it where it should be. Um, and I don't want to kind of say, oh, like, we'll poo-poo these guys are bad devs, whatever. Like, like it, it, the state it released in is probably good enough for most people, but as someone who's really into Soviet Cold War aircraft, it's not where I kind of wanted it to be, especially not for that price. Put it that way. If it was cheaper, then it'd be easier to brush off. If it was more accurate, it would be easier to brush off for the price, but it's, it's neither. It's not hugely accurate, particularly in terms of flight model, which is like the most important thing for me. Um, and it's expensive, so... I'd say that would that would be the uh, short list. I can't think of many other I actually regret picking up, to be honest. There are aircraft I don't fly as much, but it's not because I regret picking them up so much as like they're just high commitment aircraft, like say the BAE one four six, because there's no easy way for me to just cheat start that. I have to actually go through the checklist, or um, you know they're aircraft that are interesting to me but not interesting enough to fly all the time. And as far as DCS modules go, I don't think I can say that there's a, a purchase I regret in terms of DCS. Um, the closest thing would have been the prefix Vigan, but I mean, that's been brought to a really good standard now, so I'm pretty happy with, with where it is at the moment. It could get better, obviously, but, you know, it actually does the things it's supposed to do now for the most part, certainly flight model-wise, so not really any uh, regrets there anymore, just, you know hoping that they continue to improve it as time goes on. MiG-21, like, even though there's a lot of stuff wrong with it in DCS, I'm still not going to regret it because it was a lot of fun. Like, I've derived so much fun from that jet over the years, and because the DCS MiG-21 has so much done wrong in it, or that's just outdated, um, it forced me to learn about the real aircraft. Like, I, that was what kind of woke me up out of my fucking normie slumber of, oh my god, DCS is this super popular, mega authentic flight sim. I'm sure it models the aircraft 100% true to life. And I found out, actually, no, it's like really, really off base. So if I, if I hadn't bought it, then I would just never have reached that realization. And I think a lot of people still haven't. Never flew it while it was broken. How bad was it? Uh, it could fly pretty easily without any wings or canards left. Like, it would just be a flaming fuselage and it would still fly and still fight you. Like, still be able to dogfight competently. Um, it was accelerating too too fast at high altitudes by a factor of about five. Um, so, like, with one of the draggier loadouts it can carry, at high altitude it was going from Mark 0.9 to Mark 1.65, well, we'll call it Mark 1.6 even, because that's probably the better number to use. It was going from 0.9 to 1.6 at high altitude in about a minute flat. It should have taken five and a half, which is what it takes now. And this is with a particular loadout, mind you. Clean it would be a bit faster. Um, and at low altitude, it was just ridiculously fast. It could reach speeds no manned aircraft has ever reached at low altitude. Also, yeah, it's Mavericks never ran out of energy, so if it fired a Maverick at something, it would just follow it until it hit something. Like, they were, they were like, fucking, um, photon torpedoes. It was, it was pretty funny. Like, it was annoying after the first couple times, but it was pretty funny at first, at least. But the Vigan has a lot of the same problems the MiG-21 does, because the Vigan and the 21 both came from the same place. You know, the Vigan came out after Heat Blur split off of, uh, Leatherneck, but... Originally, it was the same team that made both aircraft, so they have a lot of the same issues. 
Um, and particularly because DCS didn't support a lot of the features that those two aircraft needed at the time, so they kind of backdoored their way around them, and it's become increasingly janky as time went on. Sorry, I just realized you guys have been staring at the same slide for like 10 minutes, so I've been too busy talking. Nearly done eating, then we'll be back into DCS. The thing is, flight simulation is always going to be a really hard thing to pin down accurately, regardless of which sim platform you're using, regardless of anything else. Um, and so it needs to be improved over time. And there will be resistance to that. There will be people who say, oh, I bought this plane in this state. It should stay in that state forever. In a civvy sim, that's still a bad argument, but whatever. In a, in a sim with, like, multiplayer PvP like DCS has, fuck that. I don't care if you're mad your plane is suddenly, air quotes, worse. I don't give a shit. I want your plane to be accurate. I want my plane to be accurate. As much as possible. And if you have to relearn half the plane systems, then boo-fucking-who. You'll just become even more familiar with the aircraft you fly all the time, you know? I'm totally okay with half the systems on the aircraft changing. It means I have to learn something. I have to go and hit some books. I get to find out about the world. That's a positive to me, not a negative. Are there any good sims for the Vulcan? Um, there were a couple of different devs that released Vulcans for FSX and P3D and I think maybe X-Plane. Just Flight are bringing their Vulcan across to Misfiz though. I don't know how good the Just Flight Vulcan was flight model wise, but in terms of art, it was gorgeous. So we'll see how that goes. I don't know when it'll hit, probably a year or two from now. Maybe sooner, I don't know. So I'd keep an eye on that one. Having said that, the flight model um, quality on Just Flight modules does vary quite broadly. Some knock it out of the park at release, some take years of fixing to get where they should be, some never get where they should be. Because Just Flight isn't just a developer, they're also a storefront, so it's kind of all over the place. One of the problems with the, the Civi Sim world is like, there's no real consistency or much accountability. Yeah, um, Kim, the FSX version of the Avro Vulcan, that was what made me buy FSX. I wanted to do a barrel roll in the Vulcan like Rolly Falk did, and I saw that it was a Vulcan for FSX, so I bought FSX. That's the only reason I own that sim. And then I found out there was an English Electric Lightning for it, so I got that too. And the Spitfire and a couple of other things. But that was what got me into FSX. Like, that was what brought me back to civilian sort of oriented flight sims, was uh, the Vulcan. And yeah, being at a disadvantage because your aircraft is just worse at that thing in real life than the other guys, that's, first of all, that's called fucking realism, my dude. You want to talk about how realistic your sim is and how you're a real world pilot because you fly a fucking game? You shouldn't be complaining about that shit. But as well as that, it makes it more challenging. It means you have to learn your aircraft. And it means if you want to be really good, you have to learn the other guy's aircraft too. So you know, okay, my aircraft falls down in this kind of fight, but I can do this to get one back over him. You want to know why so many of the guys that are, like, cleaning house on Enigmas are either Red 4 players or they play both teams? It's because the Red 4 players go on vacation to play modern Blue 4 stuff every couple of months when they get bored. And the guys that just play both teams all the time know everyone's aircraft inside out. Like, you've got to play both sides' aircraft if you want to be good at the game. There's no two ways about it. Academic knowledge is one thing. Experiential knowledge is another entirely. A B-47. Oh, dude. A B-47 would be wonderful. Such a cool aircraft that really doesn't get the love it deserves. Gorgeous plane, and I will say yes to anything with bicycle undercarriage.
Yeah, you can totally get a sense of what they can do, um, just from flying against them or observing them. But until you actually sit it in yourself, you don't... Like, you have a, enough of an understanding to work with, but you don't get the full understanding of, oh, well, this is why they struggle to hit me with a missile in this situation, or this is why they can't rebuild their energy in that situation. For example, the MiG-21, um, the MiG-21 being really slow, that's a player thing. Um, and I, I say this as somebody who can't do it consistently myself, but somebody who's got a lot of t experience in the DCS MiG-21 can quite comfortably get it slower than an F5. They will watch you stall out of the sky and laugh at you. It takes someone with a lot of experience in the 21 to do it, and it's probably relying on some issues with the 21's flight model at very low speed, which should be addressed at some point, hopefully. But even then, the 21, it isn't happy at low speed if you don't know what it can and can't tolerate. If you know what you can ask of it and what topics not to push, so to speak, the 21 will take care of you at low speed. It's actually quite reasonable at it. But there's a lot of um, there's a lot of muscle memory that comes into it. You have to know the difference between pulling your stick to max perform the jet, uh, jet and pulling your stick to break the jet. You have to know which speeds to avoid pulling the stick all the way back because the AI you can't keep up with it. Uh, you have to know what control inputs work at which speeds because when you're really really slow, you have practically no aileron authority. You have to start kicking the rudder around. But as you kick the rudder around, you risk dropping a wing because then your aircraft's not, you know, balanced anymore. There's there's all sorts of uh, deep lore to it, really. Yeah, that's true enough, Envy. That is true enough. The F5 can point its nose like a demon, and I always forget just how good it is at that until I've got an F5 up my ass and I go, oh, I'll take him into the vertical and run him out of energy. And I watch him stand on his burners, about to slide out of control backwards, and he's still pointing his nose. And I go, oh, right, I forgot they can do that, because it's a baby hornet. The 21 can't look down very well, and it, it already looks down better than it should, so does the F5, by the way. If you if you get good at pattern recognition and figure out what the bugs with the F5's radar are, you may as well have look down, shoot down. It's a good thing it doesn't have any radar-guided missiles, or I would probably clear entire servers with it. it. It's that broken, like it's really fucked up and it needs a fix. Um, but the other thing with the 21 is, even if you're at high altitude, the R3R doesn't turn very well. It's not a very good missile. Um, about a 4-5G break turn is usually enough to defeat one, as long as you execute it at the right time. If you're giving him a beam aspect, if you're fast enough, he won't hit you. Like, there's... The launch envelope for an R3R to get it to actually hit somebody is very small. And people who don't fly the MiG-21 always overestimate the size of that envelope. It is tiny. Absolutely tiny. It's why I fire R3Rs in pairs, because almost always one of them will miss. Sure, I don't have an RWR most of the time. Yeah, that's fair. That is fair. You can see the smoke trail, although obviously if you see the smoke trail, it's usually a bit late. Um, if you're at high altitude, just keep an eye out for the contrails. If you're on Enigma server, use Overlord. So one of the great uses of Overlord is to figure out what is approaching you and from where, and then associate that with the contrail. So, back when the AIM-9P5 was on the server on Caucasus, I used to fly up in cons. What's this song? Uh, exclamation mark song. It's by Paramore. I think it's called Into You. Yeah, still Into You. Um, so, I would use that at high altitude in the F5. I'd be up in cons, and I'd be baiting people. MiG-21s would come up into cons to fight me, and I'd call out with overlords. So I'd go, okay, that con's a MiG-21, that one's an F5, that one's another MiG-21. And I would use that to figure out the distance to me, what they were doing respective to me if I couldn't see it from, like, if, if the contrail was at my altitude so I couldn't see which way it was curving. And I would BVR them with AIM-9 P5s because the uh, Seeker is that sensitive on it. Just by using Overlord. No IFF? No problem. Just use Overlord. I know that there's an enemy approaching from that exact bearing at that exact altitude and he's about that distance away. And there's, you know, there's no other contrails around him that might be a friendly. You, it, okay, so think of it this way. In things like the Hornet, you have sensor fusion, multi-sensor in integration, things like that. You have that on Enigma server and many other servers 
as well. It's just that you are the sensor. You're the one that's combining the information. So, for example, when I'm flying the MiG-21, I'm using my radar to figure out where things are and whether they're friendly or enemy. I'm using Overlord and or the in-game GCI to figure out where things are and what their closure rates are and all of this. Um, I'm using my RWR, as shitty as it is, and everyone rags on the SPO-10 for being a useless lights generator. It's not. It will tell you, excuse me, it will tell you some things. Now, it's definitely not the best, but using the SPO-10 in conjunction with Overlord, I can figure out what's looking at me. If I'm getting a strong signal, which is the three beeps in rapid succession, and the closest thing to me is called out as being, you know, 100 kilometers away, the only thing that can be is an F-14. I know now that that's a Tomcat. I know where he is. I know what he's doing. I know he's looking at me. You see where I'm going with this? You, you combine the information you get from each sensor, and on its own, it might be the shittiest sensor on Earth. It might tell you almost nothing. You know, it might tell you that water's wet, but in combination with one or two other sensors and a little bit of intuition, you can start putting together an image in your mind of what's going on. And I say this as someone with pretty bad situational awareness, especially like um, object permanence. I always forget, oh, there was another plane there. Right. I forgot because I was distracted. Um, but combining that stuff together is the basis of situational awareness. And then you build up your ability to, to kind of construct that 3D image in your head, which is where I'm starting to kind of try and, and build some headway. That's what I have trouble with, is actually remembering where things are and then where they are relative to each other. But for example, I can I can combine information from two or three different sensors in the MiG-21 and the MiG-29 to figure out what I'm looking at, what it's probably doing, and what my best course of action is against it. And then you can, you know, you can maneuver to kind of act as a filter. So you aren't sure if somebody's looking at you or a guy near you. So you maneuver and you see if they follow that maneuver or if they ignore it. You see what happens. So an example of this, and I think I've got a highlight of this up on my channel somewhere, but I'm, I'm not going to go looking for it now. It'll take too long to find. Um, it was on Alpen server. It was on the... Um, the uh when the mountains cry mission the one with the lakes that you had to destroy the targets around and capture it was on that mission i had literally just taken off from kataisi and i started getting hard locked by something so i put in a awax call and i was told the nearest contact was over 100 kilometers away and it was in the direction of sochi or not sochi sorry um tbilisi other direction so i was like okay well that's an F-14, that's the only thing that can lock me at that distance, especially on that server. He's just taken off from Tbilisi, and he's barreling straight towards our main base. He's probably not very intelligent. Because if he had a brain, he'd go to the objective, not straight to our main base, and he'd, like, find a better way to do it, and he would not hard lock a MiG-21 at 100 kilometers. So, by doing that, I now know there is a Tomcat, I know exactly where he is relative to me, and I know what his intent is. He wants to come over and fuck me up. So now I have just enough information that I can start to formulate a plan. I know that I'm over the middle of the valley at the moment, but I know that there's mountains on either side of me. I know that the Tomcat's radar is not that great in look down, especially with Jester. Um, a, hum a good human Rio can do some insane shit, but like Jester will lose targets against the ground all the time, especially in mountains. So I figured, okay, well, I know what to do now. So I flew towards him a bit to kind of give him the, you know, to make sure the hook was baited sufficiently. Um, and he was still hard walking me. And then I turned 90 degrees and I could tell when he was no longer able to see me because I watched the lights on the SPO-10 migrate from the two in front of me to one at my, you know, kind of at my 10 o'clock to the two um, to my left. And then they both winked out and I heard no more beeping from it. So, okay, he's just lost me. He doesn't see me anymore. He's lost lock, and his radar's not picking me up. So, still doing that. So, I just notched him. Still doing that, and I was very low to the ground at this point to help, um, you know, stay in the notch. Um, as overstated as notching is by DCS players, this is one situation where it does actually make sense and does actually work. I found a valley entrance and I flew into it and I just crawled around the valleys for a bit. Now I knew that was risky behavior if he saw me or if there was somebody else at high altitude that sees me. Um, valley crawling is not a good idea nine times out of ten. You have very few maneuvering options, you're very slow. Um, someone who's high and fast will shit on a valley crawler if they can see them. 
The main key is if they can see them. If you're high enough, you can simply look over the valleys. So you don't need to worry about it. But this guy, working with a janky radar, working with Jester, and probably not really knowing what he was doing, he couldn't do that. He was too low to look over the valleys, but high enough that he was contrailing. And so I just flew towards him, following the valleys, until I was about 20 kilometers from him, and then I just pitched up into a steep climb, popped out directly underneath his belly. I'm outside of his radar scan volume. No matter how much he pitches his radar down, he can't see me. I'm, I'm like, under his belly at this point. I'm too close. So uh, I just pitched up under him and giraffed him. Hit him with a pair of R3Rs from directly beneath. He had no idea. He didn't even have time to maneuver. And that was all because he was, you know, he had the grand idea that he would take off from their main airbase and hardlock the first thing he saw, which happened to be me taking off from our main airbase. That gave me just enough information to know what was going on and what to do about it. And that's the difference between people who are good at DCS and, like, I, I don't claim to be that good at DCS, but I will say I'm probably better than a lot of people that play it, just because most people that play DCS don't take the time to learn, or they, for whatever reason, they get this idea in their head that they can't improve or they can't learn, like, oh, I'll never be any better. Yeah, you will. You just need the attitude. You just need to want it. Um, but that's the difference, is, you know... The guy who says, oh, my plane just blew up for no reason. Oh, that's bullshit. This is overpowered. That's overpowered. Versus the guy who looks at it and goes, okay, well, I, I alerted him to the fact that I was going for him. You know, it's one thing to have your radar on. DCS players are paranoid that, oh, if I turn my radar on, everyone will see me. Yes and no. Um, they will see that your radar's there. And some, depending on what kind of RWR they have, they might know roughly which direction you're in and what kind of aircraft you are. A MiG-21 knows that there is a radar somewhere over here. That's the limit of its knowledge. That's all it knows. It doesn't know what kind of radar. It could be a SAM, it could be a fighter, it could be a fucking weather radar. It has no idea. Um, it could be a, a precision approach radar at the runway. Like, it, it has no idea. It just knows that there's a radar over there. Is it looking at me or not? That's all a MiG-21 knows. So people have this neurosis about turning on their radar, especially in the F-5 for some reason. That's not what you should have a neurosis about. What you should what you should do is you should have your radar on. You know, if you're doing air to air, your radar should always be on, because people use the analogy of walking into a dark room and turning on a flashlight. Everyone can see you. No, they can't. They can see a flashlight. They can't see you. In fact, they might not even see you that well because they've just been blinded by your fucking flashlight. You walk into a dark room, turn on a flashlight. You can see everyone in that room with you. And all they can see is roughly where you are. They know you're there with you, like they, they know that you're in the room with them, but they can't see you, they can only see a flashlight. But you can see all of them, you can see their faces, you can tell what they're doing, like, you can tell the distance between you and them. This is the thing, your radar should always be on for air to air, always. And that's how it is in the real world, like, maybe not so much now with Link 16 and and all this networked battlefield stuff, but back in the, the Cold War and even the 90s and early 2000s, this is how it was. If you were an air-to-air -air sortie, your radar was on, pretty much from the moment you fucking took off. If nothing else, then for collision avoidance in busy airspace, right? Um, so yeah, like, they have this neurosis that, oh, I can't turn my radar on, people see me. That's the wrong thing to be worried about. The thing to be worried about is, did I just lock somebody and show my hand? Nobody's going to pay much attention to a radar in search mode, really. Even I don't. If somebody's just pinging me with a search mode radar, I'm like, okay, well, there's something over there, whatever. That's as far as I think about it. If somebody hard locks me and holds it especially, then I go, okay, well, he wants me. And then I can start planning, right, well, this is where he is. This is probably what aircraft he's in. This is what he's doing. So it's not so much don't turn your radar on. It's don't lock people needlessly is the, uh, is the takeaway to make there. You lock someone as late as you can get away with, uh, without risking them, you know, falling off your scope or, or something like that. And even then, you watch footage of, uh, like, um, US Air Combat exercises in the 80s and 90s. You'll see these guys locking from pretty far out. Because they're either not confident enough in their radar, or they're worried that they'll lose the lock or something like that. Successfully blue-pilled Ross at the air show. I've always been blue-pilled, dude. I appreciate blue and red aircraft. I always have. The The thing that breaks my heart with the blue force stuff in DCS, other than the fact we don't have any from the period I'm in, well, not much from the period I'm interested in, 
is that people just misuse it. They don't understand why it is designed the way it's designed, and so they don't use it correctly. Like, as I was saying, like a lot of the guys who are really good on the Cold War servers with blue airframes are, are guys that fly red stuff mostly, or at least like about half the time they fly half and half. Because they, they're they interested in the aircraft, they want to learn about the aircraft, they want to understand what makes the aircraft tick. Versus people that just want to have the best plane that shits on everyone else, you know? Which is no way to go about things. If you come into DCS thinking that you're going to be the number one pro fucking um, professional gaming esports league DCS BVR champion or dogfight champion or whatever, you're not going to come away from it learning much. You got to come into it with an interest in aircraft, and this is a thing. Like, it's and I know there's people in my community that would probably like this, and I don't want to call anyone out. I don't want people to feel like they're being called out here. It's just to me, it's curious, um, and to me, it used to apply as well. People who will go, "Oh, I want to play DCS, or I want to play, you know, um, even War Thunder or whatever. I don't want to play IL Two. They play combat flight simulators, but as soon as you show them something like Misfits, they're like, "Why the fuck would I want to play that?" It's like, do you not just enjoy aviation? Well, only if I get to shoot someone down. And I used to be like that as a kid, but I kind of grew out of it. I just, I learned to enjoy aviation for what it is, aviation, and the shooting down people is a bonus, you know? I kind of feel like it might partly be a, a dividing line between people who are interested in aircraft and people who have actually flown an aircraft. Because once you've actually flown, like once you've done it yourself and you've been the one behind the controls, um, it kind of opens your eyes a lot, in my opinion. That was kind of what made me start caring more about civilian aviation. Like, uh, you know, I, I used to call myself a GA racist because I couldn't tell a Beechcraft from a Cessna from a fucking Mooney, and now I can. Mostly. You know, they, they all used to look the same to me, and now I can tell the differences. And I can tell, like, oh, well, you know, Mooney's thing is they tend to try and make pretty fast, luxurious aircraft, or, you know, um, they all have certain design styles and certain design goals behind them, which you uh, you start to pick up. Okay, I've sat here yapping for entirely too long. I'm gonna have a really quick drink, and we're getting it back into DCS. Um, externally, no. Is it just whether it has passenger window? Like, is the MD-11 just a cargo DC? It's a, it's a different design, isn't it? Like, it's slightly different, but broadly looks similar? I don't know. Longer and has winglets. Yeah, I wonder if... Length is usually what does it. Like all the different 737 variants, and the only difference is really the length of them. You know, the modern ones, that is, the next gens. Or like a CRJ fucking whatever 100 versus a CRJ 1000. It's literally just the length is the only real difference. I miss DC-10s, man. I know they had a shitty reputation with the fucking public, but the public don't know shit. The DC-10 was a fucking great plane. And most of the accidents that made it infamous were not even its fault. I'm very glad that, like, as shitty as the world is at the moment, as much as I regret living through historic events, um, boy, you got to be careful what you wish for, I tell you what. But, as shitty as stuff gets sometimes, I'm glad that I, I was able to, like, as a child at least, fly on the last of the Trijets in commercial service. Well, the last of the Western Trijets, the uh, 2154 stayed on for quite a while longer. 
I got to fly 747s constantly. I've been on so many 747s. Um, but yeah, things like DC-10s. Um, I don't know if I ever flew on a TriStar. I'm not sure. But all, all things like that. All the cool old jets of like six, like late 60s, early 70s, early 80s vintage that you just don't see flying anymore. Sometimes not even cargo. Um, I'm really glad I got to fly on those. I miss them. It's kind of sad seeing everything turn into... Just like with military aircraft, just like with tanks and IFVs, everything's turning into grey goo. All modern airliners look the same to me. All modern tanks look the same to me. All modern IFVs look the same to me. They're just big metal boxes painted coyote brown. Seven five, I'm not sure. I think so though. Like this is the thing. I did most of my flying on airliners as a kid, so like most of my flights had been um, before the age of ten. So I don't remember every model of airliner I've been on. But if it was in common service in the nineties, uh, then yeah, I've probably flown on one. Particularly for like international or medium haul flights. Um, I think. I want to say Air Canada or Canadian, one of the two. I don't think Canadian even exists anymore. Um, but I think they used to operate, one or the other or both used to operate 7.5s domestically. And I think maybe transatlantic route as well. So I think I've flown on one. The list of things I haven't flown on that were in service in the 90s is probably a lot shorter than the list of stuff that I have. And like I said, I've been on more 747s than I can poke a stick at. Like, I'm I'm very, uh, very familiar with the 747. Spent fucking half my childhood on them. They had 7.6s? Yeah, okay. Well, I'm... I don't know, I'd have to like go digging, I guess, and see if we've got any records of what we did for him, but I think I've done a 7.5. If it wasn't in Canada, it probably would have been in Europe or something. Because that's the thing, like, I I did so much flying as a kid, not just around Canada, but around Europe, like, on the route from Europe down to Australia, which was often, you know, usually you get a 7.4 or something, but sometimes you get something smaller doing the shorter hops. Um, you'd have to change flights, so... I've done a lot. And then my last two flights, the flight to and from Melbourne, was uh, A320 of some variety. I think one of the older ones. Which is kind of eh. Airbuses are kind of boring to me. And also the, the view out the windows is kind of shit. Because Boeing are smart enough to place their windows higher.
I can tell you one airliner that was in service in the 90s I didn't fly on, which is Concorde. I'd been on one while it was on static display at Doxford, like two or three times. Uh, it used to fly over my house every, pretty much every evening. Um, we used to live under the flight path from Heathrow, like on the way out to the US. So um, the London to New York service would fly over our place about 7.30 in the evening. And I used to run out into the backyard to watch it go over. The other thing I'm glad is that um, most of the airliners I have flown on, except the more modern variants or the more recently designed ones, I've been in the flight deck of, if not on the ground, then while in flight. Because that was a thing that they used to, used to do back in my day, um, and something which I sorely miss. I get why they don't do it anymore. Some smaller airlines apparently do, where they can get away with it, but... You know, someone had to ruin the fun for, for most of us, so the cockpit stays locked during flight now. But, like, if you were a kid on pretty much any airline in the 90s and you were obviously well-behaved and interested in aviation, the flight, like, one of the, um, one of the flight stewards would come up to you and be like, hey, do you want to go talk to the pilots? And you, you go up and you sit in the cockpit in the jump seat and talk to the air crew and they'd show you what all the buttons did and everything. It was fucking awesome, man. Get on the funny dog costume. Find a way to hook into the fucking FMS chat they have and start fucking role-playing with them to butter them up. I have to outsource it, man. I don't I don't know the lingo. You can be my script writer. Do you like gladiator movies? One question I hope wasn't asked of you. I don't remember that one being asked of me. But also, like, the last time I was up the flight deck of something would have been probably, like, when I was about 10 or so. 9 or 10. So it was a while ago. Yeah, you can still do it through connections. And like I said, I think there's some small regional airlines and stuff that let you get away with it, particularly in less regulated countries. Um, my... He's not like a blood uncle, but one of my mom's best friends. He was the chief captain for Cathay Pacific for a very long time. I wish that I'd found a way to pester mum and dad to fly out to Hong Kong to visit him. Because I would have loved to land into Kai Tak up in the jump seat in the cockpit. That would have been the best experience for like a fucking 10 year old that was into aviation. All right. We've procrastinated long enough. Um, I'm just going to dip back to the lobby and see if Ligmas has any spaces, because I don't know if I'm confident enough in my BVR abilities after such a long break to uh, do the Mirage, but we'll see. If there's spots in Ligmas, we might hop on there, um, do some F1 or something, which I'm also not confident at, but fuck it. Um, and if there's not, then we'll hang out on Tempest, I think, and do some Mirage 2000. It's a Mirage kind of day, I guess. Hello, we have returned. Finally. <laughs> I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say that. I've just generally felt guilty about not flying it very much lately. Holy shit, Ligmas is fucking packed still, yo. Let's go to Tempests. Um, I spent so long talking, the server's about ready for another reset, Jesus. But um, yeah, no, that, that did improve my uh, opinion of it somewhat, at least for VR, but... No, it's it's more a case of I just want to fly it more so I can get a feel of what to do in it. I still don't consider it, except in specific players' hands with, you know, low fuel loading, I still don't consider it a massive threat if I'm in a 21 or an F5, but I want to learn to at least not suck in it. Like, a lot of the time when I've been flying the F1, if I get into a merge with anything, I die, unless I get extremely lucky or they're, like, completely brain dead, so... I want to work on that. I want to at least have a chance of not dying. That would be a start. I think this... that This is the Persian Gulf mission on Tempest. I think this one has um, active radar homing missiles, so we are no doubt going to eat shit many times. Because I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing anymore. But we'll see how we go. 
if there's frame rate issues, like if the stream looks like shit, or it starts dropping frames, or shit's stuttering, or oh my god, what is this fucking flickering? There we go. If the stream starts doing unpleasant things, let me know in chat, because I cannot see the preview window. I can only see what you guys tell me. My chat's in the way of the preview window. Uh, so I have to see if I can remember how to start this thing. I have to see if I can remember how to set up the INS. I have to make sure I don't start it into a fucking tailwind and blow my engine up. There's plenty of fun things to go on here with the Mirage 2000. Okay, um... 30mm AP. I'll go with the tracers. I usually like having the tracers on the 2000. Like, I'm not worried about my stealth. I just want to have, um... The ability to correct fire by eye if needed. Especially because I'm very much a snapshot kind of person. Let's go with a Claire. We don't really need a parachute, honestly, with these runways. If I do, then I fuck something up really badly. And I do need the extra countermeasures. Okay. Battery. Uh... Uh, uh, uh. Whoops, I keep bumping that. Our starting weight's not going to change until we get our actual load out, so we'll fix that later. What I'll do is um, leave that on normal for now. I think I need the engine spooled up for that. Okay, there's rearming complete. 3165, 4155 is total. So we'll go 40. Oh, that's the wrong direction. 4155. We'll just call it 4140 because I'd rather be under than over. We're going to set our bingo to. Uh, we'll leave it at 28. Actually. No, we'll set it at 800. Fuck it. Okay, that's set. Pump. I think that I need all of those open. That's my starter. Wait for about 11, 12 percent. Move the throttle out of the gate. There we go. Watch the. Turbine temp. Looks good. Exactly like the F1 just rearranged. I know. But I also haven't flown the F1 for a very long time, so... And I haven't... I've flown the EE, but only hot started. I haven't flown it with the, uh... With the INS setup. Well, like, I haven't had to set up the INS myself. I think that goes to... Is that the middle position and the up position? I think it's the middle position for that. Up position, standby. Uh, we probably don't want the jammer on auto, to be honest. We'd want it on semi-auto. So we'll... I think T is the one we want? I don't fucking know. T or Y, whatever that says. Uh, M is, uh, Marsh. Marche, I forget. Which is run. A is Are, which is stop. Okay. Mode... Section or sect, whatever that is. We don't want it on full because full. I don't think it makes any difference in the sim, but full is like. You don't usually use it. We'll leave that on that setting. I think that's. I don't think I need to change that. Yeah, mode 4. There we go. 3, 2, 3, 3, 3, 4. Yeah, so that's. Mode 4 is all we need. We're not talking to civvy traffic. Uh, let's put a card in it, even though it won't do anything. We'll just go 0303. Give him the old rule 303. Okay, now we go align. There we go. So our start position, we want to go waypoint 0. So we're on longitude, latitude. Uh, <laughs> destination 0, I think it is. No. Okay, no more. Or is it zero one? I don't remember. I honestly forget how to do this. 
Zero, zero should be... Is it the initial alignment or is zero, one the initial alignment? Does anyone remember off the top of their head? While we're waiting for that, let's... Well, while I wait for you guys to tell me the answer because I'm dumb, we'll turn this on. That's a standby. I think... No, wait, that, that is the compass. So we want that on. So the HUD's on. Just nothing's showing yet because we, uh, you know, haven't set anything up. Right, fuck it. I think it's zero one. Fuck my life. Prep and dest. Man, I do not remember. Fuck it. Prep zero zero. And then uh, we want to go. 27, so, no, okay, it is this, I think, zero, one, oh, right, okay, validate, and then we go, no, zero, one is the answer, okay, zero, one, I've already fucked this up, I'm sure, how do I input this? Or do I go prep zero one? Let's try prep zero one. Aha! Yes! Ha ha! I'm a genius, not really. 2714. North. 2714. 150. We'll round it down to one. And then east. Zero, five, six, gotta remember the zero. Two, three, uh, we'll call it two. There we go, and then validate. Um, altitude, fuck me, I forgot that. Uh, altitude is positive, and that's... Is that the metric side, or is that the imperial side? Fuck, I can't remember. It's positive. I think that's the metric side. So, 9 meters is what, about 30 feet? Yep, 9 meters, 30 feet. There we go, perfect. Done. Now, I need to... I think I validated that right. We go... Status, 84, 83, okay, and then once that ticks down, we go to nav. I remember now, sort of. Now, what's the TACAN here? Because I'm pretty sure there's a TACAN. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, hang on. Does it show TACAN on this sectional? I don't think it does. Mm, interesting, the sliders didn't show what it should show, but whatever. There's no TAF on this server. I guess uh, people cried really hard about it. <laughs> Allegedly, I mean, I think it used to see through mountains. I don't know if it does anymore, but it's, it's funny to me that people must have cried about it hard enough to get it removed. Um... We're going to leave that window open because I need to reference it to remember what the RWR symbology is. Okay. So that's all good. We want this display on. It's probably not going to show anything until we turn the radar on. Just out of habit, I'm going to come down here and one, three. Again, this doesn't actually do anything in game as far as I'm aware. I just like... Ooh. Turn everything on. Can't rotate those. Okay. Um, we don't really need to worry about lights, so we're just going to leave them off. We're going to leave that in auto. We're going to... 
randomize this because I don't trust my teammates to not be using the same fucking radar frequency as me. I also don't remember my ho my uh, hotas binds for this, by the way. So this is going to be a fun adventure. Uh, we want charge because we or charge, sorry, because we've got um, the belly tank on. Pressure cabin that's going to stay there till we close the lid. Um, we want to actually let's partially close the lid now. It's one of the coolest features of this. Oh, because I forgot to take it out of its lock position. Whoop, come down. Come on. Down you go. Is it going to lock? You going to lock? There you go. Um, I think... That might sort itself out once the gyro is done aligning. We'll have to double check it because I forget how it works. That we don't touch. This we put on. Now there's one of the tests it'll fail. I think it might be this one. It fails this test initially. You've got to wipe the controls a bit. And it should pass. There we go. Cool Mirage thing, by the way. You can see the controls indicator there. And you can see it's doing its test pattern. My hands are off the stick. The aircraft's doing that by itself. It's a bit, bit system. Um, we'll go ahead and arm our gun, just so I don't forget once I'm in the air. Our radios, we'll turn this on, we'll turn this one on as well, I have no idea what frequency that's set to, we'll work it out in a minute. Don't need to worry about any of that stuff. Radar, um, we'll just run through to emit and it, the ground safety should keep it off. That test is passed. Okay. We're now aligned with reasonable confidence. I'm going to let it run out a little more. Just to... Not because I care about having a particularly fine alignment. Just more because I need to try and remember how the fuck to set the jet up. Okay, maybe that needs to be full thought. No. How do I work this? I think it's like you have to pull it out and then twisted or something. I forget. It's probably because it's still aligning. I probably just broke something. Alright, we'll call that alignment good enough. So we're gonna go nav. Now are you gonna do the thing? There's a specific way to get this to behave itself, and I always... Oh, you know what it is? I think you... Nope. Nope. There's a specific way to set this up, and I always fucking forget how to do it. It's been so long since I've flown this thing. Maybe it does need to be fully forwards. And then, like, you do this, and you do this. I don't fucking know, dude. Whatever. Um, I think that's set up correctly. I think. I hope. Why is that blinking at me? That's concerning. I'm worried. It's probably because the standby's on. Effect on yeah, the Fresnel lens. The um, center MFD on the Hornet should do that too. Also, if we had a Mirage 2000-5 or a Rafale, the screen in the base of the HUD would do that. Um, I'm actually curious. I can't do it now because it's broad daylight. But I'm curious if that shows focus through night vision because it should. The whole point of the Fresnel lens is that this you don't need to refocus your eyes between outside, you know, focused outside, focus to infinity. Same with night vision. Night vision goggles blur out the cockpit because they're focused to infinity, and this is obviously a lot closer than infinity. Um, but this being on a Fresnel lens should appear clear through it. We turn that off status mode. I still don't like that that's doing that. I've probably fucked something up. Um, what else am I missing? That's set to the correct mode, I think. 
We've got the radar altimeter on. We'll test it. I don't know if that's... Oh, no. Okay, that does do something. Um, I usually turn that back upside on and I move it up to bore sight and use it as like a standby gun cross for when I'm gun fighting, but we'll turn it off for now because it clutters the hub. Um, frequencies. One two five and one two six. One two five and one two six. Let me check what. Yeah, we're not on either of those, so we'll set that manually. And we'll see if I get a reply from that. If not, we'll try 126. Nope. The um, Fresnel effect on the radar screen was a relatively recent addition. The Mirage has seen a lot of good stuff. Okay. Let me just double check something. I'm on 126. Why is it not transmitting through that? Weird. Oh, you know why? Because I'm using the wrong transmit key. I need to figure out... Mm, left shift. No. No. I don't know. Uh, I have done the fucky wucky. Okay, well, let's try different channels on the second radio. Or the first radio, really. 126. No, that's not that one. So it's not preset on there. Annoying. I seem to recall there was some important setup step that I forgot how it works on the um, on the two thousand. Because I can't select either radio manually through SRS. Maybe I'll have to update it or something. Well, I guess we're flying blind, kids, because we got no TAF either. We'll work it out in the air, maybe. Okay. And I still haven't figured out what's going on here. Why is this still caged? There's... There's some secret to this, which I have completely forgotten how it works. I think you're meant to pull it out and then move it, but it's still not... Oh, I'm hearing something over the radio, it's just not replying to me. A test for something? No, oh, hydraulic system. Um, there's something I'm missing. There has to be something I'm missing. I've broken my jet. Happens if you double click it, it just pulls the thing out twice, it doesn't really do anything. 
whatever. We've got a mostly working jet. We've got an okay alignment as far as I can tell. Turn the radio volume up. Uh, does it need to turn on standby? Yeah, there's a power switch here which turns it on. I just forget if it needs to be fully forward or halfway. I think it's halfway, I don't know. There's probably a switch I'm forgetting, yeah. It's been so long since I've flown it. See, this one's working, it's just the, um, the artificial horizon. Standby artificial horizon's not. And I also don't know why my autopilot's blinking at me, but I don't like it. I don't like the fact it's blinking at me. Oh, I should have had my parking brake on for the alignment, probably. Whatever. I had chocks on. Should be functionally the same, right? It moves at idle now. Just, just slightly, but it will move at idle. We'll get our nozzle steering on. Does need a little bit of throttle to get rolling properly. Runway 3, huh? Except everyone's taking off the other direction. Yeah, I'm going to do an about turn here, and I'm going to take off from the, un the uh, end that everyone else is taking off from, because I don't want to collect somebody. So we'll just do that. Been burning through a lot of fuel sitting on the ground here, but oh well. That's why we brought the tank. Let me see if I can remember. Okay, this is my scan bars. That's one bar, I think. That should be. F Wait. Yeah, that's one bar. I think that's two or four. and we'll figure out what that does when I get off the ground. Next, PSM. PSM, 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 PSM. That's PCA. I think PSM is, like, over here somewhere. Well, the only thing I think of is that. Or, you know, PSM might be that. I don't know. But, yeah, that that's switched into the center position. I remember last time I flew this after a long break, it took me a while to figure that out, but I did eventually do it. I'm just, I don't know what's up with me today, I can't do it apparently. I seem to recall it involved pulling it and then pressing something, or pulling it and twisting it somewhere, but it, it just isn't doing it today. Hang on, what if... Oh, I was at the end of the runway, I think. Or, hang on. Yeah, I was at the end of the runway. I always forget this airfield's got a weird layout. Please don't go in the grass. So yeah, I can just turn across here and I should be right at the head of the runway. Uh, while we're taxiing, we will... Whoop, didn't mean to do that. While we're taxiing, we'll do this. Close that, pressurize. 
So you push it forwards once to lock it and then that folds up to pressurize it. Make sure you fold it up. Um, we haven't got any warning lamps on except the autopilot stuff, so I'm, I'm assuming we're mostly okay. We'll find out soon enough. How's the stream looking? Is it smooth? Because I'm noticing I'm getting kind of, like, not bad frames, but they're not as high as they probably ought to be. Oh, this is still, um, frontline sectors. This isn't Hex yet. Yeah, so that, where those tomcats spawn, that's the taxiway that goes across the top of the two runways, I think. People are taking off from the fucking taxiway anyway, of course, so... Oh wait! No, I'm dumb, that is a runway. Yeah, I remember this airfield now, that is a runway. I'm used to spawning on that apron over there, because that's where uh, Alpen always puts the spawns, but no, we're at the uh, QRA spawns in here, I think. Just make sure I'm not going to get run over. Make sure no one's going to land on top of my head. Get ourselves lined up. There is somebody in front of me. Turn off the nose wheel steering. It's an F-14, I think. Actually, no, I think it's a Hornet. Can't quite tell from this angle. Well, he's got his burners lit, so we should be able to get away with it too. Oh wait, it wouldn't be a Hornet, because I'm red. It's probably a flanker, and I think I just lost my left tire, so it's a little slow to rotate. Shonky, shonky flying today. It's a contact there, but it's maybe friendly. It's closing with us. Okay. We're going to kind of side climb here. I don't want to fly straight into people. I want to get some speed and altitude. So we're going to head east, climb, and then turn back in. Ligmas? No, I'm on uh, Tempest. Ligmas is full. I'm trying to remember how to fly the Mirage 2000. Not very successfully. I think I need to... Mm, it's not a big deal. I was going to say I need to move my detent slightly for the afterburner because it's a little too far forwards, but it'll do. Like I'm pushing 103% with my throttle in the mill detent, like the physical mill detent. It's probably not what it should be doing. Okay. Are they going to talk to me now? No. Oh, yep. Excellent. 148 for 280 kilometers. It's a fair ways. I wonder if the other channels are Imperial callouts, maybe. That might be how it's set up, I'm not sure. And my radar's pointing into fucking space. No wonder I can't see things with it. Okay. 
Don't remember what that does. That's my 4 bar, 2 bar. We'll go 4 bar but narrow sector. And then I've got to remember what my PRF is. It ain't that. I think it's on my... Not that. Oop, oop, that's not... Okay, so that's my PCA. Don't know... Oh, that's... Right, close combat modes. That's my countermeasures. Oh, that's probably... That might be unlock. I think that's what it is. There's no better time to relearn what your binds are on an aircraft than when you're actually going into a fucking BVR fight. Let me double check. But Axis. That's PRF. Okay, so yeah, that's that's what that is. And the radar is on emit. HFR. It's just showing it. Oh, because it won't go to the other modes unless I reduce the range. There we go. Interleaved. And then if I reduce it further, it'll go BFR. Okay. I see how it works. I remember now. The Mirage restricts your radar mode based on range. Uh, this is Red 4. Red 4 were outnumbered. And the Mirage 2000 is on Red 4 in here, so I figured I'd fly it. Because I always love a good excuse to fly this thing, even if I'm terrible at it these days. To get some lights happening in here too, it's a little dark. Yee, there we go. That's a good ship. 143. For two really interesting heading for him to be coming from. 7,000, so he's slightly below. It would be an F-14 calling himself Big Daddy and transmitting traffic comms over the combat frequency. Okay, the belly tank's nearly empty. We'll get ready to punch that off in a sec. If I can get a single kill, I'll be happy, honestly. One four five for two hundred. It's probably AI or something, but we'll see what it is. Okay, we're now on internal. There goes the belly tank. That's an actual contact, but it'll probably be friendly. Yeah, or maybe not. Hang on. My radar's pointing in a very bizarre place. It's probably... Figure this out. Gotta remember what my radar drop lock button is. It's not that. It's decoy, decoy panic. It's TT, TWS. Drop lock used to be this, which it's not anymore. Okay, that's it.
Watch me get giraffed by somebody. That looks a bit suspicious. Maybe. Maybe not. One five two for one fifty. So seven thousand. So he should be popping up on my radar scope kind of soonish, but I'm still getting. I don't know if that's false contacts off the ground or what. We are heading towards an enemy airbase though, so that kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies that there's somebody down there maybe. Problem is, because I've got my fucking radar ranged out so much. I think you do actually have to manually wind the radar down to see stuff that's like as you change scale. I forget. I seem to recall there was something done about the radar that was like really painful, but that's how the real radar is set up. I don't want to actually fly down to the airbase. That would be a great way to a great way to die to a SAM, but we've got naval radar in front of us. Actual airbase is further over. Yeah, there we go. I feel like I'm getting like some weird reading on my radar here for altitude. Like looking at the relative position of the antenna versus what altitude it's telling me. Unless it adds the third digit as like a more finite, this is your altitude band in a, you know, to three digits. Which seems actually kind of likely. Hello. Or it's desyncing or something. I don't know. Something about this doesn't quite seem right. Hello. Oh, I got a fighter right under me. I think. This is this is fine. Now I've got to remember how to IFF. Should be on. It's telling me to go single target track. He's 35 miles out. We'll s oh, yep, there it is. <laughs> Aim 9L. This fucking magpie got me. So yeah, I don't remember how to fly this thing at all, apparently. I like the sounds for its alerts too. Yeah, I have no idea what I'm doing in this jet anymore. Um, okay. Battery. Um, let's just bring this down and... Lock it. We might try one more, uh, one more sortie on here. I'll try not to overfly a fucking airbase, and then uh, we'll call it for DCS for the day. And I'll spend some time off stream trying to remember how to use this jet. It's probably not very interesting watching me get shot down constantly. I'd imagine. Um. Magic Eclair, yep. 30 mil AP traces, okay. Copy. Oops, that needs to stay there. This goes up, that gets started. Situational awareness is indeed a fuck.
Shut up, gun. Silence. Rearming complete. Let's pull the parking brake up even though we got the chocks on. Okay. Okay, and then uh if we get too carried away we'll set this to 4140. Because we would have already burnt some fuel starting up. Ah oh, fuck it, that'll do. Yeah, I know. It's not happy about config. Okay, so, 27, 14, 1, east, oh whoops, uh, validate, east, 0, east, 0, Five six two three uh, two enter that and then altitude is uh, thirty feet nine meters about eight put it in status so we can see the countdown. don't even think those do anything. I know the code doesn't, but I don't think those do either. Um, okay, HUD's on. Oh, we got a test mode. Is it going to do something, or is it just show text? I guess it just shows text. Arm the gun. Get the radar warmed up. We will... Change your code on that just in case. We'll um, move the flight controls a bit. good it's still doing that blinking at me so I do wonder if I fuck something up we'll put that all the way forwards and see if that helps so uh, this should move the flight controls so that's the hydraulic part I think the left one's the hydraulic part of the flight control system the right one I think is the electrical part of the uh, flight control system I think that's how it works it's been a while since I bothered skimming the manual, so I'm probably wrong. There we go, we got a green on that. That's still blinking at me. I wonder... Oh! Oh! Okay, so I just had to click something and it clears it. Um, because it probably auto trims the aircraft, right? Um, should be warmed up enough. We'll switch it over to emit. It'll stay silent till we're off the ground. Now comes the moment of truth. If I pull this down to here and release it, no, that doesn't do it. I don't know, Chief. I fucked something up. I fucked something up with that.
you're probably not meant to move it until the actual thing's done aligning. to six. This time, instead of going southeast and ending up over enemy territory like we did last time, we might hang out, we'll, we'll head like almost directly east and then hang out over here. I'm not expecting things to go any better for me doing that, but you know, we'll try it. Set it to four bar again, even though it slows it down. We got it like relatively narrow sector, and I can go two if I have to. Okay, alignment's good. Unlock this now before we taxi. Park brake we'll get rid of. Oh, uh, I probably should have told them to remove the wheel chocks beforehand. Chief, remove the wheel chocks. What do we got in here? What's the EW system? Oh, EWR. Wheel chocks are now removed. There we go, we got friendlies. One nine six. So yeah, they're all pretty much south, and they're medium altitude. They're not that high. That means it's up to old, mate. Kind of curious that's not working. I wonder if it's disabled or something. take off from this one. Take off from here and head straight east and we'll get some altitude right away. So I've got to figure out, like my radar mech has never been particularly good with this thing or with anything really, but figure out what's happening when I bring the radar antenna in. It's going to three digits, so I, either it's pointing at space because I fucked something up, or it's just giving me a third, um, third digit of precision, which I kind of doubt. I think the radar just doesn't like being pointed at something that close to itself. That's why they have close combat modes, I guess, right? Make sure the nose while steering's off. Come on, uppies. Ideally without breaking the plane. Uppies. It feels kinda, there we go, now it wants to climb. Got a jammer off the nose, which doesn't surprise me. We're pointed right at the enemy base. Oh, 
backbone has definitely got a bit more oomph to it. I don't even know what frequency those guys are transmitting on, so I kind of don't want to accidentally key up on the wrong channel to tell them I hear them. Really need to set up my um, SRS bind so I can switch channels without tabbing out. That would be the smart thing to do. Which is why I haven't done it yet. Okay, we're going to bring the nose down a little. Give her about a 25... well, no, 22 degree climb, whatever that is. It's not the most energy efficient climb I could do, but whatever. Okay. Now we're going to come back on the throttle and we're going to drop the angle a bit. 15 degrees, maybe 10. Probably 10 we might be able to hold. Yeah, it's awesome, hey. The full ball. I think the Skyhawk's got something like that too from memory. Two oh five for one oh seven. Yeah, they're all to my south. Which is fine by me. They're all coming out of like Fajira and stuff. Fajira, Rasal. I don't know what I've done wrong with this fucking thing. Not a clue. Gonna want us to switch config here in a sec. Oh, I say in a second, we've got a while left, so we're burning fuel pretty slow. Very much feeling out of my depth here, <laughs> I'll tell you that much. 300, that's in metric, so 300 kilometers is about 150, oh, 170 miles. But he'll be coming from Bundari Josk, probably.
T it is, yeah. It very much is. There is a chance we'll pick stuff up at more than 100 miles, especially if it's like a Tomcat or something else large, but there's not much point leaving the radar ranged out that far, to be honest. Those little pop-ups you're seeing are false contacts because the radar's processing is uh, struggling a bit to filter out the clutter. The RDI is kind of a weird radar. It's a bit of a half measure between a truly modern radar and the old-fashioned ones. It has like some weird analog to digital shit going on, which doesn't help with the already uh, iffy processing. Two one four for ninety four. Mm. We've got F fourteen Bs to worry about in here. They're kind of scary. F sixteens are only scary if they get close to me. I don't know if there's one twenties in here. I think there's pretty sure there's Phoenixes, but I don't think there's one twenties in here. Or maybe they're like one twenty Bravos. So an asterisk is a 16, plus is a 15, dash is an 18, and then a T is a Tomcat. Triangular engine, yeah, a wankle engine. Uh, Fox 1. The world's first wankle turbine. got this thing trimmed super well. So we'll just use the autopilot until it holds level. Uh, my flash one F-18. towards Bundary Jusk, which is kind of sketchy. What's that on the ground? There's a, yeah, front line targets. I don't remember how, like, big the SAMs are here or how many there are. Like, I'm not sure if I need to be scared or not. Obviously, the airfields have got SAMs around them, but, like, I don't know what's over the front line. I'm assuming probably just IR stuff over the front line and then heavy SAMs over the air bases, but we will see. Go ahead and disconnect the autopilot. I just wanted to get leveled, so just doing it the lazy man's way. We'll use that and we'll also pair it up with this because I suspect that the in game one's got massive blind spots nearby. 172. Oh, yes, it does. It doesn't see the two that are closer to me. 230 for 88. Mm. Oh, there's the portion for that. We can go ahead and get rid of that. I'm going to turn around, I think. That's probably a false contact. Or it's just beyond the radar's capability. Yeah, false. I think. Oh, no, he's... That's something, but he's cold. Ish. Yeah, he's out cold, slowly pulling away from us. Let me see. I think you've got to be in STT to IFF stuff now. Well, properly. Because, yeah, I'm hitting the IFF interrogate and it's not doing it, so. 
Oh no, I see. The IFF interrogates tied to the fucking TDC. Yeah, those are friendlies coming up. Okay. You, on the other hand, what are you? Friendly. Now, is he friendly or is it a friendly behind him? I think it's a friendly behind. Or actually, no, they might both be friendly. What's our closest? 236 for 50. So he's off our left. That might have actually been the 16 we were looking at. He might have had a friendly chasing him. Oh, uh, you aren't friendly. That's our 16, I think. But he's out cold in a big kind of way. He's probably going to drag us into Sam's if we follow him. Or into other blue fighters. I'm doing Mark 1.04 in mill thrust, by the way. Well, maybe a bit past mill, but I'm not burning. 1.04, I'm accelerating through supersonic without the afterburner. It's pretty nice. The 21 will do that too when it's slightly loaded. I think the 29 too. I know the 23 will. But it's cool to see the Mirage doing it. He's definitely not giving us a friendly reply. But he's also definitely heading for uh, Hassab. Which has a big threat ring around it. What are you? That's probably that friendly again. Maybe? I think so. I think I see a pip over it. Mm, yep. Okay. He's probably chasing the same guy. Two two seven for forty eight point six. It's that same F sixteen. So he's probably going to turn around, and try and fight us or something. You don't look very friendly, Mister. I'm going to just switch to STT here in a sec, just to double check that is definitely hostile. Oh yeah, he ain't friendly. 530 selected. Boy, I sure hope he doesn't have 120s. Missile seekers are on and see him, we're going to fly and intercept. Then jink in at the last moment, I'm being lit up by something else. I forget what the something is shooting at you tone sounds like, but I hope we don't hear it here. This guy's probably turning to bait us. Maybe not. One more IFF, he's definitely not a friend. Watch out for Sam's as well. D, uncertain. There might be a friendly near him now. That is problematic. He's probably in a dogfight with somebody. Oh, he is. Do I dare launch? Knowing I'm getting pretty close to Kassab. Okay, that's coming back friendly. That's concerning. There's got to be two of them there. Fuck, man, I can't tell. Gonna have to do something here. D is still unsure. 
Is he dead? He looks smoky, whatever he is. Oh yeah, he's down. Alright, we're getting out of here. I don't like this. We're getting close to our VNE, so we need to climb to avoid busting that speed. Yeah, I think the radar now doesn't automatically reset its elevation. You've got to do it manually, which is uh, a pain in the ass. You can kind of see why this radar was like more geared towards interception than actual BVR fighting. I think that was a change that came relatively recently. Two hundred four for twenty one point two. He'll be behind their airbase. Flank left F fifteen C. Angel seven. Is that him? That's something. No, come on. That's something. That might be him. Okay, I don't see any shit. Come on, pick him up. Uncertain, oh come on, do not do this to me. Do not do this to me. The fuck is that? He's dead. Whatever that is, it's just outside my close combat radar range. So I can see him, but I can't acquire him. There he is. What are you? You're friendly. Allegedly. Two one seven. Sixty six miles. He's conning. We'll hang with this guy, I guess. The server's gonna restart pretty soon. Uh, our Hornet's probably one of these contacts. That's probably him. There's a couple things there. Okay, it's not returning friendly. I'm getting a bit low on fuel here. I've been a little burner happy. Yeah, no friendly return on him. I'm just worried I'm going to fly over a SAM engaging him. I probably will. I don't know what the ceiling on these SAMs is. They're probably medium to low altitude though. So we might get away with it. I'll just burn in on him, try and bag him with a 530 because the server's going to be restarting in five minutes. We might do one more sortie after this. I know I said I don't want this stream to run too late. but uh. Maybe. We'll think about it. I kind of do want to get some Gunner Heat PC in today, though. So, maybe this will be the last one or something, and then we'll do some more DCS at the end of next stream or something. I have no idea. Closure rate's pretty good. Yeah, he's going to be, like, over Ras Alheimer, which doesn't appear to have any SAMs there. Oh, do not lose connection, please. He's got something with him. One of those returns will probably be him being caught by another scan bar, but I think he's got a dude with him. We're now STT. He definitely ain't friendly. The other guy's going for him too, though. He'll probably get a... Yep, he's just launched. So we can double team this guy. There, yeah, that should uh, give him a bit bit to think about. He 
He's still up. I'm getting baited so hard, and I know it, but five minutes to go. I want to get a kill. We're, oh, we're over speeding. There we go. Is that us? No, the other guy got him. Chased him down and got him. It was a 14 that was with me. What are you? Not friendly. I'm almost certainly going to eat a Sam here though, because I'm right over a bunch of their airfields. Flying into a threat ring. Just probably scale down my radar a bit. Fuels, yeah, not looking the best. I'm about to do something very silly. Very, very silly. Oh, there's a Sam's out on me. Or are they on someone else? Hard to tell, they might be on someone else. My RWR is not making any really scary noises at me, so I don't know. He's on the runway. <clears throat> sure, why not? I don't know if those are going to track. Maybe one more sortie after the restart, then we'll do a little bit of GHPC, not too much, and then we'll um, call it for the day. Oh, there's the um, shot cone from going supersonic. That's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. I really do need to play this jet more, it's so nice. Still no 120s on Tempest? Okay, good. So it's, it's just the Tomcats on this mission, because I remember the other mission, there's no actors at all, but I thought for this one there was, which, I mean, there are, just shitty phoenixes. Uh, Bundera Bus, 2000. Hell yeah. Refuel. Uh, the red one is nice, but let's go with the full-blown anti-flash white boy. We're we're full full on interceptor mode right now, guys. Full on interceptor mode. Okay. Um, up. On. Did I... oh. Probably have to press that again. Hello? Might have missed the click spot. 
We're going to start our engine today. Rearming complete. Yeah, there we go. I don't know what I'm doing with that, man. I'm doing something wrong with it. I know that much. Okay. Let's set up our countermeasures. Semi-auto. Put that on automatic. I think that's what that is, automatic. Or, re like, reply jam or something. Because I don't want to be jamming the whole time. That's a great way to get team killed by home on jam missiles. And also to uh, advertise your position to everyone. Like, this is something DCS players don't realize. When you're jamming constantly, it just tells everyone what bearing you're on. Yeah, they don't know the range, but there's other ways to work that out. And if they just yeet a fucking home on jam at you, it, it's not going to matter anyway. They don't need to know the range. They just need to know that they're relatively close and the missile will make the difference. Uh... Plus, whoop, yeah, plus, uh, plus nine, that's not nine, that's nine, there we go, 30 feet, nine meters, so you can set it either way, and then validate, and set that to status so we can see the countdown timer on it, give the controls a bit of a wipe to warm everything up, Oh, look at all the smoke when it starts up. Holy shit. That's fucking awesome, man. I love this jet so much. It gets better every time I fucking fly it, which is why I need to fly it more often. Does anyone know the tack in for uh, Bundra Bus off the top of their head? Maybe I can click it, probably not. Yeah, no airfield info. Read the briefing. You can't make me do it. You're not my real dad. Uh, I use Steam. I use standalone for test, but I use Steam for my actual, like, playable DCS install. That's so awesome, man. The, the massive fucking cloud as the jet starts. Must be a cartridge starter or something. It's like if you've ever seen a, a Meteor or a Canberra or a Vampire or Venom or something like that start, something British of that era, there's this great clot of fucking black smoke that comes pissing outside of it. Probably shouldn't have done that while it's still aligning, but whatever. I'm sure it'll be fine. Config, uh, and then we'll descend the 
Canopy? Whoop. There we are. Just team, just team clams we're having. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Holy Jesus fuck, dude. Good God. Saw a new picture from the UAF and JDAM fabs are hilarious. Oh god. It's terrifying. There goes, uh, that's either a Tomcat or a 29. 29, judging by the smoke. <laughs> the fucking wing kit is longer than the bomb is. That's Advised fucking magical. On, um, some. Oh, it's you in the 29, Tom? Okay. Oh, hello. I'm landing 03L. Good luck, enemy team. We got a show off. I don't know what they're taxiing up there for, the runway's down there. Okay, uh, we will tell the ground crew to fuck the chocks off. Chief, remove the wheel chocks. Copy. Wheel chocks are now removed. A little convention going on over here. Actually, is that the Mirage startup smoke, or did somebody turn on a smoke? You know what? Someone might have turned on a smoke pot at the end of the runway. That might be what that is. I think the Mirage does smoke on startup. I, I'm pretty sure it does because the guy next to me did. But something might be broken, or somebody set off a smoke pod. Also, I am using the smoke mod, so that might interfere with it. Um. That that is a possibility. It might be my fault. Smoke is this big for you? Okay, yeah. Uh fair. We finally get the Su-27 in DTS, I mean full fidelity. Are we gonna, we're probably gonna, we're probably gonna get a jank Ukrainian one with JDAMs and A120s. As long as I don't have to carry the JDAMs and A120s and I can turn off any Western equipment in them, like I can with the TAF and this, I'm happy. Like, I don't mind getting extra features as long as I can toggle them off in Mission Editor. Like, if you give me a fucking u butte upgraded jet with modern avionics, as long as I can turn it off and replace it with the original shit, I'm happy. Like, that's the thing. I'm not against getting new shit. I'm against getting only new shit. If I have the option, more's the better. I get to play with the new toys as well when I want to. Okay, let's close the lid. Is this? Yeah, that is movable. I, was, uh, I wasn't sure if they'd implemented that yet, but that's that's pretty neat. It's good too, because when you're doing out of ground stuff, you can tilt it down to look at under, like underneath your wings, and see if there's any ground launches coming up at you. When you're out to air, you just tilt it up so you can see your blind spot. No one wants to take off on this runway with me. I'm not cool enough, I guess. That's fine. That number in the box is your lateral G-load, from memory. Come on. 
a piece. There we are. You notice how long it sits on its tail before it actually uh, lifts off the ground? Delta wing induces so much fucking drag on takeoff. Okay, 300 knots, we'll come back out of burner, we'll just level off for a bit, turn east, level off, accelerate to like 0.9 or so, and then we'll climb. And we'll make sure that we have this open. It is, isn't it? I mean, I think everyone's landing from the water side, but still, it's pretty funny. Where's all the blues gone? You guys scare them off. Oh shit, uh, there's we did. One up. He's going to be to the east of Kassar. Good thing, dude. I'm doing. I'm doing some ground attack. Yeah, Mark 82 is going for their base. Yeah, I think I'll take bombs. You want to fly with? I'm about to. I'm getting ready to take off. Okay. Yeah. Um. You doing depot or just the base? I'm gonna try and oh. hit their base, but if Sam's get too hot. Uh, I'm talking about Kesham, or let me check what. They yeah, they are. don't. If you try and start this thing in a tailwind, though, you're gonna have a bad day. Yeah, Kasab, I'm gonna. Tr oh, it's I don't see cool. any circles at Kasab anymore. Bandit coming south. Uh, Bandit coming north of Kasab. Bandit coming north of Kasab. Single ship road, I can tell. It's set to 80 miles. Bandit JCB leading it back. Yeah, I, I literally got full clusters on, and uh, I was hoping to sh strike Kasab, but maybe the target's on the coast. But I don't see any targets right now, there's no orange circles. 181, that's a 15, he's yeah, baiting back towards Kasab. I think the server reset deletes the recon circles. Okay, so I still remember where everything is then. 163. So it's only an F-15 that's up. I got um, three batteries left of SAMs on the... Uh, on the airfield, and they have um, a couple targets on the on the west side on the coastline. Okay. Did they push the front? Since they're the at uh, Hassab ish, we can did, just yes. so start cutting up on that. I now. think. Ooh, Don't need to side climb as much. What yeah, modules is the Garmin area. module compatible with? Pretty much all of them, I think. Yeah, I don't the own it, though. And even if I did, I wouldn't have it turned on. Cause, ah, like, fuck, man. The fuck do I it want a civvy right. fucking market yeah, it'll be, GPS in my um, vintage military aircraft for? In front of, like, north of Kassab. Um, like I think along the coastline. And so how do we get scouts set up, then? For the tar new targets? It's something that people always forget to turn off on servers too, like, for the longest time people were able to use it on an Alpen server before he realized. Um, I remember Hello. that little, Probably friendly. little peninsula on the right of Kassab has a few targets because I've flown the Maybe? over there a few times. Um, and then behind, probably not behind Kassab, but maybe in front of Kassab there is some. If not, we can just bomb their base. Are you figure? Are you figuring about going to Kassab or Bandar? Because they did take and two, two bar scan now. airfields last set. They got Tom Island, AFB, That's friendly, Tom I think. Koshak, Bandar Length, and uh, something international. We'll just keep him locked up for now in TWS, just because uh, I want to. Yeah, yeah Bandar Length. There's probably targets near that, and Tan. This is altitude. 35,000. Yeah, both, both the Tundra Islands should have targets. We can hit there. Less Sam's too. Oh, now I see. No, he's not 35,000. What the fuck? 3,500. It, it is returning friendly. Really really quick. I don't know if you're still in the air. Looks like he's going um, for the uh, air base down there.
Oh, pull one out, boys. We'll drop down to 40 miles because we don't need to be ranged out to 80, he's pretty close. Most things we encounter are probably going to be pretty close at the moment. It's a Hornet and a 15 and a JTAC. Hey, uh, what's your livery you're running? And all their tankers and shit. As a default, did you just spawn next to me? Yes. Okay, we must have the same livery. Band, uh, yeah. Base. I can see your dump bombs. One eight eight for eighty four point seven. Two ship hornet, or is it the same contact? Two ship hornet. Definitely not friendly. There's uh, there's nothing in the navigation menu for gesture. Worry uh, about getting dragged come over come uh, up. under a Yusk. I think that's Sam's there. I'm on INS check, but I'm good after that. Give me like four minutes. You ready on the config switch here? We're gonna probably have to punch the tank off before it's empty. That's okay because unlike the MiG-21, this has a total and then an internal, not the same gauge for both. So I just ignore the right hand side because it'll read high. Can we pick up enemy tacans? There's actually a tacan on that island. Oh, oh, the big brain plan starts to form. Um, Use uh, their own radio uh, navigation to I fuck on them. The is. Yeah, it just makes that little um, arrow point to it. So, and you can see the range. So whenever you finish your attack run, you can see how far in the direction so you can line up again pretty easy hell yeah battle of the beams boys I should see a config warning lamp come on in a minute we'll get a ding if we don't change a config quickly enough fuck he's not moving that quick either like he's maybe co speed so he's cruising We're doing it. We should probably head straight west first. Because they've got two, they've got three fighters up now. Okay. I'll, uh, he's I'll doing something. Um, What's it downwards? It means he's is... below me, right? I don't know. I think I'm ready to taxi. He's doing something. Is he locking me? Is yep. he searching me? He's got a missile out, I think. I think that's what that means. 
Feed it. Catch that one. Is it gonna fire? Yes, it is. Oh, did I hit him already? I think I did. I did. We got one. And there's Sam's out on me. <laughs> Hell yeah. Watch we don't get disorientated over the glassy water. Take lead. Zero eight one. That's his wreck, I think. T is probably a friendly Tomcat, I hope. Or it might be an enemy one that's way in the backfield. Naval Sam's question mark? Probably Naval Sam's. Oh yeah. Angry boys. Enemy Harrier in the mountains near Kassab. 0975... Uh, did he just take off? There might be another one that just took off from over there. But I don't want to chance it with just magic, so not against a Hornet. So we'll RTB, we'll pick up some more missiles and refuel quickly. We'll just fly until we get shot down, I guess. So if I perform really well, we might not fit any gunner heat, uh, heat PC in this stream, but we'll I'll get it. You. We'll get it next stream uh, if we don't get it this stream. Don't worry. Is, PCA neutral. Yep, sounds good. That voice sounds very familiar. That voice sounds very, very familiar. <laughs> that voice sounds kind of like someone that might still have my no, uh, spare have charge cable for my phone. Ordinance and I should be good to go, right? Uh, you should select the views as well. I'm gonna take out Depot 2, I'll let you guys know if I need any extra help. I've got to love how you can use the missile seekers as a, as a budget us. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Such a cool feature. The Mirage is just full of neat little things. Like, it's such a cool airframe. Yeah, so you select the ordinance. I'm glad it's Mario, finally like getting the, the attention it deserves. And you select the fuse. And you have to make sure you have no missiles selected. Come back out of mill power. I haven't played any of the campaigns for this. The only campaign I've played is part of the MiG-21 campaign, um, and that was when I was brand new to DCS. I should probably try some. What should I set the fuse? Some of them are apparently pretty knows. good, and now the AI is getting better, it's like, why not? It's good practice. I'm not sure I mean, to be fair, a lot of the campaigns are intentionally but, uh, set up to teach you to use your aircraft, so then when you go into multiplayer, you don't get fucking, you know... You don't catch a shooing from somebody that knows your jet better than you do, but... Mosquito camp? Yeah, I saw that. The um, the one with like the fully crewed fucking navigator, and he actually gives you steering commands and shit. That's pretty cool. There, it wasn't a campaign, but there was a um, like a um, what you call it, constant peg themed MiG twenty one single mission that's been out since forever. It was one of the first DCS missions I downloaded, and it actually has a voiced GCI that will give you actual GCI intercept cues. It's fucking awesome.
I'll have to see if the external, like the, the control uh, F11 trick works on this server while we're rearming so you guys can see my livery. A lot of you, like the regulars, would have probably seen it long ago when I used to fly this thing more often, but I'm quite proud of it. I still have some more work to do. I've got to do some stuff with the rough mets and probably right. do some detailing passes. I kind of want to redo right, the uh, like nose up. art as well. Where did you go? Because <laughs> it's kind of half one art style and half the other. Uh, I'm but... about 55 or 58 miles. From the target, so be between you and the target, yeah. Smoke's still there, and I think it got bigger. Based. Well, we won't have trouble finding home then. North northeast of Kesham. So that should be Kesham there. So then that that should be Bunda a bus. All right, looks like you're of us somewhere. You're 50 nautical miles on 62. Looks, yeah, it looks like you're uh, a little bit ahead of me. I'll try and catch up. Time to use the Mirage auto landing feature. I don't yep. remember how to use yep. the auto landing feature. I don't think I've ever used the auto landing. I've used the approach mode, but I don't remember using the auto landing. On the F10. And then radar, radar lock me if you need to. Deselect that. But don't mess up your bombs. Forgot what a joy the 29 is. Yeah, it's the 29 is so much fun to fly. Might not be full fidelity, but it is so much fun to fly. One of the most fun jets in DCS, I think. It really is impressive, especially having stood right up next to a Mirage 3 just the other day. Um, it really is impressive just how little changed airframe-wise uh, air between the Mirage 3 and the Mirage 2000. Like, if it ain't broke, you know. The systems changed, the engine got up upbeat, but they moved the cannons inboard slightly. That's about it. There's not a lot. And the little vortex gens there on top of the intakes. But other than that, it's pretty close to unchanged. Goes to show you a lot of the magic behind the Mirage 2000's agility is the increased thrust of the better engine, plus the fly-by-wire system. And yeah, the full span leading edge flaps yeah, too. That helps. Plus their range. We're too close the um to the, the Mirage three just has a slot midway down the wing, like it uh, mid span. Yeah, yeah, we will take a while though, like circling around, dropping bombs one by one. Oh no, uh, Bunder a bus is further along, isn't it? I always forget how much distance is between fucking Bunder a bus and uh, Bunder a Yusk. DCS Mirage 3 when? Hopefully not too far in the future. Like, hopefully I'll still be able to fucking play DCS by the time it comes out. Uh... The 3.0 documents are pretty, uh... I'm just hitting water pretty Kesham. easy to find, if you know where no, to look. almost to that island, first island. Not almost, but I'm just... And the 3.0 was a pretty Kesham. serious upgrade, too. Cool. I'm just northwest of that island. And staying around 19,000 feet now. It's not too far. Man, like, I don't know how many of you remember the state this was in when it came out. I didn't even play DCS back then. I just remember Ralphie's videos about, like, oh my god, this thing's so fucking broken. How did they release this jet in this state? Look at it now. Look at this thing now. It's fucking incredible. There's our waypoint. There's the airbase right there. Man, that's cool. <laughs> Look, I'm a, I'm a 1960s and 70s aviation guy. I see a fucking waypoint on my radar scope and I think it's the highest tech shit ever. All it took was the ADA taking an interest in it, yeah. Hey, when I switch in between air to air and air to ground, do I have to reset up the uh, settings for... What's his face? Yes, sir. Uh, it should be fine, but you have to push the weapon select. The F-15 is looking pretty select. slick. I wouldn't select. be surprised select. if it has some teething so issues when it comes out, but it's select. looking like the they put a lot out. of effort into making sure it doesn't come yeah, out yeah. half-baked, because I think that's been a lot of Razbam's problem, other than, you know, either taking on I too many projects or people island, thinking they're uh, taking on too many projects because, you know, Ron doesn't know feet. doesn't know um, better than to post renders of stuff and be like, I'm not doing this for DCS, and everyone's like, oh my god, he's doing it for DCS. Cool, cool. 
he, I think he's he's slowly learning that one that DCS players will ignore where you say I'm not making this butt, um, and they'll just go oh hopium, but um, I think that's been a lot of Razban's problem for their like past reputation is just finish or, or like releasing things in a really unfinished state because a lot of people don't have the patience or the functioning long-term memory to look at like the state this came out and go oh it's so amazing now like look how much effort Razban put into this module that they'd already made all their money on um like they're not taking the money and running they're taking the money and then making it like really really good it just takes them a while so i think with the 15 probably um probably a lot of the reason why it went from months not years to actually being three years is because they realize like, oh shit, we can't half cook this, we have to have it done when it releases. Or like, have it done to a certain standard when it releases. Now, I'm just theorizing here, I don't have any contact with the F-15 side of the house. But I suspect that might be what happened. Yeah. And it's it's good that they're thinking more about stuff like that. island itself, I'm like... Because here we can see what happens when they really sink some effort into something, and as well as that, especially picking up uh, Galanet, who is incredibly talented. They're kind of on the up and up with that. Circling now, but yeah, still the same. I don't see any targets on this big island. I think the 2000 is retired now. The 2000C certainly is. 2000 uh, DNN might not be, or the 2000-5, uh, but the 2000C retired like a year ago or something like that? A year or two ago? Uh, oh, I just realized everyone's taking off this direction, so I should probably... You know what? Fuck it. Fuck it. We'll just see and avoid. Shall I go in for a run? The old standby, see and avoid. Is it the north targets or the other ones? We're quite high here, but we should get away with it. By dropping okay, the gear I can slow myself down a lot. Now you're supposed to raise the seat for this to see the bottom of the HUD for the um, landing cues, but I can literally just sit up straighter in my seat, move back and kind of tip my head down and I can see it just fine. My default head position's raised slightly from de the uh, default anyway. Or like my default head position, my um, like normal head positions raised and pulled back a little, so I already have better vision over the nose and at the bottom part of the hub. So all I have to do is sit up a little straight. I'm still very fast, so we're going to do a little bit of an S turn to bleed off some speed. If I wanted to, I could have left the gear in and just ripped like a 9G turn right at the threshold and it would have slowed me down real well, but I kind of don't want to sink back into bad habits on my first day back in the 2000. <laughs> like, that would probably not be ideal. So we're gonna... This is where we start using the trim. Two way, two way. So it's, it's actually, like, if you're familiar with the... Uh, the E brackets on the Hornet and the Tomcat and stuff like that, it's very similar. The little carries down the bottom show our acceleration. The nice. brackets are on speed AOA, and the velocity That's vector shows where we're landing. It's as simple as that. Damn, it didn't look like I hit him. I should be, I should be more aggressive with more. I only dropped two. We're going to fall a bit short here, so I'm going to... Mind you, the trim's really sensitive in this mode. Like, one blip of trim is enough. More than enough, really. Which one? Which one? I think it's the closest one. How's the multi threading resource wise? Uh, well, it started causing me problems with OBS because it was rendering so many fucking frames, OBS was shitting its pants fighting for resources. So, I mean, I haven't noticed a huge difference because I haven't done anything super CPU intensive, I guess. But, yeah, there's been a difference. Looks like you hit, looks like you hit the buildings, but it's, not It's the, probably a good thing. A lot of people with, like, I'm going in various the PC yep. setups from the sacred to the profane have been saying that it's pretty fucking good, so... I'm just a dumb ass that doesn't notice these things. Nickel, four way. Yeah, I hope so, man. I hope so, for sure. Oh, this is not what I need. Fucking Cloud Shadow uh, right over the runway. The carpet of them. Interesting that Cloud Shadow popped in like that, though. Uh, yeah, I also... Damage, 
attention. Need to bear in mind this thing's very easy to tail strike, which I don't want to do. So I'll try and drop on that. So Probably about 150 knots is a good right, landing speed, I reckon. I'm gonna wait for you to do Much below that's again. too slow. Because remember, this is a delta. We're inducing a fuck ton of drag by being nose up like this. And once it gets away from you, like this is the thing that people discover very quickly about the Mirage 2000. Its thrust to weight ratio is not as good as you think it is. And once it gets away from you, once you get too I draggy and good. the nose is too high, on you ain't recovering it close I to the ground. A little bit of a float, and down we go. Oh, we should actually probably hold the nose up for error braking, but it's a little late for that now. Because it didn't occur to me until after. Trim reset. We'll get our nose while steering on. Yeah, I should have kept the nose up a little more because I'm going to have to cook the tyres a bit here. Cook the brake pads, rather. Well, both tyres and brake pads. Is there anyone coming this way? No, we're good. See, by choosing the runway further away from the spawn spots, We've got plenty of room, because everyone's just going to take off as close as I possible. Might be out. I might have dropped two on the same um, pylon. Pop the canopy for extra braking. I'm not sure what speed the canopy rips off at, otherwise I would. Okay. I'll give it another moment before I pop I it. See the, I see the vehicle though, I, we could strafe it. Uh, I still got bombs, I'll, I'll kill him and then okay. we can check the next island. I got lots I'm of out of bombs. <laughs> what? How? Dumb bombs on this is awesome. I've got to figure out how to. Like, I'm sure it's a simple process, but I've got to figure out how to do quick corrections on the GPS as well. Like, correcting for. Uh, not GPS, the INS. Correcting INS drift, but doing it quickly is something that I have not got a lot of practice on because a lot of the stuff I fly doesn't have an INS. Same with radar fixes on the Vigan. Um, since I turn turn av off most of the time because my fucking immersion, my realism, um, I need to learn to actually do fixes with it. Because otherwise I end up with a really badly drifted nav system. Which is not like good when you're doing ground attack. Bombs, depending how many and what type. Well there was a thing just the other day about a fucking MiG-15 at an air show in the US losing its canopy on takeoff or something. It's like, huh. Look, it's every DCS player when they first fly the MiG-21. It's like a rite of passage with the DCS MiG-21. Leaving behind a little part of yourself on the runway for people to remember you by. Aldi to get groceries and buying a digital caliper. I thought for a moment, this guy's got a, at least through SRS to my ear, it sounds kind of like you. I was like, hmm, is he under a fucking, uh, is he sneaking in here in a different name to teach people how to do ground attack on runways? Because that's what they're trying to do, right? Him and this other guy, they're bombing runways. So I was like, hmm. Are they shooting at you? Yeah, I see. Fuck! Going down! Oh, he's a scary place. <laughs> Depends what day of the week it is. On fucking pension day it sure is. Swap the config over, it'll probably yell at me in a minute, but once I load the fuel tank it should be good. Does Blue Flash have flanker? Yeah. Sure does. The 913's got just the right amount of spine, I think. Doesn't look too bad. Tref Nord, thanks for the follow. Welcome to the stream. We're just about to wrap up with DCS. Probably going to do one more sortie. Um, 
because I'm not expecting to survive more than one more sortie in this thing. It's been a long time since I've flown it. Um, we're going to hop over to some Gunner Heat PC for a little while and close out the stream in probably like an hour or two, maybe three at most. He says after saying I'm not going to stream too late, it's like 4.30 in the afternoon already. I don't know, I'm having fun. It's been a bit of a shit show, but it's been a fun shit show. Probably gonna have to recock the gun once it's, uh... Oh no, it doesn't flip that switch down when you finish rearming now, but I'm gonna manually do it just in case. And we'll, whoop, bring that down to 4140, which is close enough. Okay. Did I pull the parking brake? I did, yeah. Yeah, um, they had linebackers. You still up? Or did you go down? Yeah, you gotta specify now. Blue flag or blue flash? Because oh, they both have the same initials. Never mind. TBF, yeah, that's probably the way to go. I just call it Tempests. Call this Tempests, and I call yeah, ECW no, no, Ligmas. Yeah. Oh my god, that smoke is still there. What the I, fuck? I've realized in the patch notes, they buffed the stinger in the patch notes. Oh so no. Not again. That, um, that oh no. Surprise. He got me from so far away. I don't, I'm not certain how to laser bomb, but maybe that might be the play. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you how to do that with the Jester. It, it definitely works, I've done the depots. Okay, um, so what should I run? So take two GBU-24s and two GBU-24s. I haven't read the patch notes, I'm gonna have to now. Fucking stingers, man. And the lantern pod. Fuck that noise. What's up? Hey. See, the Mirage kind of like hangs in ground effect for a while while it kind of overcomes the drag off the wing. It's pretty cool. They do that in real life too if you watch videos of them taking off. Whoops, two, two. We'll do a bit of a side climb again and then turn in. Because that seems to be working pretty well for us. Low damage from the Stinger corrected? Oh, okay. Yeah, because Stingers used to sometimes, like, pass through you without doing much. Or, like, they detonate, but they just frag a couple of control surfaces and that's it. Yes, that's right, yeah. They were kind of... Mm. Oh, this song's so good. Nah, 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 I like it. Did Tom just get deleted? No. Cut out mid comms like, hmm. For 70 hot. They're all medium altitude. Like, why are they all medium altitude? There's one guy high. Well, two guys high. They're like 24,000 feet, which is. Pfft. Like, why are there F 15s on the deck? If the F 15 comes up to the altitude that I'm at, like 30, 35, 40,000 feet, the F 15 is got up there. I don't know why they're staying so low. Alright, ready whenever you are. I forget, what's the... there's a bind to drop the fucking visor, isn't there? So for the lantern part... Is it... Hey, um, actually, let's no. use our own channel... Channel... No. Radio 2. 
It's probably the same as. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Sun visor toggle. A toggle. Uh, left shift and home. Shift and home. Hey, there we go. Now we're a cool guy. Yo, repeat this. I'm a cool guy now. <laughs> I love this plane. Isn't flying high the point of the eagle? Yes. But no one ever accused DCS players of being smart. Especially DCS Blue 4 players. So you want God in its triangle shape? Hell yeah. Fucking oath. Go four bar. Four bar narrow scan. Copy. And then two one five for sixty three. Angels 1.4, it's a Hornet. One minute ago. 1.4, bro. Come on. Something that... What is it? Is that friendly? Yeah, it looks Happy. like either one friendly or two friendlies. Friendly dragging or two friendlies. It's probably Tarn. Tarn and someone else. 219 for 52. There he is. Uh, friendly Pip. Maybe that's Tarn dragging? I don't know. It's in the right direction. It's at the right distance. I'd say probably the front contact is Tarn and the rear is enemy. The radar can't quite tell them apart. So I'm going to drop contact. I'm going to try and lock up the rear. There we go. Yep. So the lead will be probably Tarn or A friendly and the trail is hostile. I'm going to go ahead and just drop the tank now. I don't really need it. My trigger's getting sticky on my, uh, on my Hotas. I need to clean it out. Okay. He might be wise to what's going on here. He's also jamming. Just keep an eye out for what else we got. Okay, I've got nothing showing. Did someone bag him? Oh yeah. Yeah. Magpie got him. Okay, well since we just dropped up Fucking belly tank, we're gonna throttle back a bit and just cruise. Bunch of friendlies all there. So the reason you're seeing a bunch of, uh, for those that aren't familiar with how the Mirage's radar is modelled and just how radar is actually supposed to work, well, especially these older ones with shitty processing, um, the reason it's overlaying multiple contacts on each other is that's each scan bar hitting the target, oh, like hitting something. So, on a uh, four-bar scan, I should see four contacts for every one aircraft, depending on size and distance. It might be more or less, if it's like far away, it'll be one or two. Um, close up, it'll be all four. If it's a large aircraft, it'll be all four. And I'll see the same number of uh, IFF returns. And the IFF antenna and the actual radar antenna are not perfectly aligned. So the IFF might be offset slightly from the actual contact it, belong, uh, contact it belongs to, kind of like the F-16. So you've got to be really careful with this thing. It is, like, if you don't know what you're doing, it's team kill central. And you won't know you're about to team kill because you'll be kind of in this uh, false state of security from other modules that don't simulate this kind of stuff. Or just aircraft that do simulate the radar well, but they ha have, like, actual good modern radars. This thing's kind of janky. That's friendly. Chevron pointing up is flying away from me, or low closure, like really slow closure. 
contact coming towards me is high closure rate. And then the little wings on top or bottom show whether it's uh, caught at the top of the scan or the bottom. And if there's none, then it's right in the middle. So reading the Mirage radar display is kind of like reading tea leaves, yeah, and it's we, awesome because we of it. Can for the 14A. I just used to fly in the 14B where you're not supposed to. But um, for this one, two, you two, have to five, get up high. So we, should, we should use afterburner. Climb it. Climb at 300 knots, then climb at mark 0.7 until we get to like close to 40,000 feet. That um, F-15 is probably RTB, and if he's not RTB, he's trying to bait so us. I'll go with, I'll go with afterburner this time. What is crews up here? It looks like most of the SAMs around the airfields are shit like Rollins, which have a pretty low engagement ceiling, at least from the perspective of a Mirage 2000 that's cruising up here, so... <laughs> hey, Grass. Yeah, I got my uh, personal livery on as well. The good old anti-flash white Royal Canadian Air Force interceptor scheme from the uh, 70s. Well, 60s and 70s. Those should be friendly. Yep, they are. You'll see as well, even if you're not picking up a contact, you'll still get friendly returns on the um, on the radar. So this comes or this becomes relevant with Combat Tree, which is the the system the US invented that would um, successfully interrogate Warsaw Pact IFFs, so at least old ones, the SRZ02 and earlier. Um, it would actually ping them and make them respond because they thought it was a friendly radar interrogating them. And what this meant was even if the Phantom's radar couldn't see a MIG. The MIG would say, hey, I'm over here, because it thought it was getting interrogated by Friendly. Now, depending who you ask, it was either the greatest thing since sliced bread, or it was obsolete within a year or two when the Soviets figured out what the fuck was going on. But still, it's a neat system. And you can see the basis of how it works here on the Mirage 2000. One nine five for 82. It's a Hornet, and he's got a bit behind him, he's got a 15. I don't want to overfly Kassab too directly, because that sounds like a good way to die. Have they got dots turned on in here? Or is that just graphical artifacting? I think they've got dots turned on. Hang on, I need to... I need to put a cloud between me and those units so I can tell for sure. That's friendly. Dots are the thing that, that people with high-res monitors, like massive fucking 4K Ultra HD, you know, u butte monitors, and some VR players keep asking for, because they're like, oh, I can't see aircraft, it's so unfair. It's like, well, congratulations, if you turn dots on, anyone on 1080p like me, we basically have x-ray vision. Like, we already have pretty good vision for dots, because, you know, small monitor, but it's like fucking x-ray vision on, on 1080p. And I'm not playing 1080p because of my spotting. Like, a lot of people have high-res monitors, but they run at 1080p because they're like, oh, I need to see dots. This is my native res. I only have a small monitor, right? So I'm not even gaming this. Spotting issues... Like, there are issues with spotting in DCS, but they're relatively minor in the grand scheme of things, and they're not what people think they are. Um, the majority of spotting issues in DCS are actually skill issues. And I, I, I know it sounds really arrogant to say that, but it's true. It is something you either have or you don't, but it is something you can train to an extent. Like, you need to be able to predict where somebody's going to be, where they're going to move to. Like, it's it's more about knowing your enemy and their intent than anything. It's, eyesight doesn't matter. You could have God's own eyesight, but if you're looking in the wrong place, you're not going to see anybody. You could have terrible eyesight, but if you're looking in the right spot because you know, oh, he's probably going to go over here and try this maneuver, you know where to look. Like, this is the thing. Most people's biggest complaints about DCS... Yeah, there's a lot wrong with DCS. There's a lot of stuff that could be improved, and a lot of things that aren't modeled correctly, but the majority of common complaints, especially places like fucking Hoggett, are skill issues. People just don't want to accept that it could be that, you know, maybe there's nothing wrong with the game in that respect. Maybe you just need to practice. You know, maybe you're not God's own gift to fucking fighter aviation. Alright, my lantern's set up. I just realized I've been sitting in mill thrust this whole time. That's not a great way to use fuel. i still got a fair amount left, though, if you look at it. 2800 internal. 
And this is in kilos, mind you. The um, Mirage's fuel quantities are given in metric. Because France. Okay, we got a bunch of friendlies. We appear to have basically air superiority over the Tunba Islands and possibly even Kassab proper, which is cool, I guess. 216 for 57. So he's not really moving from wherever he is. He is relatively high up though, so he has some sort of functioning brain at least. Hello. One of these might be a tanker. Oh my god, if he's tanking. I don't know if he is, but if I bagged someone while they were tanking, that would be fucking hysterical. I don't think I've ever done that before. That's friendly. Well, it's probably friendly. You can't be 100% sure. You aren't. You aren't. You're going for the friendly, though. This is probably the Hornet. No, I don't know how good our chances are of catching him. What's he doing? 1.0. So he's just cracked supersonic. 1.1. Come on, baby. He's going cold now. Come on, turn. Double back. Turn around. Turn into me. Just gotta watch for launches from Kassab. Uh, uh, check. The Mirage with full missiles accelerates. Mm, yeah, okay. It, its acceleration's decent, but it's not great. Clean, it goes like a rocket. When this thing's clean, it's one of the fastest accelerating jets in the game. Um, but when it's got missiles on, you feel the drag, and again, it's, it's a thrust-to-drag thing, um, because this only has a thrust-to-weight ratio at combat load of, like, 0.9 or something. It's not that great. Like, this is the, the issue with the entire Mirage family in general. They've typically been hobbled by, um, underpowered engines, or unreliable engines, or both. This guy's probably dragging me, so I'm gonna come out of burner for a second, just do a quick check... Hot. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, he's dragging. 239 for 53.2, huh? I think that's still him. That's the fifth. Oh, no, there's a friendly there. So yeah, he's merged with that friendly, I think. Yeah, he's merged, merging with him and he's fucking going like the clappers at him. Maybe if I hard lock him, I can scare him off. Nope. Rut roll. Let's go interleaved. There's something. Friendly pips still up. 235 for 36. Angels 26. Left contacts hostile. What should be. Right one, he's merged with a friendly. Don't know if he got him. I need to get out of the habit of checking on that. It's kind of cheaty, to be honest. This guy's going cold now, it looks like. Yeah, he's going cold. Okay. 15's dropped off picture, so this is the 18. He might be the only thing that I have left here. Might be able to bag this guy, maybe. I don't know if that friendly still up that he was going for. The white dot. Is his afterburner? Like, is that his afterburner going? Why is he white? I don't know. You can see him kind of skipping around the screen too. I wonder what's up with that. 
maybe something to do with the way multi-threading yeah, changed the game. The I don't know. Like the movements of the dots are not very smooth. That's not a good noise. Oh, that really ain't a good noise. Yeah, just but he's pretty far out. The water area as well, but this guy is dragging me. We just uh, try again. I'm gonna drop him. We'll grab him again and see if he's turning back into us. No, he's still heading back to base, I'd say. He's probably RTB. It's kind of hard to tell sometimes. Are they dragging or are they RTB? There's the 15. He sure ain't fucking RTB. He's coming right at me. Real quick, too. Alright, we're already Mark 1.2, so we have some decent speed up. Shouldn't be flying directly head-on at him like this, but we'll see what we can do. Eighteen's on me. He's doubled back for a shot. They both shot at me. I think that's a shot, or it might be a lock. I'm pretty sure it's a shot. This is where I could have used a friendly wheeling around with me as well to do the same thing to them, to drag them back into me. But, or drag... Me drag them back into him. Words are hard. Oh yeah, they're mad. They are mad. I'm just gonna hoof it away. I don't know if they're gonna run me down. Hope not. I'm dragging a... Can I not mic up in this? Shit. Guess not. Oh, because I forgot to fucking set the radio, it looks like. Not the best time to be doing this. Um. This is fine. They're still really mad. The F-15's dropping back, the Hornet's still pretty close up my ass. I don't want to turn around yet. Give him an easy shot. Why is my push torque not working in this jet? It's kind of annoying. On the off chance someone can hear me, I'm dragging a Hornet and an F-15 back up past Fessab towards Kesham. Mark 1.75, baby, and we're approaching our limit speed, so we need to climb. But look how quickly she burns through fuel now and afterburner. Okay, 20 miles. We'll risk it. Two ten for twenty eight. There you are. I already know you're not friendly, so you can catch that. Careful we don't overspeed here. Gotcha. Okay, where's the other one? Oh, look at all the fucking contacts off his debris. That's awesome. Okay, where's the 15? Oh, he's cold! Wait, no, that's a Hornet. Where'd the 15 go? Did he disconnect? Fucking adrenaline shakes. Jesus Christ. Really bad adrenaline shakes. <laughs> I 
I haven't had those for a fair fucking while. Not this bad either. Fuck me. One of the reasons I'm not a real fighter pilot. I get really fucking shaky when I'm amped up. I don't know if it'll show on the control overlay. No, it won't. Not high enough res. When I did that, um, the nuke strike on Hassab in Alpen's new commission, I was so... Like, I couldn't actually play for about 10 minutes. I had to just sit back and let it chill. So for 23, that's his last known position. So the EWR probably has a fairly long update period. Uh, I think we're not going to bite off more than we can chew chat. We're going to head back. We're low on fuel. We'll end at uh, maybe Keshem, maybe Bunder a bus, and we'll grab another missile. I've also got to be careful because I'm getting kind of low and kind of close to some of their air bases here, which I don't really want to risk doing. Yep, we bagged. Oh, that was a 15 we got. Cool. So the Hornet's still here. <laughs> Again, it's a little cheaty, but you know, whatever. Everyone else does it. 061 for 18.4. I think we got our customer here. Oh yeah. Yeah, we got our customer. Shit. Maybe we don't. Is that... I want to say there's a friendly in there chasing him. And I can't tell who's who. We're also super low fuel. We'll go SVI. Close combat. That's friendly. Is he still up? Is he dogfighting? No, okay, he bagged the Hornet. Cool. In fact, there's the Hornet's wreckage right there. Awesome. Well, home we go. There he goes. Very supersonic. <laughs> sounded awesome. Ah, it was Magpie. The classic MiG-29 smoke trail. The Tomcat's pretty- like, the F-14A is pretty smoky as well. They can be a little hard to tell apart sometimes, but the 29 smokes like a fucking chimney. It's awesome. So you can see, um, like I rarely use a full scan azimuth on the Mirage, I usually use the um, 30 degree instead of the 60, which is full... Wait... 60? Yeah, no, I use the 60 usually, I think, which is... Uh, that one. And then your full scan is that. But that's... I forget what angle, like 120... Uh, 60, 30. I, I've started using the 60 as my default and the 30 when I'm like doing a 4 bar uh, height scan because you know the more vertical bars you're scanning the longer each scan cycle takes. Um, I know I'm explaining the obvious to like most of you here but there are probably people in the chat that aren't super familiar with this. Um, so in order to try and get the quickest possible scan of a slice of sky you narrow the scan down. You can either do a wide scan on 2 bar elevation, or you can do a narrow scan on 4 bar elevation, and that gives you your best possible chance of getting a good refresh rate and seeing what's going on. Because the longer each scan takes, and the more bars it's got to cycle through, you'll have contacts dropping in and out that are only sitting in one bar, especially at long distance. Um, it just becomes a pain, and it's not worth it. And, like, particularly in track while scan, it can, it can be a bit of a good way to lose contacts. So I usually just keep it nice and tight. So it's a good quick scan. That's really all you need. And then, like, if you want to see, oh, what's over to my side, you just slew the cursor and the scan zone goes with it. It's pretty simple. MiG-29 trying to peel an F-18 off of Brimley. Sounds about as close to its designated role as you can get. Yeah, it's uh, pretty good for that kind of thing. There he is. Hey, Magpie. Good buddy. One of the uh, one of the really good Aussie pilots in Cold War stuff. He's one to watch out for. Also, one of a handful of people who flies the F5 that knows to go vertical when he comes across an angry Su-25. 
he's like one of the few people on Enigma server that actually can kill me pretty easily in the suit when I'm in the Su-25. Most of them are easy prey because they just, they've got this brain worm that they just flat turn, which the Su-25 beats them at once it's light on fuel and empty of uh, external stores. But he just goes straight up, you can't keep up with him. Like delivery? Oh yeah, I'll have to, um, when I'm on the ground I'll have to see if I can get the external camera so I can show you. I'll probably have to do the re really janky control 11, uh, <laughs> control F11, um, and then zoom in thing. We're gonna land at Keshem, it's much closer. I think we'll do that. Because I'm not especially concerned about them following me home at this point. I think we've got pretty good air superiority at this point. You notice the, um, the F10 map is still taking its time to pop back to cockpit, which is interesting. But that's probably a memory thing more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, it's um my personal livery. It's up on um I don't think my personal one's up on user files for this, it is for the twenty one. I might put this one up there too, but I've got a like a generic um RCAF anti flash white interceptor scheme, like on the voodoos in the like sixties. I think late sixties, early seventies is the scheme that I'm using here. It's an East German march. What if Prussia, but communist -a? Do we still have it? No, we did jettison the tank, didn't we? Pretty sure we did. approach mode there we go let's play as a Victorian <laughs> there was some back in the old days on something awful they're probably still in the comedy gold mine there was some fucking amazing Vicky let's plays there was one which was just titled let's play Serbia and you can imagine how spicy that thread was it was the utmost quality Keshem Air Base is down there. Keshem Airport, I don't think it's really an air base, but in DCS everything's an airbase. Hey Giggles! Cheers to the raid man. Hope you had a good stream. Welcome everybody. Uh, we've been gradually relearning DCS today because it's been so long since I really played much of this stuff. Uh, we had a morning full of disasters in the hind, including multi-core fucking over my stream because it now renders so many frames that it kills OBS, which was very funny. I had to restart the stream like three times and it still isn't working properly, I don't think. Um, but yeah, we, we did a bit of um, hind stuff on the spiritual successor of Alpin's server, um, Dogs of War, which Mike Delta runs with a few of the other guys from Alpens, a few of the other old guard. And now we're on Tempests uh, in the glorious, glorious uh, triangle with two 30mm cannons and shitbox missiles. The classic Dasso fighter design, the Mirage 2000. Took me about two sorties to remember how to use this. The first sortie I embarrassingly got giraffed with AIM-9s, uh, but I just managed to bag some kills. So I'm doing... Uh, Doing all right, I think, for my first day back in this in God knows how many months. Got my ass handed to me by hidden ground units on Grey Flag. Oh, ouch. Yeah, that'll do it. I'm surprised I haven't died to anything embarrassing ground base in here yet. I was on uh, I was on the other server. Bedtime. Sleep well, man. Thanks again for the raid. And uh, I will catch you in game sometime soon, hopefully, since I am making a bit of an effort to come back to doing this whole DCS thing. We'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> I 
making me want to buy the 15e. Like I said, I'm the 15e is not my usual type of thing, but I'm getting kind of tempted myself. Just, just you know, kind of tempted myself. Not least because anything that goes from that, you know, sale-wise is gonna directly or indirectly help fund the 23 arriving sooner. So, but no, it it looks pretty cool. It looks legitimately interesting, like a really neat aircraft. Once again, we're a bit high and fast, but that's okay. We can uh, make up the fucking difference here in, you know, the last two kilometers of the flight. It's fine. Thing to keep in mind with the 15 is you don't have fly-by-wire as well. Yeah, I know. But you've got the, um, the CAS, and CAS on the 15 is... It's not fly-by-wire, but it's pretty fucking close, honestly. Like, it's a really good stable aircraft. I think, I don't know if Cass has anything approaching auto trim, but even so, it seems like it'd be pretty easy to trim out. Because, like, the 21's not fly-by-wire and it basically has auto trim, the Vigan's not fly-by-wire and it has basically auto trim. You don't need fly-by-wire to have auto trim, it's just that fly-by-wire and auto trim tend to happen together, because why would you not? Like, if you're going to have one, you may as well have the other, if you've got the technical ability to do it. Yeah, we're giga-fast here. Three greens, nose of steering's off. I've got to remember I don't have a parachute, so I do need to actually aero brake here if I don't want to overrun. This Keshin's not the longest runway. Okay, we're getting a bit behind the power curve here, so we're gonna give us some beans. Gotta watch our own tail strike, it's gonna be a bit rough. Oh, not too bad. And you'll notice the aircraft just naturally wants to uh, float because I'm a dipshit and I gave it too much throttle. It naturally wants to keep its nose up, so we can just kind of hold it here. Sloppiest arrow braking on Earth, but we got away with it. Let the nose down gently, he says as he slaps it down. Reset trim. And we'll just loop around here. Go rearm on the apron so no one collects us on takeoff or landing. And I think, I know I keep saying last sortie, but we'll do one more. Surely I will die on the third sortie. Surely my luck will run out, although there's only still two blue fighters to worry about. We need some more blues on here. You noticed any difference yet? A bit. And mostly because it was causing problems with the stream. Like it was, it was actually rendering too many frames and OBS was crapping its pants. But other than that, I haven't noticed a huge difference, but I also haven't been playing, like, massively busy servers. Sweat-inducing approach, and yeah, you get used to it. I personally don't really find fast, uh, fast approaches or fast landings, at least in DCS. Real life is a different matter, but... Um, in DCS, I don't find fast landing speeds or fast approaches particularly intimidating. Um, in fact, you know, being a MiG-21 player, and this being one of my other favorite planes in the game, um, I'm used to it. That's how I land. It's how I have to land. Um, really, the like the issue with fast landings are just there's less time for you to um, correct any fuck-ups you make, and there's, you know... The breaking distance is a bit more of a critical factor, but other than that, like, it's not really that different from any other landing. The scary thing is vertical speed. Like, vertical speed is what it is what kills you, not horizontal. So, I'd rather that than a Navy landing in a Hornet. That makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, we want to crack that. Yeah, I know. There we go. I'm sure our INS has drifted a fair amount by now, but I don't really care that much. We're going to get rid of the... Uh, mm, mm. Yeah, we'll get rid of the belly tank. We don't need the range. We're pretty close to the enemy here. We're only flying short sorties anyway. 
That said, I came back with 520 kilos there, so maybe I should take a belly tank. Mm, nah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. I just need to keep an eye on my fuel gauge. Thought you were gonna run out of runway by the time you settled? Nah, I had heaps of runway left. Oh, right, external view. If the server lets me, it might not. Because so I think they disabled this on the Ligmas. But if we can kinda. It's our altitude, 6 meters ish. Control F11? No, it ain't gonna work. I'll have to show you guys uh, after I jump out of the server. Go to fucking Encyclopedia or. Oh no, maybe not that. Mission editor. I think I've got a mod that causes Encyclopedia to crash. I'll so I'll show you in the uh, mission editor. Hey, Raccoon. Good to see you, man. We're just wrapping up some DCS today. We're gonna head to some Gunner Heat PC afterwards, just for a little while, and then uh, call it a stream. For anyone wondering who, who hasn't heard already where I was last week at my usual streaming hours, uh, I was in Melbourne. I went to the Avalon Air Show, met up with a bunch of mates, uh, including Envy from chat, um, a few of the other guys that hang around my community, and my mate Harry, uh, the art lead from Gunner Heat PC, who I'd been meaning to visit for over 15 years and finally got round to doing it. It was an awesome trip, I had a great time. Um, Harry's got all sorts of weird and wonderful documentation and books and bits of tanks and shit in his flat, so I had a great time playing with all that stuff too. And uh, I think I'm going to have to make the Melbourne run a regular trip, because it was really, really awesome. It's my first time in Victoria, so I was suitably impressed. Does he have Sabo rounds? No. He has the, um, he has one of the, uh, periscopes off, like, a T-72 or T-55 or something. I think it's a 72, like, one of the, or BMP. It's one of the little, like, removable periscope lenses, one of the prisms. Um, and he has the sight unit from a Maliutka, which was quite an interesting piece. It has, like, zero eye relief. You basically got to press your eyeball against the glass, which I thought was a really weird design, uh, design choice. Unless it's just my bad eyesight, maybe? I don't know. It did have an adjustable focus ring, though. Still didn't help any with the eye box. It's also got various beautifully printed like photo journals of the um, the East German Army, the National of Volks Army. He's got uh, Schulter on Schulter, which is like the shoulder on shoulder. It translates to it's like the the Soviet Army and the East Germans and all their socialist brotherly love or whatever. And then the other one was. Um, I feel the title of it. It was like on tracks and something else. Um, on Ketten or something, I forget. It was about like the history of the um, NVA. Okay, just thinking, is there anything I missed? Don't need to reset that, because the the totalizer for internal fuel does actually set as you refuel it. It might actually be a true fuel gauge, but the totalizer for the external, um, you need to set manually. But I've got no belly tank on, so I don't care. I'm not looking at that side, I'm looking at the left side. So we are gun armed, safed at the moment. We're gonna get rid of the parking brake. And off we go. Hey there, buddy. Uh, the standby ADI is not working. So the main ADI is fine, but the standby is not working because I keep forgetting how to fucking make it work. There's like some specific order of things you have to do to uncage it, and I can never remember what it is. 
I've got the switch in the right position, I think, and I did uncage it and wind it down to centre, but there's always something I forget. I can never recall what it is. It might just be that I'm trying to uncage it too early or something, like when the other, you know, when the gyro is not spun up. I, I have no idea, dude. No idea. It's the first time I've flown this jet in god knows how many months, so... I'm glad I can just get it off the ground in one piece, let alone kill anything with it. Oopsie, speaking of getting off the ground in one piece, someone didn't. And one of our other Mirages just died to a Roland. Controversial opinion, but the F-14 has a nice profile. I don't think there's a... <laughs> I'm not sure if that was sarcasm, but I don't think that's controversial at all. Maybe in my Discord it might be, because we got a few people that are, you know, sick of the F-15... Uh, sorry, F-14 worship, but... No, I've always thought the Tomcat was a good-looking plane. Is joke? Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. It's hard to tell sometimes. <laughs> Internet, tone, etc. He doesn't run me over, get impatient and try and overtake me or something. No, I think it looks good. The canopy suits it. Like, the long, kind of big, bubbly canopy suits it. And the nose is a good size on it. It's like a Su-27. I know that Palm and a few other people in my Discord don't like the looks of the Su-27. I think it looks quite nice. It looks like a fucking shark or something. The MiG-29 is a beautiful aircraft too, but like just, you know, I don't know. The MiG-29 is just conventionally good looking, whereas the Su-27's got that kind of something about it. Not everyone likes it, but I do. It's got the uh, je ne sais quoi. Or, I guess more appropriately, the young is now. Soviet planes look aggressive? Yeah, they do. They really do. I knew that was going to happen. I fucking knew that was going to happen. Um, yeah, the, the single-seater Su-27, well, single-seater single flanker of any family looks good from the side. The two-seater looks fucked, in my opinion. Like, the canopy is kind of a bit too long, and the, the sharp angle joint between the dorsal part of the aircraft and then the canopy bottom and the canopy top, it just... Bleh. Single-seaters are gorgeous, the two-seaters are, like, they're not awful, but I, I'm not a fan. Twenty-nine UB. Nose is too short. It's disproportionate. It doesn't have a radar in it, because the nose is too short. The, um, the 29K, the 29K, 35, whatever you want to call it, the new generation MiG-29 derived designs, those look good with two seats, or with just with the long canopy. Because it's like a Super Hornet, right? It has the, well actually no, sorry, it's like a Strike Eagle, not a Super Hornet. Um, it has the long canopy, whether it's single seat or two seater, has the same canopy. Um, the Hornet has a, still has the single seater one separate. My brain is toast. It's too warm. Too hot to think in here. Cannot wait until summer's over. I'm not gonna get cleaned up, am I? No, I'm good. The um we didn't have any visitors for Avalon, but they brought an inflatable castle in the shape of a Su-30, which was cute. So I got to see um, F-35s up close, I've seen the 35 before, but not up close. And I'd never seen it do an aerobatic display, just a fly pass, so I got to see that. I got to see uh, three F-22s up close, I'd never seen one before in person. And I got to see an F-22 aerobatic display, it's fucking awesome. Jamaica Raptor, gorgeous aircraft, looked like it flew like an absolute dream. It, it just, it looked like it moved so naturally through the air, must be a joy to fly. 
However, um, the, the real show stealer is Noisy Boy. The F-35 is so fucking loud. Oh my god. Like, I knew it was loud, because like I said, I've, I've had it fly past before. But, god, it is loud. Got a 10-day heat wave of 40 degrees C, real field peaks. Oof. Ooh. Yeah, no, fuck that. I just, I hate the heat, man. I can't tolerate it. Especially when it's human heat. It's the worst shit. <laughs> yeah, maybe. By the time they finally adopt it, it'll be fucking obsolete. Okay, we got an F-14B, which is kind of scary, because Phoenix is... I'm hoping he's too potato to know how to use the Phoenixes, so he'll, like, STT me before he shoots. But I'm not gonna fucking, you know, count on that. Thirty-five sound optimized for show of force? Yeah, really. Seriously, it's such a flex. Like, oh, you didn't see me on radar, but you sure as fuck are gonna hear me. <laughs> it was wild, like... I, um... So, all the rich people were in stands, like, between the taxiway and the runway, so they had, like, the centre runway, centre show seats. Um, us proles were standing at either end of the runway, which was great. I preferred that to sitting on a stand in the middle of the, the runway and centre show, because it meant that when the fucking uh, Super Hornet solo display took off, I was standing level with where they lit their burners. Like, they came up, they went past, and as soon as they were past me, the burners kicked in. And it, like, I felt a thump in my chest and my ears hurt. It was awesome. I probably lost several, like, decibels worth of, or, like, uh, sorry, several octaves worth of hearing. Um, but it was worth it. It was awesome. Every time that, like, that's the thing. The Hornet or the F-22, if you were standing by the runway when it lit the cans on takeoff, it would hurt your ears. If it went directly over your head and lit the burners, it would hurt your ears. The F-35 could be halfway down the runway. If it lit the burners, your ears hurt. Like, it's that fucking loud. It's so fucking noisy. There was one pass he did, um, and it, he went right over... Um, one of the s spectator areas at the uh, far end of the runway, and he lit the burner right over them at really low altitude. Like, oh man, that's uh, there's going to be some bleeding eardrums. There's all sorts of cool stuff on display. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't find the cockpits that you can sit in until basically everyone was packing up, ready to go. So I didn't get to sit in any of them. Uh, the F-111 escape capsules from Moorabbin from the museum there, so I can just go back to Moorabbin anytime and sit in it. I sat in pretty much everything else at the museum. Um, so that was, you know, whatever. Um, but there's an F-4J cockpit, which I think the guy that owns it's in uh, South Australia. And there's a Hawker Hunter and MiG-21R, the reconnaissance version, um, that were brought along as well. And I think the guy that owns those is, like, a bit east of Melbourne, like, east or southeast of Melbourne. Um... So I'd like to get myself in that MiG-21 cockpit sometime. I'd really like to get myself in that MiG-21 cockpit sometime. Doesn't own the whole Hunter, he just has the cockpit. Like, that's a thing people find in aircraft that's about to be scrapped. And they're like, oh, I'll, I'll buy the cockpit. Because they can't, don't have room for the whole plane or can't afford the whole plane or whatever. They're like, oh, give me the cockpit. And they'll restore it up and bring it to displays for people to sit in or like to, you know, some of them hook them up to sim rigs. There's that one, I think at least one guy in the Czech Republic, it might be a couple people have done this at this stage, but um, 
bought a whole MiG-21, put it in a garage, and hooked the whole thing up to DCS, which is just the most based shit I've ever seen in my life. Just buy the whole jet and hook it up to fucking DCS. I periodically come across, like, fairly large bits and pieces of 21s, um, and I, I always have to fight the urge. I always have to fight the urge, but shipping is just, that would be the killer. If I lived in Europe, I would probably own at least an injection seat by now, if not an injection seat and a fully functioning radar. Not that I would want to turn it on. Um, but yeah, like, I found a KM-1 seat, or a KM-1M seat, um, and that would be, like, such a good gamer chair, and incredibly uncomfortable. I'd destroy my back even worse than I already do, but... It was already expensive and the shipping just would have been murder. The radar was actually affordable, but again, the shipping would have been the killer. And it was also on a Polish site, so I would have had to get, um, would have had to get Matt or Hero to buy it for me and then ship it out. And then just pay them the difference. Or, well, not the difference, but, like, pay them for it. Tomcat's probably just gonna sit back and ripple off Phoenixes at people, if I had to guess. Yeah, you just yeeted Magpie with one. We need approval to impo uh, import radar kit? You might, I'm not sure. It was probably not fully functional as is, but you could probably repair it. Because it looked like it had most of the parts, it was just not in very good condition. It was all dirty and there were a few broken contacts and like missing boards and stuff, but it could be a pretty good restoration project. Just make sure you don't turn it on. Uh, no, Tawny didn't get zapped by the 111, but he was there when that happened. I think he was in the cockpit with the dude that turned on the fucking rat out, because someone else got nuked, I think. At least I think it, yeah, I think that's how the story went. It's been a while since I've, uh, since I heard that one. I think he's still doing stuff on YouTube, but I kind of miss catching him on Twitch. Wonder if he'll come back to us here one day. It's probably like, oh, finally got rid of those fucking weirdos. Uh, he was very uncomfortable, but it was only the radar altimeter. It could have been much worse. See, the thing is, I know how to open that cockpit from the outside, like, I know how the release works, but I figured it would probably not go down well if the owner saw me, like, technically breaking into his MiG-21 cockpit, just to get a photo of me sitting in the seat, so... I'll just, um, I'll either wait until next Avalon, because he, I think he brings it every year, or, like, every Avalon, um, or Harry was gonna try and get in touch with him, because Harry wanted to see if he could scan some stuff that he had, um, so, if Harry gets a hold of him and maybe does some sweet talking or something, I might be able to get, get in contact. What does a radar do to a human? Depends on the power of the radar, time and distance of exposure, etc. Like, it's not good for you, but as long as you've got a certain amount of distance and or it's not too powerful of a radar and or it's turned off really quickly, it's probably just going to mostly be discomfort and maybe nausea, lightheadedness, that kind of thing. Um, if it's a really powerful radar and you're standing right in front of it, you basically get microwaved. Like, you, 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 you get a bit, uh, warm and fuzzy and not in the good kind of way. One ninety-seven. This guy's just fucking way out there. Oh, he's, he's out to the west. Interesting. It's funny, you look at some of the old Pulse radars and look at their power draw, like their peak power draw, and then you look at something like the Org 9 on the Tomcat or a modern radar, even like really powerful ones, it's it's an order of magnitude difference. We're talking like... at least 50 kilowatts, usually more like 100, 150, 200 for an early Cold War Pulse radar and a fighter. Like I think the Serrano... was it the Serrano 4 was like... I want to say 200 and something kilowatts.
The MiG-25 was some ridiculous number as well from memory. A friend of mine got nuked by a weather radar for at least two minutes. Thankfully he's fine and cancer screenings are coming back negative, but now he's infertile. F. Fucking Serrano 2, 300 kilowatts. King shit. Kinda wish I did bring a bag now, because then I could kind of use the fuel to get out, like get way up, way, way up and just accelerate to Mark Jesus and come screaming in on that Tomcat. I'd probably die, but I might be able to get something off at him. I think he's all they have for fighters. Oh no, they got a couple of others. Uh, I want to leave him alone. So, uh, 257, oh, they're all over there though. So, if I want to go for the others, I'll have to head his way. Uh, RP-25 was... Smirch. It was Smirch. I forget what the upscaled Sapphire was. Um, but yeah, like, cause the, remember the, um, Typhoon is RP-26. And the Typhoon is just a downscaled Smirch, pretty much. There's the Tomcat nails. I'm gonna fucking die. We're uh, just slightly supersonic at mill thrust again. Mirage is pretty quick. Mind you, that's not entirely uncommon for, um, Mark II fighters is to be slightly supersonic in mill power at certain altitudes. Especially when clean, but sometimes even when loaded. Oh, the Tomcat's coming my way. Rut roll. We really need a couple of people to bait this guy. Like maybe I can bait him, because the Mirage is so fast. I can bait him, because I can outrun him. Get him to waste his Phoenixes and someone else can pop him while he's distracted with me. I just wish my shit would fucking transmit. Fuck you, SRS. I do not know why it's not fucking letting me use the cockpit controls. I might have to restart. I think that's what I'll do, I'll restart SRS. See if it works then. Oh yeah, the 106 would absolutely do that. For sure. Pretty much guarantee you the 106 would do that. Uh, Shit, I don't have... Really? I don't have any server IP saved in SRS now? What the fuck? Since when? SRS, SRS. You ain't. Oh! What the fuck did I just press? Uh, this is fine. This is fine. Well, we can't go very high up now because we're not wearing a pressure suit. That was fucking bizarre. Hello, SRS, would you like to maybe connect to the fucking server? Oh no, I see what it is. My SRS is just fucked. Excellent. Love when that happens. I don't know what I did. I must have bumped something, but, like, there shouldn't be anything bound to the canopy. I'm gonna have to figure out what the fuck that was. Uh, 
Is it even connecting? I don't think it is. Orbit axis. Did I not- oh, you know what? You know what? I bet I forgot to fucking lock it properly. And it just popped because the canopy tried to pressurize. That's probably what it is. Oh well, we're a convertible now. Come on, SRS, you piece of shit. It ain't working. Oh, wait, no, there's two SRSs. That's excellent. I think he typoed one of the IPs. Oh yeah, there we go. Typoed the, uh, port. It's 5003, not 5002. But I still can't transmit. Why can I not transmit? Whatever. I was going to try and coordinate some sort of thing on this guy, but whatever. We'll just roll with it. He's cold now. No, Tarn, I didn't. I think it's just I'd probably need to update it. Which I don't like doing in the middle of a stream, so I'll just do it next time. One five one for 112. Aha, there we go. There we go, there's the victim. We can ignore the Tomcat for now, although he might pop in on us if we go for the 16. It's probably a false contact. It's friendly. Why is he so low? Angel 6, Jesus. 143 for 107. It's a long way out. Someone else will probably bag him before I do, but we might just press that way. Cheers, Campia. I thought of it all by myself. And we've certainly been doing it today. I've had lots of skill issues, but we've been having some fun. Those are false contacts, I think. Uh, you can actually see one of my skill issues right now. I accidentally ejected the canopy somehow. I don't even know how I did it. But the canopy is gone. I might even see if there's a bind listed somewhere for it that I might have bumped. Canopy jettison. No, it's not bound. Oh, I wonder if I accidentally hit... Control C. Control C when I was copy pasting the SRS fucking IP. Oh my fucking god, man. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Whatever. Hey, hey, what a year. That might be our 16. I want to believe it's R16.
Yeah, it's the usual key bind. Five miles. We're not going to lock him. We're probably not even really going to detect him out there. It's probably also kind of giving us a nasty angle. Well, he was giving us a nasty angle. I know that much. Did someone else get him, or did he just dive? Oh, he's climbing. 131 for 69. Nice. That's probably him. Maybe. Somewhere in this area. There you are. Is that a pip? Kind of hard to tell. I thought I saw a pip there, but no, I think it was just uh, symbology changing to show his velocity vector. So he's flanking a bit. We're probably going to lose him here in a minute, because he's pretty close to a notch. Yeah, I'm not seeing any more pips, so... Go ahead and unsafe, which I should have done earlier. Select our 530. Please, please, please come and joust with me, dude. Let's check what that F-14 is doing. He might be burning in on me. He is, in fact, not. Is he still in the server? Yes, he is. Wait, no, he's... Uh, yeah, no, he is. wonder if he's RTB or something. Or he's dealing with someone else. I will happily go poach the F-16 while the Tomcat's distracted. Yeah, that's probably a good idea, or like right control C or something like that, unless it's already bound. I'll probably just unbind it for this since I click the thing anyway. In fact, I'll do that right now. Cheeky bastards. <laughs> Come on, buddy, turn into me. Turn into me, chief. Yeah, it just didn't occur to me that with the menu open, pressing it would still pop the canopy. I figured the canopy, or like the, sorry, the menu would like blank out the uh, game inputs. How wrong I was. Well, I'm going to have some explaining to do when I go back to base, if I get back to base. How are we going on fuel? Mm, okay. If I have to chase him down or something, I'm going to run out pretty quick, but for now we're alright. Closure rate's not that great. He's, he's doing some weird shit. He's accelerating away from me, but he's not flying very straight. Hmm. I wonder if he's turn fighting someone? It looks kind of like he is, or maybe he's like landing or something. He's probably turn fighting someone. Or he's doing like a really fucked up approach. Oh, well, Magpie swapped over to uh, blue. Just fair, the teams were pretty stacked. I would also swap over if there were any airframes on blue that I really felt like flying. I do like the Tomcat, but I usually try and play that with a, with a human Rio. I need to do some F-18 stuff though, it's been a long time. Just not today. If I can barely remember how to use this or the hind, uh, I think the 18 would be well and truly out of my depth. Oh yes. Yes, 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 yes. I can see him from this distance. 30 miles and I can see a speck. You've got to be fucking kidding me. They must have dots on. Like, surely they have dots on.
still in PID. I think I am. I've got a PSEC in a minute. He probably already knows I'm gunning for him, so. Yeah, now we'll go. PID, or PSEC, which is STT, but in French. He's pure cold. He's going to drag me over Keshem. Keshem does have active air defense, but it's Rollins, so we should be okay at this altitude. Fingers crossed. Should. What he's probably going to try and do is dump me in the hills, and then giraffe me as I try and avoid Sam's. I don't know if there's anything bigger than Rollins here. I don't think so, but I could be wrong. I haven't uh, made much of a point of finding out, to be honest with you. Okay, the missile sees him. He's getting close to where I want to shoot. Yeah, he's trying to terrain mask. Oh, the sound of that with the canopy popped. Jesus. We're getting close to an overspeed. Being very close to an overspeed. There's a warning. See you later, Chief. Splash. That was Magpie. Right, now we run. Hey, and we're pushing a sector. It's funny, like the... With the canopy gone, you don't get the rumble of the afterburner, you hear a hissing noise and then the sound goes as you break supersonic, it's interesting. Now we run home. With our tail between our legs, very little fuel and no canopy. <laughs> but I think we're safe, unless somebody scrambles from uh, Hassab. So we can throttle back a little, just use the speed we've already got to climb up. And go ahead and safe the aircraft. We will turn off the radar, because this is this is going to be the last sortie. We'll swap over to Gunner Heat PC for a couple missions, and then we'll call it a day for the stream. I have been streaming a lot longer than I planned, as always. Can't help it. That's alright. I will still try and see if I can sneak in another one uh, later in the week, and we'll do some Misfiz in that, and maybe some Snow Runner, maybe some more DCS as well. Does Canopy Off do any help? Not really. It was an accident. I went to copy paste the um, SRS IP from the briefing. And control C is the bind to open the canopy. So I was going about Mark 1 and the canopy went flying off all of a sudden. Some people do jettison the canopy because they can hear other jets better, but I don't like doing it. I don't think it really offers that much of an advantage and it looks kind of goofy. And pop our visor back up and we'll probably land at um, Bandarabas which is over that way I think or is it no that's it there just 
start shutting stuff down that we don't need to use to land. Um, in the World War II planes, it's a little more useful because some of them have really tight canopies, so it's hard to see, um, but you can lean your head out. So sometimes in the Spitfire, um, like if I'm if I'm just doing dogfighting on like on the Just Dogfight server or something, I might have the canopy open. But if I'm playing seriously, I usually don't. Uh, if I'm taking off and landing in the Spit, I will always have the canopy open just so I can see where the runway is because you can't see over the nose. But yeah, usually I don't. You know what? Well, no, actually, I was going to say, maybe my SRS transmit button came unbound, but I was literally talking to, um... to fucking body organ earlier, so it can't be that. It's just DCS. It's probably... It, like, it probably needs a update. Like, they might might have changed the um, Mirage radar code go, or something since I last patched it. But, good luck. We push them pretty well. One more sector and we get uh, Khasab. If I hadn't already been streaming all day, I'd stay on and, and try and help capture that, but... Like, at least provide air superiority while the other guys get the groundwork done. And you can see there, the F-10 map still takes a while to load, even on my PC, which it really shouldn't, and it didn't used to. So, I think, um... I think that still needs some looking at. What are my preload radius settings on at the moment? Oh, that's the wrong button. Preload. Yeah, I've got the preload cranked all the way up. Which I think is what you want if you have a decent amount of RAM, which I do. And a very large um, page file, which I also do. Okay. There's the airport, so we're going to pop the air brakes. This might be the kind of approach where I just yeet a 9G turn right off the runway and kind of land off that, because we're going to be super fast otherwise. Preload should be all the way down. Mm. Isn't the whole point of that, though, if you don't have, like, a lot of RAM or a lot of page file, it's to, um... It's to trade off, like, constantly streaming the data rather than just loading it into memory and running with it? I don't know. I could try turning it down, I guess. I don't know if it's going to make much difference on my system. I keep fucking going to the wrong menu. I'll have to um, do it next time I restart the game, though. Slider shouldn't even exist, test it on B server and with that all the way off you can jump around to everyone external view and with it, it causes a bunch of lag. Hmm. I'll just turn it off then and see how we go. I mean, the thing is like, I think irrespective of that setting, whenever you check the F10 map, when you zoom out on F10, it's loading every terrain chunk anyway, because fucking F10 renders in 3D. God knows why.
The first time I zoomed in on the F10 map and I saw the leaves on the trees actually moving with the wind, I was horrified. I was like, hmm, no wonder it runs like shit. No wonder my game stutters every time I pop in and out of the F10 map. It's literally rendering the entire fucking map in 3D every time I do it. That's our low fuel warning. Very low fuel warning. That's okay. Because we are just about to touch down. Getting a little slow. Nobody on the runway. Almost right on the threshold. Almost. A little bit of a float there. The Mirage pretty often floats for like about 100, 200 meters just because it's generating so much lift as soon as it hits ground effect. Yeah, I do. DCS, I've got two of them. DCS is on one, uh, Ms. Fizz is on the other. But Ms. Fizz has filled its one up already. DCS has still got some room to spare. So I'm going to have to move some of my stuff out of my Ms. Fizz community folder, I think. We're missing our canopy because I forgot that the um, the game registers control inputs when you've got the briefing open. So I went to control C the SRS out of the briefing and uh, whoosh, off goes the canopy. Yeah. The one time it's not because I forgot to lock and seal it. We'll just park up somewhere over here and do a very, very abbreviated shutdown. So uh, that could have definitely gone better, but it also could have gone a hell of a lot worse. Three kills and one loss. The one loss was very embarrassing. We got uh, giraffe with an A9. But we just got our own revenge on Magpie with that last kill. It was him that a 9 me and I got him back. So after such a long break from DCS and especially from the Mirage, I will definitely take that as a result. Just park here, fuck it. Not like anyone's gonna care. Alright. Parking brake. Chief, place the wheel chocks. Copy. Wheel chocks are now in place. Hot off. Really? That doesn't. Okay, you have to press that to cut it. I might have to um, bind that to my throttle. Yeah, I know. Stop bitching at me. That can stay closed. That actually stays uh, switched over, I think. Then uh, those are already off because I already turned them off. That can go there. And then battery can go off. Done. Happy days. Alright. So, just before I quit the game, I'll show you guys this livery. Start clearing off my desk as well. So, uh, mission editor, 
like I said, I would show you an encyclopedia, but I think I want, um, like I've got a mod installed that will kill the encyclopedia and crash the game, so we're just gonna chuck a new mission in and I'll show you in the um, loadout screen. So I've got one Mirage livery uploaded to user files, I think, which is like the generic one, and then I've got a bunch of my own personal ones I've made, which aren't uploaded. I might upload them at some point. I'm not sure yet. My 21's uploaded, so. I had some other good ones that other people made too, like the uh, the Mirage 3.0 LARP liveries. I might have to use these sometime, they look really good. I think the same guy did the uh, RAAF liveries for the F1 as well. I use those all the time because they look really good. 75 Squadron. Uh, where are we? So this is the... Uh, this is the livery I was using. Good old fashioned anti-flash white RCAF interceptor scheme. Can you make the probe transparent for the 3 cosplays? cosplays? You probably could. I reckon you probably could. In fact, I wonder if you could even... I wonder if there's an argument for it. Maybe not yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if they add one at some point. I know you can use arguments on uh, Mirage F1 liveries to show or hide different features. So like I've got liveries for the CE that are actually like CR or um, whatever other variant. I think I've got one that's like a um, EQ. But yeah. For the 2000 I don't think you can do anything like that yet. But you might be able to um, just alpha map that out, like alpha transparency that out. I don't know if it would work out in game though, it might look a little weird. And then uh, this is the public one. So it's 416 Squadron, whereas my one's uh, 409. And then we got the colorful boys. I've still got to finish them. So um, these were going to be for like all the different uh, Fight for Honor tournaments I did. I have tail art planned for the first one. This is the... Um, this was the first one I entered into. If I got, like, into the... I think it was, like, towards the finals, or especially if I won it, I wanted to have, like, this really um, elaborate art on the tail, which I think I'm going to draw up anyway, just because it would look cool. But I'm also going to have the I didn't win version, which I want to do, which is a similar theme, but, like, funny. I based this one off the, um, the Electric Voodoo, the uh, Electronic Warfare version of the... CF-101 that the RCAF used for a while. And then I've got this one, which is my other kind of go-to. I usually use this one and the uh, white one. So yeah, I'm gonna grab a quick drink. I'm gonna fire up Gunner Heat PC. We'll play that for a little while, probably not more than an hour. Uh, I hope. We'll see how out of control we get. Um, but yeah, that'll close out the stream for today, I think. A little bit of Gunner Heat PC, and then I get to chill for the rest of the evening. So I'll be back in a few minutes, guys. Bear with me. Pro streamer, press the wrong button again. Oops.
We are back. Let's see how this goes. So, this will be my first time streaming or recording this for a while, so I'm not sure if OBS's settings are going to play nice with it, but we will see. I know there's been quite a decent round of optimizations lately, so... Yo, hold up! Hold up! There's been another patch already? Holy shit! Yeah, dude, new patch. Fuck. They've been cranking them out the last couple weeks. So we got some good stuff. We finally got the optic for the, uh, for the fucking Mini-Me turret on the M60, which is nice. Tank and scout vehicle crews will now abandon their vehicle when it's combat ineffective. So like when the gun's knocked out. Uh, light vehicle crews will now have a chance to panic and bail out when their crew compartment's pierced by munitions with a higher chance for larger caliber threats, so 113s might just say fuck this and leave if a Sabo comes through the side, even if it doesn't hit anyone. Um, added an option in the queue menu to bail out, allowing the crew to be saved in a hopeless situation. In a campaign, this avoids harsher logistics penalties for personnel losses. This will be interesting once the crew are physically simulated, like, leaving the tank. Because you might still get fucking cut down by artillery or machine guns or something, so it'll be curious to see how that plays once the crew are like a physical object in the world, rather than just attached to the tank. Tune suspension on several vehicles, especially the BTR-60PB, which should now be much less eager to spring into the air. Okay, well no more moon adventures with the uh, BTR then. Free cams now mean to blur effects, which is a good move because now you can take pretty screenshots without having to time it to avoid like a gun going off or, art or uh, artillery going off nearby, because that would like blur the shit out of the camera even with the time scale turned right down or the game paused. Um, so that's a good change. Little change, but a good change for screenshot Kumas. Uh, added correct tracer ratio to 50 caliber belts for M85 Capola guns. We've got a previous decrease in maximum spool bounces for better damage effect. Oh, that's going to be uh, spicy. Move spool penalty on 3BM20, increase scroll speed on unit switch menu, updated credits, fixed T72 tanks, TPD K1 gun sight having too low magnification. Uh, I didn't even notice it actually had too low magnification, but what I did notice is it cuts off the bottom of the sight because of the field of view. So I wonder if that'll change at some point, I'm not sure. It might just be a thing like you need a, a narrower aspect ratio monitor or something to see it. Fix BMP one gunner being immune to compartment penetration panic. Uh, fix 50 cal ammunition carrying too much velocity at long range. Fix mesh issue on T72 M1 commander hatch. I think I know which one they mean. It's where it becomes like um, Salvador dali when the hatch is open sometimes. It's a moderately common bug, but it doesn't happen every time. Um, oh, the 901. Yeah, the 901's been in game for a while. It's just not drivable at the moment. Um, fixed rare issue that could cause units loss to not be fully registered. Interesting. Well, let's go to Grafenver to start with, just to check out the M85 site, and then we'll do some missions. Added T80B. Not yet. Uh, T64B. What I'm like, I want the T80. Don't get me wrong, but the T64 is my baby. I'm I'm gonna be so hyped when the T64 is in. I may or may not have witnessed it driving around the proving ground uh, a couple days ago. May or may not have. But don't take that to mean it's going to be released soon, because it's still got work to be done on it. So, I don't know when it's coming. And uh, don't don't ask, because you won't get an answer from me, because I don't know, and you won't get an answer from the devs, because you shouldn't be asking. No, Harry was just showing me it, um, just driving around, showing that it is in-game and there's stuff happening with it, but it's still pretty early days. Um... So... I go. Huh? There we go. Engine sound? No, not yet. Can you actually like does 
Does adjusting the zero on this do anything, I wonder? Like, let's set it all the way up to... 2300, yeah, no, it doesn't, okay. So it's locked out, it's probably only affecting the main gun or something when you do that. But yeah, the 50 cal's now usable. Uh, it's gonna be crap against BRDMs and BMPs, because the M85, for whatever reason, tended not to have a lot of armor piercing in the belt, if any. But, it's something. It'd be good against ATGMs at longer ranges and against infantry when they're in-game. Bullets being visible like that's kind of oof. Yeah, that's incomplete. They'll probably get a revision pass at some point. But you gotta remember this... Being a small team and being, you know, quite... Quite active development, there's gonna be stuff which seems like, Oh, why haven't they fixed that yet? But it's just because there's more important shit to do. Now, the other thing is, um, it wouldn't appear like this, but bullets are a thing you can actually see with your naked human eye. Um, you don't see the bullet so much as you see the air disturbance that leaves behind. Um, you can kind of see it, well, I say naked, naked eye, you can kind of see it with the naked eye if you're in the right place, or if the weather conditions are right. But if you have like a spotting scope and it's slightly out of focus, you can easily see them. Like, you can really easily see where the bullet's going. Just watch the uh, the distortion effect kind of travel and hit the target. Yeah, you can. Um, you can. Like, you've got to be standing basically behind the muzzle, because if you're standing at an angle to it, you're not going to see it. It's going to be gone, but like, it'll be gone by the time your eyes register there's even something there. But if you're standing, like, kind of behind the barrel within a certain cone, you can see it. Not super clearly, but it's a thing. The new hit effects are really nice. Um, what was the... T-72, let's have a look at the site. So, now that the magnification's fixed, I'm curious... Let's check. So that's 925 meters? Really, is that all? Twenty-five. Okay, they might not have calibrated the scale yet, because the scale's off for the uh, PK, which is a known issue, I'm pretty sure. I guess they haven't calibrated that yet. They also made these move a lot faster, and the little bastard BMP silhouette fucking speeds up and slows down over his track. So it's really difficult to hit it now. I think that was a miss behind. It's really hard to hit it with heat because, you know, low velocity. We'll try about that much lead. We'll see how... Oh, fuck me. We'll see how that goes. Not a bad guess. How's my range? Close-ish. That was a little long. I'm aiming a bit high. Landing behind. Yeah, they're quite hard to hit now because they move really quickly. Um, is there anything else to change? I don't think so. The rangefinder on this is so fun. So we want to hit that tank, we aim at the base of the tank. I think it's actually, with lasers you tend to aim at the top, so you get less, um, like, less scatter, less bad returns, but with this you want to aim basically at the bottom. Right about there, 24, 2500 meters. Now I happen to know that's about 24 or 2500 meters, but... Yeah, good hit. So then, uh, this thing, this little fella here... I'm going to wind the range back, I'd say right around there, 1200. 1200. Easy. The main skill in using the M60 rangefinder is A, doing it quickly, especially if you're under pressure, and B, recognizing when you're getting a bad, um... 
like when it's misaligned. So sometimes you'll see one side of the object is solid and one side's still a bit hazy. You've got to realize which... You've got to have a basic concept of how far away the object probably is. So you might, like if you aim, uh, for example, at this silhouette here, let's see, aim at him, and you dial it up and you're like, oh, it's not quite crisp yet. Look at this, it's 4,000 meters. It's like, oh, it's still not 100% crisp. That is not 4,000 meters away, I can tell you that right now. Whereas if you dial it back, right around there, you see, I don't know if it'll come through the stream because it's really faint even for me, but you can kind of see there's the slight ghost image decouples from the back of the tank. Like you can, wish I could point to the screen in a way you guys can see with like the, oh, I can not actually, maybe. No, but it's it's like just left of the uh, crosshair stadium mark. You can kind of see how it's like decoupling from the back of the tank. That's what you watch for. So even though the image might not be 100% crisp and there might be a bit of blur to it, you look for when it separates out into two images and that's your range. So right, right about there. That's kind of separated out and the right side gets fuzzy. So here the back's separated out, the front's still attached, so it's about 25, and it should be about 25, it should be the same range as the other one. It's actually a little more, I think. Okay, so let's give it 27. Three thousand? Maybe it is 3k. Actually, you know what, it probably is 3k. I stand corrected. But yeah, definitely isn't 4,000. So like you can see how winding the range up further is not making things any better. Um, that's the cutoff you're looking for. When the image stops getting clearer is usually as close as you're going to get for some targets. Why doesn't it look crisp at the correct range? Because the way they did this effect is some shader trickery. To actually do this properly, you would have to render the whole scene twice, which is an optimization nightmare. Um, the game would run like shit. Um, so instead of doing that, what they do is they use a fancy shader algorithm to distort the image and make it look as though it's doubled, but only within a certain area. Um, and it's usually pretty reliable, but it doesn't always work 100%, especially if there's an object like on the top of a hill or against certain backdrops, and I think trees fuck with it a bit too. So it's basically the best solution they could do without tanking your frames. I think the T64 uses a similar solution where it's just a very fancy shader that kind of fakes the effect. So here we go. You can range off tree trunks too if you, like, are careful. So uh, we'll call that... I want to aim at the base of the tree. Call that... about... 17 or 1800. It was 17 or 1800. So a lot of the time if I'm in a defensive position and I know the enemy's got like a you know a minute or two before they turn up and there's a tree with an exposed trunk or like the side of a building or something, I'll just range off that um, so I'm already pre-sighted when they appear. It's a pretty handy thing to be able to do. Anyway, let's do some missions. Um, we'll do some instant action and then we might pick up my campaign because I think I'm running a packed campaign at the moment and it's going reasonably well it could be going better but it's going reasonably well um, task of breaking through a thin part of the enemy lines in order to fo uh, for follow on friendly forces to exploit the gaps enemy is not expecting a push in this sector and maybe in a varying state of disarray Got four Bradleys let's do this one this one's kind of a turkey shoot, but we'll do this one. Get some chadly action in. So we're going to switch to thermals on low, uh, like low magnification, wide field of view, and day sight on high magnification. Because we scan with the thermals and then we engage with the day sight, identify and engage with the day sight. It's the best way to do things pretty much. 
We want to pick up a little more speed, we don't want to be too slow. Torrid inertia is not implemented yet, there was some code refactoring that needed to happen with the fire control systems to get that to work. We'll just drop artillery on the expected enemy position there. Um, just to, just in case, just to suppress, screen their view a bit. Um, so, that's a thing that will be coming at some point, just don't know when. But the devs are aware of it and it will happen. We got somebody there, hello. Commander didn't see him, but I sure did. Oh, and we got a jet. There's also a binocular overlay now, by the way. Oh, it's a phantom. Looks like a West German phantom with cluster bombs. The bad no-no. He's off to make some tank commanders cry. I think he's got a wingman. Oh, he does. There we go. What a beauty. Okay. Let's keep pushing. Oh shit. I probably should have waited for the fire command, but... So the deep lore behind this mission is that these guys are kind of disorganized and we've broken through their lines, so that's why you're going to see a lot of stuff kind of driving around a bit aimlessly or confused looking, is because they have no idea what the fuck's going on. They just know that there's uh, angry chadleys somewhere in their area looking to fuck, and they don't want any part of it. So there's the first position, that Artie's dropping on the back slope. Well, not the back slope ahead of us, but like two back slopes behind. Oh, hello. Don't think I don't see you. Now, this is calibrated for the hull height of a BMP-1. So, he's a bit taller than a BMP-1. I'd say he's probably about 1,200. He's close to battle sight range, so we'll just give him some ranging shots. That's pretty good. And good effect on target. The commander in this early Bradley doesn't have any thermal view or anything, he's just rely, uh, relying on basically, um, you know, a day sight. In fact, I'm not even sure if he has. Yeah, he's got a couple periscopes. Uh, and he's got an extension for the gunner's sight, so he can see the extension of the gunner's perspective, I think with the thermals included. But he has no ability to independently scan with thermals, so you'll notice I'm spotting a lot of stuff before the commander calls it out, simply because I have thermals and he doesn't. There's also the um, dilemma of not wanting to make the commander so effective that he's basically wall hacks. On the other hand, he saw that one before I did. Oh shit. Just to make sure. There we go. Evil little fucking things, those. They spotted us, we're getting artilleried. Keep eyes left as we come up on that. I'm gonna artillery that farm, just in case there's something nasty hiding behind a berm or behind a building. And we'll scan left as we come around this corner. We still got all our Bradleys with us. How's the stream? Is it still looking okay? Or is it getting stuttery? Because sometimes GH, PC, and OBS don't get along. Fire. 
Must be nice to be like a single game streamer, like somebody that only plays Counter-Strike or whatever, because you only have to do your OBS settings once and you never have to touch them again. But if you play a lot of different games, you've got to constantly fuck with your OBS. It's a bit of a pain in the backside. We'll do a restock here in a moment. I'll just clear this area. So they didn't just add a binocular overlay for the commander, but they also increased the magnification, so now the uh, commander can see a little better into the distance. And of course, when the um, the roles are separated out, so you can get multi-crew, where there's somebody playing a commander and somebody separate playing a gunner, it should make the role very useful with a human friend in the seat. Let's keep an eye in that direction, just in case. It's a kind of nasty little place I'd expect something to pop out from. But I think we're good. Scan right. Get the gun back up there, and we'll just keep an eye on this ridge as we pass it. I think we're okay. So I'm taking my time, there's no rush to complete most of these missions, and once especially infantry are in, rushing is going to get you killed. Really badly. Like, you can see how much forest there is around here, how many buildings overlook, like, open, open areas, open valleys, whatever. This is the kind of country infantry love, because they can kill tanks in it very well. Ambush them all over the place. Motherfucker, you've got to be shitting me. The fuck do you think you're going? Bruh. They almost got away with that, too. That's the fucking frustrating thing. There's the other one. Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm going to just halt here for a moment, and we're going to quickly restock. I say quickly restock. It takes quite a while in the Bradley to link the uh, AP ammo up, but... Even though we're really exposed in the middle of this field, I'm reasonably confident we've cleared it. I've got three other Bradleys to cover me while I'm doing this, and uh, we are terrain masked from that farm, which is the enemy's most likely position other than one of these tree lines. And if they were in one of these tree lines, uh, well, first of all, they're not, because infantry haven't been added yet. Uh, and second of all, if they were, we would be dead by now. Like, this is a point-blank shot for any anti-tank weapon that infantry carry. It's probably not even 200 meters. 300, maybe. Maybe, probably not, like 150-200 I reckon, which is basically point blank. So we've already dumped Artie on that. As we get over this crest, we might drop some in there, depending. We'll probably drop some in that, either in that forest there, or maybe in that group of buildings there. Now again, I know infantry aren't in yet, so dropping artillery on forests is pretty much pointless, because there's nothing in there unless a vehicle got stuck, but I'm trying to get into the habit of acting like the infantry are in-game. Because if I don't get in the habit of doing that, uh, once the infantry are in the game, I'm gonna have a really fucking bad time. And I want to be the guy teasing everyone else for having a really fucking bad time when that happens, while crowing about, ooh, infantry aren't that hard, just get good, haha. So it would not do well for me to get my own ass handed to me by angry little men with uh, funny green tubes hiding in the trees. So the farm's just over this rise here. We're going to have to... We could go through this kind of low ground here between the uh, tree lines, but we'll go through the farm. Presumably, depending if we were... I mean, even if we were M3s, we'd have infantry aboard, but just less of them. Depending if we were M2s or M3s, we'd probably actually debus infantry on the back slope here and get them to walk through the fucking farm with us to make sure it's actually clear.
Okay, we've got a pretty small gap to squeeze through, so I'm going to get these guys into a column. Push through here. I just see a dust trail over there. Hmm. So we'll drop artillery, uh, probably like there. It'll get both the edge of the forest and the buildings. <laughs> yeah, in amongst all the ammunition. It's so funny when you hit Bradleys in this. Like, you hit them with any weapon and you just... It looks like a fireworks factory exploding. There's just orange shit everywhere. It's incredible. Like, you hit a tank and you're like, oh, maybe did it penetrate? Did it not penetrate? Is it going to blow up? Is it, like, what happened? You hit a Bradley, you know. You know that you hit the Bradley. So does everyone else within, like, ten miles. They are absolute glass cannons. I mean, the BMPs go up pretty convincingly too, but not quite to the same level as these. We'll go to the right rather than snake through that narrow gap there. We'll go down through the open field, um, past the farm that this artillery will hopefully be softening up for us. And it gives us more clearance for the tree line. Hey! I forgot to deploy these guys back to a better formation, but also... It keeps happening! him some extra two. Yeah, okay, he's been dealt with. Jesus Christ. Oh! That was a bad noise. That was a very bad noise. There's a BMP. Shit. Shit, he got my lead Bradley. Uh, we'll just bail these guys out and then we'll go to this guy. He's got two of them? Jesus. Like I said, when the Bradley gets hit, you fucking know about it. There's two of them. Oh fuck, that's a tank? Well then, um, that didn't go so well. I think I've only played this mission once before, and it went very well. This time, not so much. I was so busy occupied with the trucks that, um, I got baited right into an ambush. And, uh, Ghost Rider over here is gonna just roll down the hill straight into their position. Which is always kind of morbidly cool. Yeah, damn trucks. The damage log on this is going to be immense because it's a Bradley, so the 25 mil rounds don't count as small arms or small caliber, but there are a lot of them, so you have to go through a shit ton of shots. I could filter out my own only, but let's skip through it. Warp speed 9. I could do a rerun of the mission, and if I was playing off stream, off stream, I normally would. But since I want to limit the uh, the the um, remaining runtime of the stream, shall we say, I don't want to be streaming all night, and I will if I'm not careful. Um, we'll just skip ahead, and I'll do this one successfully another day. Otherwise, I'll get hung up on trying to do it like cleanly and get a perfect run on it. So let's do. What else do we have? Marketable Mayhem. Seize with assaulting before- okay, we've got M60A3s for this. Let's do this one. We'll do this and then we'll do, I think, one or two packed campaign missions of my current campaign, and then we'll probably call the stream there. Um, and we'll probably squeeze in a bit more Gun and Heat PC next stream, in between all the other things I want to do. 
This one can get a little sketchy as well, because we've got to roll up on a pretty exposed position, or, you know, it wants us to roll up on a fairly exposed position and begin engaging. Let me see what these guys are doing. Okay, they're in line formation. We'll keep them in line formation. That's him. Solid hit. Jesus, BMPs are out for my blood. I would like to be able to tell my dudes to independently just start doing berm drills or find some hull down or whatever, but that'll come eventually. Don't know when, just eventually. Where? Oh shit, you saw him? Fuck, I barely see him. Interesting he didn't call that here. Looks like it might have ricocheted off his roof. That probably uh, crushed into him. Crushed the shoulder fuse. What's that? Another phantom. A lot of phantoms today. So, um, with the AI, it's slowly improving. And, like, the things like the shaky sights and such, I'm having to really start moving more. I can't just rely on popping over a berm and, you know, quickly lining everything up like ducks in a row and slapping them using quick gunnery. I'm having to actually move, otherwise I will get my shit wrecked. So I'm not really sticking around to see the effect of my hits. I'm just rolling up, spotting the target, Firing and getting back into cover as quickly as possible. I think... I think we're okay. The immediate er uh, area has been purged. I'm just going to put another round into that guy, because although he told me to cease fire, he isn't popped yet, and I don't trust that. Might take another, that looked like it just winged off his armor. That has to be enough, surely. Uh, we'll give him one more. So we'll give him right on the top of the turret. And it's over. Okay, one more. We'll drop it a bit. And yeah, you might say it's wasting ammo, but you don't want to, like, not do this and then realize, oh shit, that guy was actually still alive, which I've had happen to me a couple times. We'll give it a moment. We're going to drop artillery on this expected enemy position here just to screen our movement. And while we're restocking, shouldn't really be doing this. Oh, fuck me. We lost one. Uh, shouldn't be doing this while restocking, but I do want to get some movement on. So we're going to push up to battle position Charlie. We're going to hold down on this crest to what extent we can. It's probably better if I drive forwards. There's a bit of a ditch in front of me. There we go. That was a solid hit. Um... We'll get these guys kind of onto this spot. There's like a slight backslope on this terrain that I can kind of use, maybe. It's better than nothing. Okay, that'll do for these guys. I'll leave them there, and then we take the second platoon. Get this guy set up. And we go for objective savage. So we basically want to push along this ridge past the other platoon, past the first platoon, and then bust down along the ridge line into this position here. Did 
this has actually been a decent run so far. Usually when I play this mission off stream, I've typically lost at least two M60s by this point out of the first platoon. So we've only lost one and I'll take that. I'd rather lose zero, but I'll take one. Those of you who haven't seen the game for a while, um, oop, that's a tree. You may notice the smoke effects have been upbeat a bit. They look pretty good now. Smoke's much more solid and oily looking. The fire effects get better pretty much every patch. Um, so do the hit effects. They look really swank now. And you'll notice the red text is gone at last. Thank fuck. And already people are complaining and trying to game it back in, like trying to figure out how to mod it back in. So, uh, Carvey's got his work cut out for him to figure out how to stop them from being able to do that so they learn to play the game properly. There's low ground here I could move through, which I might actually do. It means I might roll headfirst into something unpleasant when I crest it, but it does mean I'm screened a little more from my left, uh, except from that high ground up there. So that's that expected enemy um, position. Don't see anything there yet. And the other expected en enemy position is that clearing there, I think, or that one there. Might be that one there. Uh, I'm going to put these guys into a wedge, just so that we've got some sort of flank security going on. Because I don't really know what I'm driving into. There is a heat signature over there, but I think it is that BMP that refused to blow up but was knocked out. I think... You know what? Fuck it. It's not like the US is going to be that short on ammo yet. Oh, ammo shortage has been added to the campaign, by the way. If you uh, fuck up the US supply, either playing as the US or against the US, they'll end up on, I think, 774 instead of 833. So they'll have their older ammunition. Still decent, but nowhere near as potent as uh, 833. You'll have to kiss your lovely uranium rods goodbye. He's got to be dead, man. We'll give him one more. Yeah, he's he has to be cooked. There's no way he's still got anyone alive inside him. His hatches are popped, so we don't need to worry too much about him. So you can report the enemies bringing in reinforcements. Uh, but from where? That is the question. Armoured reinforcements, my favourite kind. We'll stay in the low ground here, just so our flanks are kind of screened. Well, our right flank at least. Oh shit, there we go. They're coming up over this crest. And they're engaging first platoon, so we'll drop Artie on him, we'll push up their flank. We might be able to pop him, but we're probably going to take losses from first platoon. I just heard an ATGM as well, so there's a BMP back here somewhere probably. That's a knocked out 55, that's a dead BMP. The live 55s are behind the berms though, they're all, like next to them. There he is. Oh, that did not go so well. Yes, I'm aware. There we go. The other one's back behind there. Let's make sure there's nothing back there that's going to pop us in the back as we press this. F 
fuck, darn thing caught aren't say you're One more to be sure. Now we go to the backup site because I'm going to be super close to this guy and I want to be able to check the clearance of the gun over the terrain. Like so. That looks like a solid hit. It was a solid hit. Let's watch that right side. Are we okay? There's... we're missing one. We're missing one. Oh, there he is. He's popped. He, uh, his crew jumped. Hopefully some survived. Is he up? No, he's bailed. We'll put a shot in just in case. Now he's definitely bailed. He's knocked out. I need to get out of this artillery, which is my own artillery, I think, actually. Who's screaming? Uh, my commander was yelling. Unless there's like some screaming in the background which I can't hear, in which case it's probably my neighbours, I don't know. <laughs> neighbours kids or something. So yeah, we lost an M60 out of this platoon, I'm not sure how we're going- oh fuck me. First platoon got absolutely trashed, they've only got their leader left. Which was the uh, tank I was originally driving. That's not good. Alright, we're gonna go back to our thermal site. Yeah, he's knocked out. Crew are probably all dead. But you know what? You can never be too careful in this game. You really can never be too careful. Just to make sure. Rest of my platoon are back there somewhere, or what's left of them. Objective Savage is just over this crest. So we'll just keep an eye out to the left in case there's something flanking, and then we'll hook around it following this uh, road, or like paralleling this road. It means we're going to get very close to some tree lines, but it's probably the best way to do it. Because if I just roll over the top of the hill, I don't know what's there. I might drive straight into a tank or a BMP or something. Which I do not want. Okay. That looks alright. That looks clear. Hey, there we go. We took the objective. Let's just make sure there's nothing nasty hiding here. There was. Got off one last defiant shot. But I don't think he hit anything. Or he didn't kill anybody at least. Jesus. Alright, let's have a look at uh, what's left on the battlefield. So he was in that position there dug in alongside the road. 
There's my remaining tanks of my second platoon. I'm curious where these reinforcements came in from. They must have slipped in along the low ground. Um, either they were on the back slope of the hill already, and they just rolled into position, or they came down through there and first platoon didn't see them until they crested. Because, yeah, first platoon, uh, they would kind of see down that valley, but not very well because of the tree line there. So they might have reinforced them down there, like come down the road and then popped off of it. Because if they came over the hill, we would have seen them, right? But they didn't. They must have come along that road and then through the low ground behind the tree line up to this hill. Let's do a quick survey of the carnage. And we'll go have a look at the um, friendly position. See what's left. Probably not much. So it was not a good day for the East Germans. The um, turrets have a bit of an LOD issue, I'll have to check and see if anyone's reported that, and if not, I'll report it. It's an on-again, off-again thing. The uh, turret LODs somehow become inside-out for some vehicles. There's another guy up here. Pulled by his lonesome. And then this is my uh, second platoon M60 that got knocked out. So he probably got tracked or had his gun damaged or something and the crew would have just jumped because it's not worth staying in the vehicle if you can't fight back and you're really badly exposed. They got a nice little ditch there they could have run into and hidden in front of the tank and they could have also run down behind it into the low ground. So they were kind of protected, I guess, when they bailed out. So there he is. He would have probably been hit in the side of the turret by one of the first T-55s to roll over that hill. And you can see my survivors over there. So that's the rest of us over there. And then uh, first platoon should be on the back slope of this hill. And you can already see that they have had a really bad day. Interestingly, um, the platoon commander came out all right, even though his tanks pointed backwards. Um, I think these two just got hit by crossing shots, which he was actually kind of protected from, if that makes sense. Or maybe they just didn't see him. Because this guy, yeah, like that's that smoke you see over there is the enemy position, so they had direct line of sight to him. Would have shot him easily. Um, and then the other guy that was knocked out, same thing, they got direct line of sight to him. Easy kill. But the platoon commander, I wonder if there's a tree blocking their line of sight or something, or if he just got really lucky. Maybe he just got really lucky. Because he probably shouldn't have survived that, being in the position he's in. And the last guy, or the first one to get knocked out, was this guy over here from first platoon. So like I said, the uh, the smoke effects got overhauled pretty nicely. A lot thicker and oilier now, kind of more befitting a knocked out tank. Now with that done, let's look at the after action. So the first shot of the engagement, um, he got hit in the side by a T-55. So that would have uh, immobilized him. And that was what killed him. BMP. People kind of sleep on the BMP. That thing is really nasty. It's hard to see, it's hard to hit if it's dug in like this. Um, and you've got to remember, these are, these are like actual berms, they're not proper um, hold down positions that are physically dug into the ground. So these don't offer a lot of protection, they're mostly just concealment. But even with these, you can barely see the BMP over the top of it. But he can very easily see you. And he can hit you. 
and uh, it, it doesn't take much to get through an M60's armor. They're big tanks, but they're not especially strongly armored, especially on the hull. And so the BMP can quite easily get a good hit on them, get a round through. So that would have immobilized... In fact, that hit a propellant casing. Peace came through the floor and hit a propellant casing, so he would have been the second to get knocked out. Oh, actually, no. Sorry, that's the same guy. Okay, so this is the same guy. He's He's been uh, fucked on twice in a you know, in a row, in quick succession now. So he was eating the... Again, he's eating the shots for everyone else. He must have just been the first guy they saw, and they all shot at him at the same time. Because, uh, boy, he's... He, he ain't doing too well. He really ain't doing too well. And you can see, because we can't really see these guys very easily, it's hard for us to return effective fire on them. Because we can basically only see the tops of their turrets, and only barely. That was a decent shot. So this is a heat round failing to detonate, it's crushed by impact angle, because the, um, the M456 doesn't have shoulder fuses, it only has the fuse on the nose of the round. So if the nose of the round doesn't contact the armor, the round just crushes, it doesn't go off. And it's really annoying trying to hit BMPs with heat at longer ranges because you will just get it doing that repeatedly. Well, especially even not longer ranges, but short ranges because it flies so flat when it's in close. Longer, at least you've got a bit of an arc to work with, but up close it's just not going to do much, just like that. That was a much better hit. So yeah, this guy didn't cook off, I think. This is the guy that didn't cook off, but his crew was completely fucked. They were all dead. So this is where the second tank that was knocked out from 1st Platoon got hit. He got focus fired by a couple of T-55s all at once. This was um, the guy that was moving up with me actually got hit by a Malyuka. I thought he got hit by a BMP or a tank round, but he got hit by a Malyuka and somehow didn't blow up, which is impressive. It looks like it just narrowly avoided hitting... Well, it hit some ammunition, but it must have only started a very small fire that went out by itself, because he wasn't cooked off. He got pretty lucky, it looks like most of the crew got out. So that was him getting hit. That was uh, first platoon, third tank to get killed. And then this is us cleaning up the reinforcements. Done. So let's have a look at another one maybe, and then we'll do a couple of quick packed campaign missions. Um, Momentous Maniac, your task was seizing a small hamlet in the hill behind it from the enemy. Enemy entrenched armor consisting of two to three T55As, two BMP1s, two to four BTR, 60 P uh, PBs. That's a bit of a typo there. And some dismounted ATGM teams. We've got some Bradleys too. Oh, I remember this mission. Okay, yeah, let's do this one. It's a similar mission, it's just with Abrams and Bradleys and in different terrain. So they've uh, rearranged some of the mission order and they've added some new missions that are kind of like introduction to gunnery, basically, to help ease new players into the game. So they don't just immediately get in over their head and start freaking out. Uh, I'm gonna... Call artillery on that. Should probably call it on that, because that's probably an enemy position as well. I know they're an objective dog. That's... Oh shit! Where? Oh, 
I think he's knocked out. We'll give him another. Call that good enough. That was a nasty little surprise. Oh, and we've got aircraft again. And my M1s are having a bit of a moment. We'll just hold here and let them reorg. Actually, I shouldn't hold here. I'm in the middle of an arty strike. Ooh, MiG-23BN, my beloved. There's another one. I don't see the second one, but I hear him. There he is. Anyway, we should probably scan for targets on the ground. There's not much we can do about those guys, and they will ignore us for now. It's a bit of a berm there I might be able to get behind, so we might head for that. That's what I want. Get the normal day site back. We don't need the backup anymore. Because so we're going to probably be uh, pretty clear of the burn when we begin firing again. Oops. Something else down there I don't see. Looks like another tank, maybe. PC. Oh. Just give it a bit of a sprint up. There's a BMP down there as well, I can hear it. Wait, no, that's a tank. Shit. I hear something cooking. I think one of my Abrams got hit. I'm quite sure one of my Abrams got hit. Oh, yes. Man's cooking. The AI is still obviously works in progress. They're not as bad with driving into trees as they used to be, but they still do it from time to time. And the tree collision is uh, a bit of an annoying issue to fix, I'm told. Okay, I'm just going to get these guys set up in a little bit of a slight hold down position here, so they have something at least. And then we'll switch over to the Chadleys to clear out the remaining objectives. There we go. So the Abrams is strong, but it's not invincible, contrary to popular belief. Not even from the front, let alone from the side or rear. And these are um, early M1s, the original model M1 and the M1IP. They're not M1A1s or M1A2s or Tusks or fucking Seps or whatever. They're, they're old boys. Still very good armor for their day, but no tank is invincible. Okay, I'm going to drop artillery on the objective. As we push down towards it. There's the BMP Rex. Might get these guys uh, a little closer. Actually, I think that's as close as I can get them. Yeah, 25 meters. They just look further away because the Bradleys are, uh, I don't know, funnily proportioned. 
I might actually put them into column to get through these trees. Just so there's less risk of them getting hung up on them, and then I'll fan them back out into, I think, line or wedge on the other side. Line is useful for getting all of your guns up front, so if you're expecting to run into a bunch of enemies, you get all your guns on line, and you can just maximize your firepower. Uh, a la Soviets slash East Germans slash any other Pact nation following Soviet doctrine. But with Wedge, you've got a bit more flank security, although it's a little harder to get clear shots forwards from the guys that are on the flanks. So if you're in unknown, open terrain, you use Wedge. If you're um, kind of like, if your flanks are covered already, like you've got, um, you're in low ground or something, or you've got something screening you physically, or at least with fire, or smoke or whatever, um, you can use the line to get more forwards firepower. So that's our objective there. Our next objective is just on the other side of that patch of trees, so I don't want to get too far around it and expose myself to that yet. But I also don't want to get too close to this and get rolled up on by like an angry ATGM guy or something. We're missing... oh, there we go. I was going to say we're missing a Bradley, but nope, he's just playing catch-up. He's a bit slow, which is a mood, honestly. It's, you know, we're all like that sometimes, me especially. Hello? Just get a bunch of rounds into him, just in case. kind of skylining here to the town, but we already hit that with Artie and the tanks are overwatching it, so we should be okay. Did I just see movement? Might have been that guy's cook off bamboozling me. Most of the missions at this point are slightly randomized, so you never quite 100% know what you're going to get. And the game will catch you out. It will catch you napping and it will do very unpleasant things to you when it does. Okay, that's clear, that's clear, that looks clear. Anything behind here? Speak now, forever hold your peace. You saw something. Oh shit, I drove right past it! Fuck me! Jesus, good thing he wasn't paying attention. Because I sure as fuck wasn't. <laughs> there was, um... When the AI pathfinding was even more janky than it currently is, I had one campaign reconnaissance in force mission. And it was a pair of Bradleys, and so my platoon mate just randomly, halfway through the mission, fucked off into the trees. Like, he literally just went, nope, 90 degree turn into the trees at high speed. And I didn't see him again until right at the end of the mission, as I'd completed everything myself and was driving back to the uh, exfil area. Oh, fuck. Coax? No, bro, we're using HE. Fuck that. <sighs> um, yeah, right as I was about to finish the mission, driving back to like the area you had to to go to to complete it i just see him come bucketing out of the trees and rejoin my formation i don't know if you've ever seen buffalo soldiers but the scene with the fucking tank where they're all sh you know shooting up heroin in the tank on an exercise that scene that was the first thing that came to mind
Oh, hello. roll up onto this bridge and clear the area. See if there's any other trucks or anything hiding in the low ground on the far side and uh, we'll check the after action. We'll do a bit of a fly around then we'll check the after action. There's expected enemy showing over this ridge so we might push through to the ridge and just hold that or like the not ridge but it's like a high ground. The high ground. We'll go there. Losing my ability to English as if I had one in the first place. a little. I think we've cleared everything out. Nothing shooting at us, which is generally a good sign. Just make sure there's nothing lurking on the back slope of this, and then we are done with this mission. And it is worth doing this, like pushing out and checking the area around the mission objective, because sometimes you will find stragglers, or you'll find a guy that's just sitting there waiting. Waiting for his chance. But it looks clear enough to me. I won't drive all the way down the bottom of the valley. We're good enough here. So, uh, we can check out our platoon. We got all four Bradleys made it, which is always nice. Then over here we've got two toasty BMPs. Very toasty. Two trucks down here. I always feel kind of bad for the truck guys. Like, they've got no way of fighting back. They just have to run and hope for the best. It looks like this guy actually bailed out, so he might have survived. Um, this guy, on the other hand, I don't have high hopes for. There's no body. There's no body. He must have fucking jumped as well. He must have been quick about it. Because that truck caught fire pretty fast. And then if we go... Uh, down here... This is our little enemy position in this town. So there's one BTR cooking away. There's a T-55 that we popped. He was probably what got our Abrams. Um, there's this guy. This guy, I didn't even see him. One, one of my uh, platoon mates must have got him. Same with the other T-55, I only saw one. So one of the AI must have popped them for me. What is this game? It's gonna heat PC. Uh, it's, it's like, a, I don't know if you would have played them, but Back in the like late 90s, early 2000s, uh, 2000s, when Sims were like the big genre that everyone was into, um, there were games called things like Armored, I think it was Armored Fist or Armored Fury, I think it was Armored Fist, and M1 Tank Platoon 2, 
which is the one I grew up playing. I didn't play uh, Armored Fist. Um, and they were kind of like... They were tank simulators, but they weren't like Steel Beasts level, where you have to actually understand how the inside of the tank is arranged, and what the controls are and all that shit. You just had to know how the fire control system worked in a broad sense, what the tank's armor scheme was in a broad sense, and what the tank was good at in a broad sense. And you would use like... that knowledge with a, a pretty kind of fluid gameplay to um, play out different historical or what-if scenarios with combined arms gameplay with infantry, aircraft, tanks, etc. over large maps. This is the spiritual successor to all those games of the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, it is very much a tank sim. It's a sim light because, you know, it's not like Steel Beast level uh, systems fidelity, but it's it's very much a sim. It's not uh, not trying to be like the snail game where it's arena deathmatch. It's... Uh, it's a battlefield. You're given an actual battlefield with actual objectives, and uh, at the moment it's versing AI only, there's no PvP yet. There may or may not be PvP in the future, it depends how well they can integrate it with the intended gameplay without the player base turning it into tank vs tank arena deathmatch. Um, there is co-op planned, and not only co-op, but multi-crew co-op, so you'll be able to pile into a tank or a BMP or a Bradley or whatever with your mates. Um, it's made by a very small team, it's just released into Early Access at the end of last year, and uh, this game is very promising. This is one of the few games I'm actually excited for these days. Uh, one of my longtime mates is working on it, he's actually the reason I found out it existed. He's like, hey, check out this thing I'm working on. Um, and I saw the first couple of sort of, uh, I guess, teaser videos for it. Um, and I was sold on the concept immediately because like I said I grew up playing in one tank platoon 2 and I really really had a lot of nostalgia for that game It was a really good game And graphics aside it still holds up remarkably well so a Natural successor to that is exactly the kind of thing I'm into So there's oh, geez. oh Jesus there's been a, uh, a lot of shots fired so most probably that'll be all from the Bradleys, so we can skip through the M1 shots pretty quick. So that was that guy getting domed. Like I said, I didn't even see this one, but he got erased pretty quickly. Wait, there were three of them? Huh. Okay, I guess there were. I'm curious to see... oh, there it is. This is what knocked him out. Okay. Quick lesson. Quick lesson for aspiring tankers. Uh, so, um... There might have been former squad devs involved, so I'm pretty sure that they know how to avoid the pitfalls that have happened to squad. Um, one of which was telling publishers that no, they won't let themselves be bought out. They're funding the game, you know, through um, community support and now through sales on Steam. So that their artistic vision doesn't get compromised in the name of fucking emote packs or whatever. So here we see a wonderful thing called don't sit still with an enemy tank looking at you because he will gradually walk his shots in until eventually he hits gold. Like I said, the M1's strong, but even frontally, it's not invincible. That's a heat round fusing on one of the driver's episcopes and then straight through the turret ring. War Thunder things? War Thunder came after all of this stuff. Like the after action reports, this is from Steel Beasts and other games like that. War Thunder... How do I put this um, diplomatically? War Thunder cribbed off a lot of existing games but brought it to the normie audience. Like, this this has been a thing for a long time, um, this sort of after-action view. Like, the x-ray view of the internals of the tank and what damage was done, or where around hit and what damage was done. War Thunder kind of made it more showy and made it more accessible, and that's why people associate it with War Thunder. But War Thunder, I'm gonna be real, didn't really do anything particularly original, and still hasn't in a lot of ways. Uh, in fact, I have been told um, not from the devs, mind you, I heard this from somebody else in the community, that apparently War Thunder um, is getting an update soon where, at least for the ships, and I think later the tanks and aircraft, the crew voices will become more intense the more shit is going down around them, which, uh, wow, I wonder which game introduced that feature. 
Uh, it's with a 105mm gun. The 120mm gun wasn't on the M1 when this happened, so this is like... This is set in 1985 in the Folder Gap. The M1A1 with the 120mm gun didn't arrive in Europe until 1987. Um, so don't expect to see M1A1s in this theatre, you might see them later, because they want to do... To, to kind of give you a concept of how this game's meant to be played, um, instead of being free to play or having a tech tree or any of that bullshit, you get given, here's the folder gap in 1985. Here's all the vehicles that were likely to be present in, you know, useful numbers. There you go. You have all of it. You don't need to unlock anything. You don't need to buy anything extra. You just, you pay for the game once and you play with it. Um, with that said... Depending on the game's ongoing success, they want to release other theatres of war. So you might get Operation Desert Storm. You might get, like, the Indo-Pakistani Wars of the 1970s. You might get something from, like, I don't know, the Six-Day War or Yom Kippur or something like that. They're not interested in doing World War II because that market's well and truly covered. But any of your sort of Cold War through to modern day tank engagements, except the one that's currently a bit too politically hot to touch... Um, we all know which one. Um, those are probably going to come into the game at some point in the future. Again, depending on how much um, the game's able to keep selling and, and how eager people are to play different theatres. But for now, the first one they've chosen is Full Gap 1985, and so no 120mm Abrams. There will be 120mm Leopards, I think the 2A3. Um, and no Apaches, but there will be Cobras. No T-80U either. There will be T-80B and T-64A and maybe T-64B, but no uh, no T-80U. And no explosive reactive armor, because neither side were using it in Europe at this time. Yeah, it's it's not quite as in-depth as Steel Beast, so like you don't have the full inter uh, interior of the vehicle, you don't have like all of the every little detail 100% modeled inside the tank, but the actual mechanics, like the movement of the vehicles, the... Um, the ballistics modeling, the fire control systems, all of that is supposed to be up to the same sort of standard. It's just you don't have the interior of the turret and the clickable buttons and everything. So for a DCS player perspective, like imagine this being like FC3, but for tanks. Or something like, you know, strike fighters, but for tanks. It's, it's a lower level of like really overly detailed systems fidelity, but they want to get the feeling and they want to get the like the context of these machines and why they were designed the way they were. So yeah, these are all going to be Bradley shots, because like I said, the 25mm, um, the Bushmaster fills up the after action report very quickly. Let me skip through these. We actually got a couple of direct hits on the ATIC GM, which I was kind of surprised by, especially with how panicked those shots were. And then this is the last couple of uh, BMPs getting cleaned up. And then the trucks, which uh, thought they could get away from us. How wrong they were. <laughs> hey Seal, thanks for the resub man, good to see you. We uh, played some DCS earlier in the stream. We did some hind. It was very scuffed. I've forgotten everything. You'll have to teach me again. Um, maybe maybe you can sit in the back seat and I'll sit in the front. You can like kick me in the back every time I do something wrong. But we also did some Mirage 2000, which was pretty fun. Multi-threading's been interesting. Um, I didn't notice like a better frame rate or anything on my end because I don't I don't have the counter open. I don't really care what the number is. It just needs to look smooth. But I was rendering so many frames that OBS was dying because TCS was taking up all my GPU resources. Like ah yes, 180 frames a second. Let's go. So I've had to mess with the stream settings and restart it a few times. But um, DCS now seems to get along with CPU encoding, which is nice because it. That's what I usually use for Microsoft Flight Simulator, so I can just leave the settings without having to uh, switch every time I switch sims. Hopefully. Hopefully it goes pretty well, and it doesn't uh, break anything. People complaining the hardware getting high temps. I didn't check the temps on anything. Um, I might have to have a look later. But yeah, be careful what you wish for. 
instead of one core getting nice and toasty warm, it's multiple cores getting nice and toasty warm. I mean, I have a 5800, so my PC is going to naturally run hot. I'm not too worried. As long as it's not into the triple digits. And I used to have, um, maybe not a CPU, but I used to have a video card that ran into triple digits on a hot day, which was to say all of summer. Um, like, my video card on that PC would be running at 105, 110 degrees Celsius all summer long, every summer. I don't know how it didn't melt. Um, so yeah, we'll, we've done a bunch of missions off that. Uh, let's continue our Warsaw Pack campaign for a couple missions, and I'm going to hop off. We've almost won this campaign anyway, so... Uh, let's do... Let's do a reconnaissance in force. And then we might do like a raid or a spoiling attack. Spoiling attacks are pretty fun. People not understanding that nothing bad can happen. There's safeguards built in on software levels and hardware levels and being like, oh, my CPU will burn. Yeah, like when you get the warning, oh, your CPU is a bit hot, it's still got a long way to go before it starts melting. But like on one of my old PCs, I had to specifically disable a bunch of the built-in safeguards because it would still be like 20 or 30 degrees until it started being at risk of damage, but it would be so hot that it would be, you know, kind of at that warning threshold all the time. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to put these guys into a column formation. I already see enemy. We're going to drop artillery kind of in that general area. Uh, we're going to cross over here. It's kind of exposed. We might get hit on the way through. The point of this, and this is something I need to constantly remind myself, is this is a reconnaissance in force, not a kill everything. So it's better if I preserve my vehicles and just spot where the enemy are. I don't need to actually kill them. And I don't need to use the BRDMs to kill them. I can move up the tanks and BMPs if I want to do that. As tempting as it is to just go murder mode, sometimes it's not the best course of action. Um, and sometimes it's better to preserve your own force. Now, having said that, if you can get a bunch of kills on American armor, especially because the American stuff, like... They can't replace it as easily. Um, it's worth doing. But for the most part on these reconnaissance missions, you just want to be kind of scouting. Oh, and they spotted us crossing the field, so they're dropping Artie on our last known position. That's okay, because we're in the forest now. This would be, like, I'd be a little worried about enemy infantry in this forest if they were in the game yet, but for now, we can kind of get away with this. And the thing with the BRDM is, it's a very, kind of, not cheap vehicle, but the point of the BRDM is to drive way ahead of the main force, figure out where the enemy are, where the enemy aren't, how determined the enemy are to fight for different terrain features and objectives, and then report back, and also figure out if the area is contaminated, if there's been any CBRN contamination. That's the BRDM's job. It's not to fight, although it might be able to do a little bit of light fighting where it can. But it's mostly just the eyes and ears of the main force, and it's way ahead of them. Like, running way ahead of them. I think we scared him away. I think we actually scared him away. Which is good. We're gonna move up. And we're going to stay on the other side of this tree line to where he was. Yeah, it's like my MiG-21 engine. The more you run it at full throttle, the uh, faster it degrades. <laughs> but having said that, like, like I said, I had a video card that would run over 100 degrees all summer long, every summer. And that video card was retired gracefully several years later when I finally could afford an upgrade. It did not die on me. Um, in fact, I think the only things I've ever had die on me have been power supplies, because I used to have a habit of buying cheap ones, which I learnt from my mistakes. Uh, and I think that's it. Power supplies and maybe one or two motherboards, because a cheap power supply nuked them. I'm sure I just jinxed myself by saying that, but generally I've, I've been okay with PC parts for the most part. Which is weird, because I don't really take that good of care of them. Oh, hello. He might actually see us, so we need to engage him. He can uh, fuck us up with that 50 cal, but we can also fuck him up with our 14.5mm. We're 
We're going to drop artillery back there. And keep moving through this forest. See if we can flank around him a bit. And any friends he might have, because he probably will have friends. Okay, he's not shooting at us. I think we bagged his gunner. We may have got the driver as well. Okay, they've seen us. They're calling artillery. Oh shit. There's a couple of them. And now I'm on reload. Fuck, 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 fuck. Whoops, what am I doing? What am I aiming at? There we go. Another one. Okay, the left side looks clear. Right side, maybe. We'll go for this tree line here. And then we might move up our. Uh, other reconnaissance forces, our BMP and our, uh, or oh, sorry, our tank and our BMPs. Is he active? We'll give him a drive by just in case. Well, he's definitely not active now. fire off that shot so I can get that gun reloading. Yeah, he's definitely not active. Oof. Ghost Rider. He's burnt out. He's got a dead gunner, but I don't know if his driver's still up. Don't think so. He's not reacting, so he's probably dead. One. Can't see shit through the trees. Okay, those look like good hits. I see sparks. Sparks are good news. Sure, if he's down there, we'll slowly peek out. Don't see him anymore. That's one. What we're going to do is we'll drop artillery on that town and we'll bring up our other forces. I'm going to move these guys into here. There we go. So these guys have been hidden on the back slope, now we'll bring them up. Yeah, so they increased the magnification on the T-72 site, but they haven't adjusted the scale of the uh, reticles at all. So that'll probably come before too long, hopefully, because um, it makes shooting the coax a little hard. The way you range find the coax in the T-72 is you range find a gun as normal to figure out what the range is, looking at the, the sort of whiz wheel at the top, and then you reset the range to zero to use the coax, and just shoot with the uh, the sort of waterfall cascade markings down there. 
down along the vertical axis of the site. You don't use the range finder as such to shoot the coax, you only use it to get what the range is, then you shoot the coax by eye. It's uh, kind of ass backwards. The T-72's fire control system is generally kind of ass backwards, it's a bit of a clodge. It's like half a step above World War II technology. It's like, it's like a World War II tank gun sight, but with a fucking laser range finder plugging in the range to it. Um, whereas the T-64B, not the A, but the T-64B and the T-80B have like genuinely modern fire control systems on par with or better than the Abrams, just without thermals. They have a better auto lead system than what the uh, Abrams, well, better, like a more user-friendly auto lead system than what the Abrams has, put it that way. We also have the backup site, air quotes, backup site for the gunner, it's really just his unity site so we can see what's happening outside the tank. There's no real way to aim the tank's gun with this thing if the main gunner's, like if the gunner's primary sight goes down, um, and the gunner's primary sight lives in that little thing you can see in front of us. So um, if you have to resort to that, you're basically correcting by tracer, which is not ideal. We've pretty much cleared this left flank, so we know that we can move through here safely. Um, and our BRDMs are posted up in this little patch of forest here, I think. Pretty sure it's that one. Just past waypoint three. No, no interior models. Um, the thing is, to do a full interior model takes an artist a lot of time, it uses a lot of resources, so it makes like the game run worse if you've got a lot of that on screen. Um, particularly if you want to have like full-scale, proper, you know, like, battalion on company level battles or something like that. At the moment you basically get company minus versus platoon, because that's all the game can handle at the moment. As it gets optimized more it might go up. Um, and you can't really portray Soviet tank doctrine without going to at least battalion scale, probably higher. So, um, it's a trade-off that the devs, especially as a small indie dev team with limited resources, don't really want to make. It's possible that they may model, um, so the, like, the Commander's Cupolas will have, you know, basic vision slits, so there will be Cupolas and stuff like that. But... If they do model interiors for the tanks at all, it'll probably just be super basic. In fact, if I pause the game now, you can kind of see that a lot of the tanks do have a very rudimentary interior for the hull and turret, just because when the turret pops off, you need to see something inside it, right? So this is as much interior as the tank has. If anything, I would say they might model a few more bits of equipment around it, maybe clean up some of these edges around the turret ring, and just make it, like, too dark to see any details. Because that's really all you need, right? You just need to see... Your little um, cupola here, you need to be able to sense that there's a big gun breach next to you, and then just like the gunner's sight. This is really, you know, if you if you use some clever lighting and shadows and stuff, and added a few little bits of extra detail to this, this would be enough, I think. Because the other thing to consider is you need to spend most of your time outside, like looking outside of the tank, either through your optics when you're buttoned up, like the Soviets would be. Um, or, you know, with your head popped out of the hatch like NATO forces typically would be, unless there's a CBRN threat. Because if you're spending all your time admiring the inside of your tank, you're going to get rolled up on. These things can't see very well. Like, if you if you look at a lot of the vehicles in Steel Beast, their, their uh, visibility of the outside world is horrific. You get ambushed really easily. So, even if you had a full interior, you'd probably only look at it at the start of a mission, or like during a, a sort of reprieve between enemy attacks or something. You know, when you don't actually have to be on the lookout for enemy forces. Because if you're looking around the inside of the tank while you're in contact, you're gonna die. We'll drop some more artillery on that town, just because I don't trust it. Somebody saw us, because they're dropping artillery on us. 
yeah, it's um, like it. The graphics might not be the most amazing thing, but they do look pretty nice. And if you want to render like a very large map with a lot of open terrain, which you do need to for tank battles, that's a really challenging thing to do, especially with pretty graphics. There's a reason Steel Beasts looks the way it does, um, and it's taken them a lot of effort to get the game to look this good and still run playably, while also having all the you know ballistic simulation and everything else built into it. Add VR into this game. VR would probably not help in this game. Um, maybe for some vague ability to do like, you know, oh shit, that's an ATGM. Maybe to be able to kind of eyeball the ranges better. Like, that's about it. Because again, with no interiors, uh, VR doesn't have much of a point. That's going to get the other BMP, I think. Did he hit him? He might have survived that. King ATGMs! So, uh, that was something I failed to spot with my BRDMs, and I should have spotted it because now I'm in deep trouble. We just lost both our BMPs, because that probably... Oh no, he's still fighting. Maybe he's engine ate it. How is he still fighting? Is it not fusing? Oh, that got him. Surely. Maybe he's just very lucky. Come on, man. That has to... Yeah, okay, that got him. I'm not sure if the T-72 autoloader sounds final or if it's a placeholder. I think it might be a placeholder, though, because they just got a new sound engineer recently. We're out of heat rounds in this thing. Okay, so we've lost one BMP, we've got one still up. So I did not actually push far enough ahead with my BRDMs to spot all this stuff. I fucked up. Now we're down to Sabo only. What I might do is I'll back the T-72 off a little. And I will grab the BMP manually. Oh yeah, okay, this guy's pretty much disabled. So we'll put him in cover, and what I'll do is I will try and figure out... Okay, they're over there, so I'm going to drop artillery, uh... Shit. I'm going to drop artillery, like, there. Oh, okay, I see why. These guys are in a trench. They're not going to see them because they're on the high ground over there. So that was... Remember I saw a, a um, M113 and I started engaging it? and then just drove into the forest and lost sight of him. Uh, if I would kept pushing, I would have noticed he had an ATGM with him, and then I might not have lost a BMP and had another one crippled. So that'll teach me to not do my reconnaissance job properly. Okay, uh, this is a problem. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to hide this guy in this forest because there's enemy armor incoming, and I don't want to get caught in the open. Whoops, ram into a tree. I might get caught in the open anyway, but I'm going to try and kind of cover myself here and just hope they don't see me. This guy can stay where he is. And we're going to pull the T-72 back because I don't want to lose this. We might be able to ambush those tanks somewhere else. He's engaging, because you can't tell the AI to hold fire yet. But it might at least distract them. Ship boxes have toes. Uh, so they can't actually physically deploy them at the moment. They're just placed next to them in missions. But they will be able to physically deploy them, as well as normal infantry squads with uh, ATGMs and with regular, like, um, you know, M72s and RPGs and things like that. The infantry are coming soon. Don't know when exactly, but soon, and they will really be a big game changer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and put this guy in a position where, as this enemy armor pushes up, 
I can potentially ambush them with the T-72. I'm not going to ambush much with the BRDM because it's already fucked, but we might at least get them with the uh, 72. That tree there looks alright. We'll get him into that tree line. Had the opportunity to drive a T-72 in the Polish army and once in an M1A2 that was on exercises. T-72 is claustrophobic and very uncomfortable, yeah. Um, it's interesting, so the, the um, T-64 is my favourite tank. And it's interesting looking at the T-72 and the T-64 and the little subtle differences in how the interior of the tank is designed. Even though the T-64 is about the same size, um, and it has a lot in common with the T-72, it looks much more comfortable to use. Like it was designed with the crew's comfort in mind a bit more than the 72 was. It's uh, kind of interesting to see. Maybe they're not advancing up this way. Let me switch back to this guy. This is the other one. Is it? Where does he see them? Oh, he's all the way back here. He's all the way back here. He must be going home by himself. He's decided he's going to leave. This guy's K uh, KPV is empty, which is not surprising because he just emptied it into those tanks. Or whatever else is there. If I can get a good look at what's coming and where they're going, I might be able to set up an ambush. If I can ambush them without losing the T-72... There they are, they're M60s. If I can ambush them without losing the T-72, it's worth it, because the Americans uh, feel the losses a lot more than I do. They have to get shit across the Atlantic to reinforce their units, right? Whereas I have plenty of tanks, and I don't need to move stuff across the fucking ocean. So it's more economical for me to just knock them out wherever I can. And if I can trade one T-72 for three or four M60s, it's a good trade. If I can kill three or four M60s without losing the T-72 at all, it's an even better trade. That's a 1-1-3. One, one, I'm curious where exactly they're going to go, because they're just passing the town now. So they're like over here somewhere. I thought you guys had a, like, a locally Yugo built or Yugo upbeat uh, 72 model. It was like the, uh, the M84, I think. It's based on a T72, but it's pretty heavily upgraded. Unless it was a recent export, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if the Russians exported them recently. Where have they gone? They might have gone down the other road. Oh, they're going through the for- oh my god, they're going through the forest. Oh, this is gonna be dirty. Hold my beer, chat. Just don't know if I'll have a clear side of them as they... I don't know if they're going down that far, but if they drive off that side of the hill, we can shoot them in the back as they pass. Or, if they stay on the hill, we can roll down the road behind them. So we'll wait here a minute and we'll see what they do. only Leopard 2A4, 2A5, 2PL, T72 and PT91 are being phased out. Newer M1A2s and Korean K2s. Yeah, I, I don't know why the Polish army is getting so many different kind of tanks. It seems like it might be a bit of a liability. It's kind of like what the Egyptians do with their air force, where they just buy one of everything. Um, but they're getting a good mix of tanks at least. So they'll, they'll be able to figure out quickly which one they like the most. I think they're still in the trees. So what we'll do... Oh yep, they're uh, 
I think they're kind of confused. They're driving around in a circle, which the AI sometimes does. It'll get hung up on a tree and start driving in a circle. So what I can do is drop artillery on that, and then I can take command of this guy and drive him down this road, and we should be able to get good shots down on them, hopefully from concealment. All the same gun, at least. Kind of, sort of. There's a couple of variants of the 2A46. Um, but yeah, same basic gun, but there are some different variants. I think the most modern one's like 2A46M5 or something like that. So just over that berm. So what I'm going to do... So, like I said, this is, a, this is a reconnaissance mission. I could have just left, and I, I would still complete the mission successfully if, if I did just leave. But we're so close to beating them, we might as well just risk it. We'll see if we can finish them off on this mission, or we might need one more. Maybe two if I fuck one up really badly. But it should really just be this one, and maybe one extra. Okay, I see... An M60 peeking through the trees. Hey, buddy. He hasn't noticed me. Good center of mass hit. He's toast. There's another one. Wait for him to pass out from behind the tree. I see sparks. Sparks are a good sign. Okay, there's one moving. That might have missed, because I hit the brakes right as I fired. Yeah, so the AI is still obviously heavily work in progress. They do get stuck on terrain sometimes. There's another. I don't see him clearly, but I do see him. Looks like he's still moving. I'll just pop out from behind the trees here, I think. Get a clear line of sight. Try not to smash my gun barrel on a tree. There is no barrel collision in this because it's a really hard physics problem to solve without ending up with the armor thing where tanks flip into orbit because their gun touched a bush or, you know, people using them to bounce off buildings or whatever. It's, it's kind of a difficult problem to solve, but they might be able to kind of find a way to cheat around it sometime. There's one. I'm at fairly close range, so I keep forgetting to account for the parallax error. I need to aim slightly high and left of where I want to hit. Because the gun sight is mounted high and left of the gun, right? So it's not perfectly aligned at close range. So there's three dead M60s. A US platoon is four. So there's one missing. There he is. So high and left of where I want to hit. Hmm. I'll just laser it again. Might be aiming a little too high. So we'll... One there. Come on, man. Okay, one more shot. That's all we have anyway. Now we gotta go restock, and if that didn't kill him, then I'll just take what I've got. There's no point risking this any further. Tree leaves move because of the shot? Yep. Um, muzzle blasts from guns, explosions, things like that, they move the tree leaves. Oh. I'm getting artilleried. There are a lot of really impressive little details in this game. Even though it's a fairly, you know, fairly early project by a very small team, they get some really awesome detail in it. I'll show you in a minute. I'll call in artillery in that forest that they're still in, 
once I get these tanks back to their start point, or once I get the vehicles back to their start point, I'll show you. Okay, I should be covered here because they're on the other side of this hill. Uh, ooh. We know that the open ground to the right is safe because we cleared it earlier. We don't know if that road is safe. So we're going to avoid that road. We'll take this side. Poland can't... Oh, you mean for the the ones they're buying are all 120 uh, Rhine metals, yeah. Um, Poland can't afford enough tanks and buying the latest planes. We're in NATO. Poland will be an armed power in Europe, but why? Everything's bought with our tax money. Don't like politics, yeah. Yeah, it is what it is. We're buying a bunch of uh, American nuclear submarines, apparently, but last I heard, the Americans couldn't even fulfill their own contracts for... Uh, their own navy. Because American production is still pretty impressive, but it's not what it used to be, you know, 40, 50, 60, 80 years ago. Not even for ammunition, let alone for fucking submarines. Hey Hank, just cheers to the resub, good to see you. We've had a uh, much longer stream than planned, as always. I was hoping to be done streaming by like, I don't know, 2pm? It's now nearly 8pm. Oops. So we'll just do this and then one more mission, I think we'll call it for the stream. And I will try and squeeze one in uh, either late in the week or over the weekend, and we'll do some uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. I want to fly the N225, since that's out now. Um, I've been flying it a lot, just not on stream. I'm, I've got a bunch of other things I want to fly on stream as well that uh, I haven't flown on, on the stream yet. And probably some more of this, some more DCS and maybe some more uh, SnowRunner as well. Okay, we can pick up our pace here a little. We'll tell this guy to get into um, column formation just so it's a little easier for him to navigate. He's combat ineffective anyway, because he got hit in the turret. And then we'll bring our BRDMs back if they survived. It looks like they both did, which is good. You can see how long I've been restocking the ammunition in this. It takes a long time to refill the carousel in the T-72. A very long time. So you kind of need to plan ahead a bit. You don't want to be caught in the middle of an engagement with no ammunition loaded. There's the other BRDM. I don't know why he's chilling out there, but that's fine. He's closer to the start point. I'll get the uh, other BRDM to drive down. He'll, he should follow him once we get close. Okay, we want to go up this way. There's our T-72M. So this is an M, not an M1. So it doesn't have the extra 16mm high hardness plate welded to the front. And it also doesn't have the composite armor in the turret. It's just cast steel on the turret of the T-72M. You can also see it has the uh, funky gill armor, which is folded back on this one. It's randomized whether the tanks that have gill armor have it folded in or folded out. Um, also, the equipment on the exterior vehicles is randomized, so you might see like an Abrams with a bunch of MRE boxes in its bustle, you might see one with a bunch of toilet paper or like buckets or Alice packs hanging off of it, they're all different. And the tactical markings are actually like a thing, so um, if you have a whole platoon of tanks, they'll all have the correct tactical markings for that platoon. You can even see the convoy light with the uh, last two digits of the tactical number on it. Speaking of Cold War tanking, I've got myself involved in a Cold War PMC unit in Armour 3, so I might be driving Soviet surplus against my will. <laughs> Good luck with that. It could be worse, you could have ended up with us bunch of monkeys in 345th.
Okay, so we got these guys back to the start position, so I'm going to just park them here. Okay, so what I'm actually going to do is I'll just sneak this guy past the M60s and then I'll come back with the free cam and we'll drop artillery on that bunch of trees and I'll show you that the, uh, the explosion is affecting the leaves and stuff. We'll do the same thing as before, we'll hook around these trees just to uh, screen us from the M60 that I think is still active in there. I think one of them survived, might be damaged but he's still active. And then we'll just drive back down to the start point. Maybe I'll join you a bunch of monkeys if you'll have me. Of course we will. I mean, you've seen what we're like, right? Do, do you think we have standards? You would probably, like... It, it, the problem here would be your standards, not ours, trust me. Would you want to subject yourselves to us? Uh, subject yourself to us? Like, it, it's just... We'll take anyone, pretty much. Well, almost anyone. We've had a few people that had to, uh, had to get yeeted over the years, but, you know, armor gaming do be like that, unfortunately. It's like, maybe a half step better than fucking Hearts of Iron in terms of how many weirdos there are in the community. Also, my phone battery just died. Oops. I've been streaming so long my phone ran out of battery. So yeah, we'll do this, then we'll do like a, either a raid mission or a, probably a, um, spoiling attack. Because they're relatively quick, and they involve a lot of things exploding. We could do an area defense as well, we'll see what we get presented with. Because sometimes you just get a bunch of, like, defense missions. You don't get a say in the matter. Oh, there he is. There he is. He's found me. Hey, buddy. You get a little lost? We'll tell him to get back into column formation. Hopefully he'll figure that one out instead of just doing donuts around that tree, which I think he's going to do. Yeah, I think he wants to do don uh, donuts around the tree. Excellent. Op times are like 8 p.m. British Standard Time on a Sunday, I think it is. So, early Monday morning for me. Okay, there's the uh, T-72 and the BMP that I parked here. We'll just let the other BRDM work himself out whether he wants to come down here or not. The um, I don't know what it is about this mission template, but this mission seems to have a lot of issues with uh, your scout platoon mate just fucking off into a forest and getting stuck on a tree. I don't know why. Can do that, excellent. So we want to go down here and we want to oh, I can't do it from the free cam, I forgot. So I've got to call artillery here with this, and then I go free cam again, and I just use the scroll wheel to speed the free camera right up so I don't miss anything. And we come down here and let's watch the results. It'll take a little while for the artillery call in. But we should see something happen here shortly. I'm kind of curious where the. Oh, there we go. So there's one M60 there. There's one that drove into that building after I blew his driver up. There's one smoking behind those trees. Might have to be up close to the trees to see them shaking. Or maybe, I think artillery shakes the leaves, but maybe it doesn't. I know that tank guns going off sure does. You also can't predict where the next shell's gonna land, so I can't really zoom in on it.
yeah, okay. Maybe artillery doesn't shake the leaves yet, but tank guns definitely do. Because uh, you see it when you park in a forest. There's one M60. Who's dead? This guy's dead. Okay, I got all of them. I actually did get all of them. And you can see once his driver was knocked out, he just rolled down the hill into a building. Um, there's an invite in the uh, channel information. Like, if you go down below the actual stream where all the fucking wall of text is, there's a bunch of VDV guys squatting in a photo. Um, and that has the, that should have the link to our Discord. I think. Pretty sure it has an invite link. Okay, after action report. It'll, it won't show small arms unless I enable that option, but if I enable that option, uh, we will be here all day because that's a lot of shots. So this will just show um, what happened after the tanks appeared. So the toe fucked that guy immediately. That was the one that knocked out his gun. And then that was the one that knocked out his gun even harder. And then that knocked out his gunner. And somehow didn't- I'm surprised that didn't cook him off. I'm really surprised that didn't cook him off and kill him. That was, uh, ooh. Ooh. Ooh, 125 millimeter high explosive fragmentation right, right in the ghoulies. That's, uh, that's a way to go. That's definitely a way to go. So, one more mission and we'll end the stream. Can't blame the RDM drivers for hiding in the woods. Yeah, no, I can't either. And the visibility out of that thing, like, you don't see it in game at the moment because, you know, you don't have the driver's vision blocks modeled yet, but the visibility out of the BRDM is not great, which is kind of ironic for a reconnaissance vehicle, but... It, uh, it doesn't have the best situational awareness. Well, that went pretty well for us, all things considered. So, what do we got? Recon and Force, we just did one. Spoiling Attack, they're pretty fun. Defend Position, Recon and Force, Raid. Let's do a Spoiling Attack, because they're usually pretty awesome. And this should hopefully win us the campaign. And I think uh, I will start a NATO campaign next. So next time I stream this, we'll run through the NATO campaign. We'll have the crew voices and all the cool stuff. Uh, the East Germans will be getting crew voices. They just don't have them yet because they're still working on them. The Soviets, when they arrive, will also have crew voices. Never fear. They will be native language, but there will be subtitles. So I'm going to put these guys into a column so we can more efficiently move down the road together. I'm going to lock my gun so it's not constantly swinging around. Do they get the funny East German accents? They might, I'm not sure. The East Germans and the West Germans will have different crew voices though, or different lines at least, because they had different, um, different phraseology. Much different. T-80s, uh, the T-80B will be coming at some point, don't know when. But any other T-80s, you'll probably have to wait for another theater. If we get up north on the North German plane, we might see some T-80 BVs. Oh, no, not BVs, sorry. We might see some... Uh... Depends on the year. The BV got there, I think, 87. And the ADU, I think, was like 88 or 89. So, yeah, if it's, if it's like a later scenario on the North German plane, we might see some BVs and or U's. But for the time being, probably just 80 Bs. 64 Bs will almost certainly see if we get a North German plane scenario. Yeah, I always thought Soviet tanks looked better without the ERA. The only one that I think looks better with the ERA is the T-80U. But like the um, the T-64, the T-72, the, the 64 especially I think looks better with no ERA on it. So we don't want to drive right up on them. What I'm going to do is flank around, pop these scouts, and then hopefully engage them across this valley from behind where they're not going to be looking. We just have to get there quickly enough.
There's our friendly BRDM who has been providing us with our intelligence for this mission. I kind of want to... Mm. We can probably engage them from behind this hill, but it's kind of exposed. You know what? Yeah, we're going to go around the long way. It's going to take a little longer to get in position. Hopefully we have time to do it. Um, and we're still going to have to clean up the scouts later, probably. But if I can just bypass the scouts altogether, follow this route around to the back, I've then got a much better covered approach on them. And the longer range should work in my favor, because the M60, um, they're probably on A1s with how low they are in supply. The M60 is going to struggle a bit to get good first round hits at that range, even with the AI's magical gunnery. And also, um, the more distance I can put between me and them, the better my armor works. And these are T72M1s, so these actually have armor. Like, these have proper composite turrets. Their hulls still aren't great, but they have composite turrets, which is, you know, it counts for a lot. You'll notice as the tanks are either sitting still or driving, it doesn't matter, they're scanning around. See how they're looking around themselves? And they scan alternating sectors, they don't all uh, look the same place at once. Now, for the Soviet tanks, I don't know if they'd scan with their turret independently, but the commander's hatch would be rotating, so the thing I'm in now, you'd see that rotating around. Um, but with the American tanks, they would be scanning with the turret, that's what the Americans do. The Soviets, I think, would usually leave the turret stationary, or they might scan with both. I'm not 100% sure on that though, so don't quote me. But you can see they're keeping an eye out around themselves. So the priority for this kind of mission, a spoiling attack, um, the name is pretty much what it is. You're spoiling an enemy attack by mounting your own attack first. Um, you're, you know, you found a group of enemy marshalling up, they're preparing, they're loading all their ammunition, they're figuring out their orders, they're doing all the shit you do before you go into an attack, you found them, you know where they are, you know that their security is a bit lax, and you can sneak in, and you can just fuck them up completely. So the objective here, I can kill the trucks, but I can go on a raid if I want to kill trucks. I'm not worried about deleting their supply here, I want to stop their attack from succeeding. So I want to break up their force, I want to kill their tanks and any IFVs they have. The scary shit that's actually dangerous to me is what I want to kill. Um, I can always clean up trucks later. So that's what we're going to do, we're going to see if we can hit the tanks first, any Bradleys or anything like that that might be with them, um, and any trucks we can get are a bonus. This is a bit longer of a route than I planned. We might... See, the thing is, if I roll up on this crest, I'm super exposed, and the T-72 doesn't do hull down very well, because it has quite poor gun depression. However, this might be the way to go. So I'm going to start dropping artillery on them now. I'm going to, as soon as I'm through this gap, I'm going to tell my guys to go line formation, and I'm going to turn 90 degrees right and start swinging my way towards them. I'm going to prepare by turning the turret that way, so it's already facing them. Okay, let's go line, and then let's very slowly crest the hill. The artillery should start dropping shortly. I don't see them yet, but my platoon mates do. Aha, there they are. I actually don't see any tanks. There they are. They're hiding behind the trees. That's good, because it means they probably won't see us very well. There goes our artillery. We're going to swap to heat and start hitting the 113s because these little buggers will run away real quick. Um, get him. Oh, he rammed another one. That's handy. Twofer. Threefer. See all the confusion? They're all over the fucking place. Okay, he's still up. There go the trucks. 
The tanks still can't actually see us to engage us effectively, so I'm not too concerned about them. Oh, hey, truck. Let's get him. Now I'm going to switch to Sabo, and I'm going to start looking for tanks. My platoon mates can keep engaging whatever they see, but I'm going for tanks now. Which we're probably about to see one roll around the trees. Oh no, that's a truck. Where's an M60? So we've broken up their attack, we've basically achieved our mission, but you know what? I want to break these guys back right now. So we're going to see if we can get the tanks as well. It's kind of dangerous rolling forwards like this, but if I can get a quick shot off before they do, we should be okay. They're all in behind there, I think. That might be a tank there, I can't tell. Artillery and smoke's blocking my sight. There's a tank! Don't know if that hit. Come on, follow up shot, let's go. We'll get the front pointed at him. There's another one. We'll just keep pushing, fuck it. We don't want to reverse in a T-72, it has horrible reverse speed and it's not built to do it. You want to push, you want to exploit your initiative. These guys are all over the place, half of them don't know where the shots are coming from, so we want to just roll in amongst them and fuck them up. Kill as much as we can. We're going to stop here, just a short halt to get some accurate shots off, while I'm still kind of covered by this hill. You can also see the range wheel at top winding down as the Delta D system um, uses um, like the tank's own movement to figure out how far we've travelled relative to the target we lazed. Delta D is quite a neat system, the Americans have something similar on the Abrams. That's a pretty convincing result, I think. He's still active. I'm pretty sure. Can't tell if that hit or not. Is my gun clear of terrain? No, it's not. That might have hit. Don't think so. We want to see a shower of sparks. It's Sabo. It's probably going over him. I'm out of Sabo and Heat for my platoon lead tank, but I can load HE. HE, like the, the 125 HE, if it hits under a tank or on the side in certain places, it's really powerful. It will kill them. It won't do it reliably, but it can do it. I think he might be bailed out. We're just going to hit him anyway. It looks like his turret's rotating. Just double check, see if any of these look alive. We'll hit him again. I think we cleaned them all up. How about you? Are you dead? Kind of hard to tell. And we'll try and land one underneath him, just for good measure. Okay. We're going to restock my ammo. Oh, we're actually going to... Something you see with uh, Soviet tanks is the guns usually turn to one side, so like when they're travel locked, or when they're uh, restocking the ammo or something, the guns usually turn in a certain direction. To restock the ammo you have to traverse the turret around to reach different parts of it, but also when you lock the gun for travel or for storage or whatever, you usually lock it off to one side. So for the T-72 it locks off to the right, for the T-64 it locks off to the left, and that's so that the gun barrel isn't blocking the driver's hatch basically. And in the T-64, because the machine gun's on the opposite side of the 72, it's traversed the opposite way so that the machine gun barrel isn't behind the driver's head. Well, sorry, uh, actually no, so the Lunar Spotlight doesn't block him, I think. The machine gun barrel is still behind his head, because of the way the 64 turret's designed. It's one of the flaws of it. It's not a big flaw, but it is a flaw. 
Um, I am not sh Oh, my fucking platoon mates got hit. Shit. We've got one still, but that guy got absolutely m fucking malleted. Nailed. Didn't see the shot that killed him. And this guy's just stuck in a tree. Uh, I might be able to rescue him, so to speak, by driving him out of the trees. Don't start me on that. That's one of my great historical hatreds, is how, like, Enemy at the Gates basically ruined a whole fucking generation of historians. Because they saw that and thought it was actually, like, a thing. Instead of, you know, uncommon blocking detachment stuff that was done for worker battalions in, like, one or two actual engagements. The majority of what happened with blocking detachments is a lot more mundane. Um, what they typically did was they would, yeah, some people would get executed if they were found to be, like, frequent deserters or if they'd done something like sabotage or, or you know, whatever, anti-Soviet behavior. If they made a nuisance of themselves, put it that way. Um, but the majority of troops who were caught by NKVD blocking detachments were just reconstituted either back into their original units if they could find them, or they were put into a new unit that was raised up and sent to the front as it went past. Because it makes no sense to kill a perfectly good soldier. If that, like, you know, everyone has their kind of threshold for panic. And if the guy's still willing to fight, and he's still well trained, and he, well, you know, well enough trained, and he's still, you know, politically reliable to at least some extent, you're not going to waste a soldier. You're just going to send him back to, you know, either their unit or a new unit. Um, now, if you were an officer or something like that, where you set a bad example by, um, by defecting or, um, you know, deserting then yeah, you might get the old 9 grams, or you might get put in a Strafbat uh, punishment battalion. The Germans did very similar. Um, the Germans and Soviets, actually, if you look at the proportions of forces in the city of Stalingrad and the proportions of executions of their own troops, they did about the same amount of executions of their own troops. I think it was like 13, 14%, something like that, of all, um, of all cases that came before, like court-martials or um, troikas or whatever. Uh, like 13 or 14 percent of them were shot. The rest were just sent back to units or sent to uh, Strafbats. It was still pretty fucked up, but like, you know, not to the comical degree that people think. Oh yeah, World War One was fucked, and everyone was doing it in World War One. I think he's got stuck in a tree again. God damn it. There's no training in the 345th. I'm successfully conscripted. We used to have, like, not compulsory training, but we'd have, like, little things that you could come to to brush up on your skills or whatever, and it was recommended that people attend them. And, um, there was talk of making those more frequent, and we had a whole bunch of people freak out and think we were turning into, like, hardcore neckbeard mill simmers, and they all left. They're like, no, I don't want to... I, I joined this unit because it was fun, and there wasn't any fucking training bullshit. Next, you'll be telling us to call, call you by your rank. It's like, no, dude. We just want to make sure you actually know how to use the fucking ace medical system before you take a medic slot. <laughs> or, you know, you know how to use the RPG before you fire it next to an entire squad of dudes. Or you know what overpressure is. Like, the time that, um... We had an Abrams attached to us for a mission. We were playing as the Americans in this mission. It was one of the first I played with them. Uh, well, the Abrams overpressured our entire HQ element with its main gun. All of them. Because they were standing in front of it, and it, it went, Ooh, a shiny thing, and fired its fucking 120mm gun and just fragged a lot of them with overpressure. It was very funny. Very, very funny. Maybe not to the people who were on the receiving end, but I thought it was fucking hilarious. Yeah, Dotted Fish, I'm just about to finish up. This is the last mission I'm doing today. Uh, I kept saying, oh, it won't be a long stream. Oh, I've got to control myself. Well, I've got shit to do. Like, it keeps happening. I had too much fun playing DCS, and now I'm having too much fun playing Gunner Heat PC. Yeah, like, I never had issue with the, the training that 345th did, because it, it was like half an hour or an hour before some missions where we were using some specialized piece of equipment that most most of the monkeys don't know how to use. Like, when we do tank stuff, there's usually an optional tank training mission beforehand, and even though I know how to use the tanks, I go to it anyway, just because it's fun. 
Like, I enjoy playing with them, even when I'm doing training shit, so... Would I enjoy it if they started having weekly training sessions, or like, training sessions every other night, like some fucking neckbeard units do? No, I'd probably leave. But they don't. And they're not going to. So, why would I? I wanna go find... Here's the site of the fucking carnage. The scene of the crime. So this guy, we'll have a look at the after action, but this guy, um, he got very unlucky. He became a crispy critter. And you'll notice the tanks settle on the suspension after they burn out because the torsion bars melt. And if you um, sit spectating a burning wreck, you'll actually hear the, the pops and the snaps as the, as the bars collapse and you'll see the tanks sink on the ground. The uh, M113s do it as well. And the Bradleys and all the other track shit. If it has tracks, it doesn't. The fires, um, the intensity and duration of the fire is based on what is in the vehicle and how much oxygen is accessible to the fire. Like, obviously the ammunition is self-oxidizing, so it doesn't need oxygen to burn. But the more oxygen is available, the more intense the fire will be. There's a lot of really, like, intense detail in this. So here's turret popped. Again, you can see there's very rudimentary interiors, just so that you can see something inside the tank when the turret goes flying off, but it's not, like, Steel Beast level, it's not really planned to be. Crispy Critters. Not a pleasant way to go. The equipment that's hanging off the vehicles and, like, the gun mounts and stuff, they're not burnt yet, that's coming, but... It's an own issue, they just haven't completed, I guess, the textures for them, or the materials for them, or something. But, um, it's known that those should be charred as well, and it will happen eventually. Steel Beast Light that people actually play, I think that's where it's going. Um, and also, like I was saying before, a lot of my childhood nostalgia, that LOD issue is affecting the M60 as well, interesting. Um, bit of a bug, but, you know, active development, so on and so forth. Um... As I was saying before, like, it really strongly reminds me of M1 Tank Platoon 2. Including, like, I, I don't know how the final campaign for Gunner Heat PC is going to look, but from how it's been described um, in the dev Q&As and the dev streams and just from talking to the devs as well, um, and from some of the games that are influences on them, I'm going to guess that the campaign in this will be quite similar to how that played out. And that was a really good campaign system. Really, really, really good. And I would expect to see lots of little bits of uh, environmental storytelling. Classic Microprose, yeah, except these guys aren't uh, published by Microprose. They're self-published because that means that they can do what they want to do and stick to, you know, stick true to their vision and nobody else has any influence over it except, you know, obviously people buying the game um, because they need money to do it. But um, they have said on a few dev streams that they had offers from some pretty big names and they turned them all down because in their view it wasn't worth it. It would have defeated the whole purpose of making the game if somebody else bought them out and then decided, oh, actually, we're going to change the game to be more like this or more like that. Ever played Panzer Elite by Joe Wood back in the day? Uh, I don't think I did, no. I think... Um, M1 Tank Platoon 2 was the only tank sim I played back in the day, and then um, later on I picked up other games as well. I've got Steel Armor Blaze of War, I need to get back into that. I haven't played it very much, not because like I don't like it, it's actually a really cool game, it's just that the interface is so baffling to me, um, I've never really taken the time to learn how to use it. His driver must be dead with the brakes off. Or something. It's kind of shimmying. Hmm. Might be a physics bug. The vehicles will continue rolling if the driver either bails out or dies. Um, like bails out of the tank while it's rolling down a hill with the brakes off, or bails out, uh, or sorry, like dies with his foot on the gas. The vehicle will continue rolling until it either runs out of momentum or hits something. So it's really something as a tank crests a hill and you put a round straight into its ammo rack and you see these great gouts of orange flame come pissing out the top of it and it just continues rolling down the hill like a fucking you know like a fire ship or something just keeps going and it might even drive for like a kilometer or two and you'll just watch this burning tank driving off into the sunset you know everyone in there is fucking dead 
it's uh, pretty morbid. What's your job in the 345th? We don't have fixed roles. Um, my job is avoid responsibility, basically. I usually take things like ammo bearers for machine guns, RPGs, stuff like that. Uh, just enough responsibility that people give a shit to medic me when I get hit, but not enough responsibility to actually have to do anything, like, useful or, you know, mentally taxing. Alright, so let's jump out of that, let's go to the after action report, and let's see how this played out. So, our uh, buddy here spotted them first, and immediately began engaging the 113s. The AI don't have any special logic to tell them, hey, use this ammo for this target yet, so you'll see they use Sabo and 113s and stuff. Um, that is planned to be implemented, it's just that the list of things planned to be implemented and the list of things to be fixed are both very long, and there's a lot of higher priorities. But it'll get there in the end. Foxhole, man, I gotta get back into that. I haven't played it in the longest time. It's such a cool game. It's one of those games that, like, I feel really bad about not playing it more, but it's it's also one of those games that I have no idea what I'm doing, and I feel like I need to play with friends who, you know, actually do know what they're doing. But it's a really cool game. I really like the concept of it, and I really like the sort of art style of it. Um, and when I did play it with friends last, it was quite fun, even if I didn't know what I was doing. So, I didn't have a line of sight on the M60, so I was just engaging these guys, mostly. Got a decent hit on him as well. And this is probably where the M60s start uh, rolling into view. Yep, there we go, that's... That's an interesting shot. That's a really interesting shot. So... Sabo comes in, wangs off the inside of the fucking boat hole, passes between the ammunition without setting any of them off, gets crushed into the front corner of the hull. So that's the Sabo itself, that thick white line is the main body of the Sabo. The yellow line is then a high energy chunk of spalling which takes off the uh, loader's left leg, pings off the inside face of the turret, and then splits into and pops the driver in the back. That's, uh... Wouldn't want to be inside that tank when that happened. In some ways, I'm glad that they don't want to get too carried away with things like tank interiors, because it would be, uh, pretty brutal. Pretty fucking brutal. So that's how my buddy got knocked out. The shot came in through the roof, where the armor's quite thin. Oh, sorry, I'm wrong. These are T-72Ms. They just have the rubber skirts. They aren't M1s. Uh, like T-72M1s. So the T-72Ms also have the variation where they can have the uh, rubber skirts. I thought they only had the gill armor, but that shows you how much I was paying attention. So yeah, cast armor, not a lot to stop an 833. Oh, no, 774, they're using their shitty ammo. That's good. So even the 774 will get through that, and it did. Did a number on the gunner, and then one of the fragments would have gone down into a propellant casing. Yep, one of the propellant casings stored behind the turret. So as usual, the carousel isn't the culprit here. The spare ammunition is. Usually when you see a Soviet MBT go high order, it's not because of the carousel. It's because of the spare, like the, the second reload for the carousel, which is just stuffed wherever it fits. The carousel itself, especially for the time, was inherently pretty safe. It was a great leap ahead over things like the M60, the Century, and the early Leopards, which you can see, they're just rolling ammunition racks. Um, the problem is that second reload, and also the T64 and T80 carousel where the throwing charges are stacked vertically around the inside of the turret ring, so there's a much higher chance of them getting hit. But the problem that the um, Soviet MBTs have is the M1 came along, and the M1 makes everything look bad for crew survivability. But people just act like the M1 was the standard all along. Like, they go, oh, Soviet tanks, they're, they're garbage. There's no, you know, they, they don't care about the crew. It's like, if the Soviets didn't care about the crew, they would have laid out their ammunition like this. It, it makes no sense. It's people judging historical things against the context of the modern day. Which, you know, DCS players do all the fucking time as well. It drives me up the wall. Oof. Yep, 
Yeah, the M1 was an absolute fucking revolution in tank design. Like, in many respects. Now, having said that, the M1 was also a stopgap, like every other US tank ever. Uh, the M60A3 had a better thermal sight than the M1, because it just had a better, uh, better display. Clearer display. Um, the M1's fire control system was pretty good, but not all it could have been, because they didn't stabilize, or they didn't put a second axis on the mirror stabilization for the gun sight, so you, you had that jumping reticle instead of simply point, you know, laser and blaze, point and shoot, like the, um, I think the Leopard 2 has, and like the T, uh, T64B and T80 have. So like, the, the, there was no CITV. The M1 from the start was supposed to have CITV, and Congress wouldn't approve funding for it. CITV didn't arrive until I think the M1A2 even. It was definitely after the M1A1, I think it was even the M1A2. It was a very, very late thing, despite the fact the tank was always supposed to have it from the start. They just couldn't get the funding for whatever reason. But then you have the Soviets designing three decent MBTs and never actually conglomerating them into a single really good design. So each Soviet MBT had its pluses and minuses and they never actually just said, you know what, why are we doing this? Let's just make one tank with all the best features of all three. Politics. That's what it was in the Soviet Union, it was politics. Uh, Ustinov, who was the defense minister at the time, loved the T-80, that was his pet project. He defended against anyone and everyone. Um, Kharkiv wanted to keep the T-64 in production because that was their baby, that kept all the factories in Ukraine open. And, um, Uvezeb, uh, Ural Vagan Zavod, they wanted to keep the T-72 in production because that was basically them finding a way to be relevant again after the Ukrainians had, you know, kind of gone, hey, no, we're the tank designers, you leave, you leave that shit alone, you go do trains, we'll do the tanks. Um, but Uvezeb wanted in on that. And so they pushed the T-72. And so the Soviet Union ended up with three similar, but different, MBT designs, all with their own different sets of, of positives and negatives. And they never consolidated the designs properly. And there was a lot of stopgap shit on the T-80 as well. For example, the T-80 didn't get a proper anti-aircraft machine gun mount until, like, T-80UD, I think it was. Even T-80U had a shit one. In fact, T-80U arguably had the shittest fucking anti-aircraft machine gun mount of any Soviet tank. Why? <laughs> mm. So you can see, um, 30 F26, the 125mm HE frag, is pretty nasty, but it won't always fuck the tank up. It may or may not spool from a hit to the side of the turret or the side of the hull. Um, it may or may not, you know, get uh, fragments in under the turret bustle. What it will do is if it hits under the tank, it will usually send them through the floor. In this case, it was a little short, it hit a road wheel. But if I'd landed a shot right between the tracks, it probably would have fragged everything in that tank. Because, uh, it's pretty powerful stuff. Then you have the disaster in Chechnya of T-80s being used by crews with no training in urban combat, with no infantry covering them either. Chechnya was such a clusterfuck on so many levels. Grachev was off his tits drunk the whole time. Oh, we got one more mission. We're not going to do it tonight because this stream's gone on for way too long already. Uh, much as I love to hang out with you guys, I, I really need to I need to stop or I'm not going to have a voice and I'm going to sleep until like 2 p.m. tomorrow, which I can't do. Um, but hey, we actually two of the three crew got out of that tank. That's a good result. Two of the three men in that T-72 got out. Happy days. Um... And that's something else, the 72s that you see pop their turrets, people are going to remember those because they're more memorable. You won't remember the T-72s that took like 10 hits before slowly burning out over the course of three days and never popped their turrets, and the crew all got out fine. You hear a lot of stories about that from Chechnya, but you never see pictures of it because it's not sexy, so to speak, to like war porn aficionado, uh, aficionados. It's like... Confirmation bias, I guess. I was going to say, it's it's not survivor bias, it's the opposite of survivor bias, but that's a good result. I will take that. So yeah, uh, we have probably one more mission left in this campaign before we win it. We will hit that one up on the next Gunner Heat PC stream, probably. I'm going to find someone to raid, and then uh, I'm going to frantically try and get all the shit done that I was supposed to get done this afternoon. Let's see who's on.
Imagine being prepared for a raid. Imagine actually being prepared. Uh, oh, Fenrir is on, and he's doing his world flight. We'll just see if anyone else is on that we could drop a raid on. Oh, why is it giving me my own audio? Fenrir is on. Fuck off. Be quiet, Twitch. Um. Yeah, Korchak's on, doing some War Thunder Sim stuff. Sync rate. Robo's on. I think we'll go with Fenrir, um, just because he has been gearing up for this world flight for a while. And then uh, next stream we'll spread around the love a bit more. Give me a moment here. I'm having 99 problems setting this up, as usual. Um, the fun part is, I look like I know a lot more than I actually do. My memory's not that good, so always fact check anything I tell you. I have that wonderful thing where I know just enough to look like I know what I'm talking about, but I also know enough to, like, know what I don't know, if that makes sense. It doesn't. I need some fucking caffeine, Jesus. Alright, there we go guys. Ray's all set. Thank you all very much for hanging out with me today. I know it's been a bit all over the place. We had to restart the stream god knows how many times, but we finally got it working. I think. I will find out later, because I can't see my OBS preview window. Chat's in the way. Um, hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay safe. Enjoy Fenrir. Um, if you enjoy listening to me bullshit about, like, esoteric stuff, you'll like it there, because he does the same thing. But he actually researches stuff before his streams, instead of just trying to remember shit from, like, a book he read five years ago. Um, but yeah, I will catch you guys hopefully late this week or over the weekend, but failing that, I'll catch you next Monday my time, Sunday if you're in a civilized part of the world for armor. See you guys then.